Volume Two, Chapter One of Emma. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Emma by Jane Austen. Volume Two, Chapter One. Emma and Harriet had been walking together one morning, and in Emma's opinion had been talking enough of Mr. Elton for that day. She could not think that Harriet's solace or her own sins required more, and she was therefore industriously getting rid of the subject as they returned. But it burst out again when she thought she had succeeded, and after speaking some time of what the poor must suffer in winter, and receiving no other answer than a very plaintive, "'Mr. Elton is so good to the poor,' she found something else must be done. They were just approaching the house where live Mrs. and Miss Bates. She determined to call upon them and seek safety in numbers. There was always sufficient reason for such an attention. Mrs. and Miss Bates loved to be called on, and she knew she was considered by the very few who presumed ever to see imperfection in her as rather negligent in that respect, and as not contributing what she ought to the stock of their scanty comforts. She had had many a hint from Mr. Knightley, and some from her own heart as to her deficiency. But none were equal to counteract the persuasion of its being very disagreeable, a waste of time, tiresome women, and all the horror of being in danger of falling in with the second-rate and third-rate of Highbury, who were calling on them for ever, and therefore she seldom went near them. But now she made the sudden resolution of not passing their door without going in observing, as she proposed it to Harriet, that as well as she could calculate, they were just now quite safe from any letter from Jane Fairfax. The house belonged to people in business. Mrs. and Miss Bates occupied the drawing-room floor, and there, in the very moderate-sized apartment which was everything to them, the visitors were most cordially and even gratefully welcomed. The quiet, neat old lady, who with her knitting was seated in the warmest corner, wanting even to give up her place to Miss Woodhouse, and her more active, talking daughter, almost ready to overpower them with care and kindness, thanks for their visit, solicitude for their shoes, anxious inquiries after Mr. Woodhouse's health, cheerful communications about her mother's, and sweet cake from the buffet. Mrs. Cole had just been there, just called in for ten minutes, and had been so good as to sit an hour with them, and she had taken a piece of cake, and been so kind as to say she liked it very much, and therefore she hoped Miss Woodhouse and Miss Smith would do them the favour to eat a piece too. The mention of the Coles was sure to be followed by that of Mr. Elton. There was intimacy between them, and Mr. Cole had heard from Mr. Elton since his going away. Emma knew what was coming. They must have the letter over again, and settle how long he had been gone, and how much he was engaged in company, and what a favourite he was wherever he went, and how full the master of the ceremony's ball had been. And she went through it very well, with all the interest and all the commendation that could be requisite, and always putting forward to prevent Harriet's being obliged to say a word. This she had been prepared for when she entered the house but meant, having once talked him handsomely over, to be no farther incommoded by any troublesome topic, and to wander at large amongst all the mistresses and misses of Highbury, and their card-parties. She had not been prepared to have Jane Fairfax succeed Mr. Elton. But he was actually hurried off by Miss Bates. She jumped away from him at last abruptly to the coals, to usher in a letter from her niece. Oh, yes! Mr. Elton, I understand, certainly as to dancing. Mrs. Cole was telling me that dancing in the rooms at Bath was— Mrs. Cole was so kind as to sit some time with us, talking of Jane, for as soon as she came in she began inquiring after her. Jane is so very great a favourite there. Whenever she is with us, Mrs. Cole does not know how to shew her kindness enough, and I must say that Jane deserves it as much as anybody can. And so she began inquiring after her directly, saying, I know you cannot have heard from Jane lately, because it is not her time for writing. And when I immediately said, But indeed we have, we had a letter this very morning. I do not know that ever I saw anybody more surprised. Have you upon your honour? said she. Well, that is quite unexpected. Do let me hear what she says. Emma's politeness was at hand directly, to say with smiling interest, Have you heard from Miss Fairfax so lately? I am extremely happy. I hope she is well." "'Thank you. You are so kind,' replied the happily deceived aunt, while eagerly hunting for the letter. "'Oh, here it is! I was sure it could not be far off. 
but I had put my huswife upon it, you see, without being aware, and so it was quite hid, but I had it in my hand so very lately that I was almost sure it must be on the table. I was reading it to Mrs. Cole, and since she went away I was reading it again to my mother, for it is such a pleasure to her, a letter from Jane, that she can never hear it often enough, so I knew it could not be far off and here it is, only just under my huswife, and since you are so kind as to wish to hear what she says. But first of all I really must, in justice to Jane, apologise for her writing so short a letter, only two pages, you see, hardly two, and in general she fills the whole paper and crosses half. My mother often wonders that I can make it out so well. She often says, when the letter is first opened, "'Well, Hetty, now I think you will be put to it to make out all that checker work don't you, ma'am? And then I tell her I am sure she would contrive to make it out herself, if she had nobody to do it for her, every word of it. I am sure she would pore over it till she had made out every word. And indeed, though my mother's eyes are not so good as they were, she can see amazingly well still, thank God, with the help of spectacles. It is such a blessing. My mother's are really very good indeed. Jane often says, when she is here, I am sure, Grandmamma, you must have had very strong eyes to see as well as you do and so much fine work as you have done, too. I only wish my eyes may last me as well." All this spoken extremely fast obliged Miss Bates to stop for breath, and Emma said something very civil about the excellence of Miss Fairfax's handwriting. "'You are extremely kind,' replied Miss Bates, highly gratified. "'You, who are such a judge, and write so beautifully yourself, I am sure there is nobody's praise that could give us so much pleasure as Miss Woodhouse's. My mother does not hear. She is a little deaf, you know. Mum, addressing her, do you hear what Miss Woodhouse is so obliging to say about Jane's handwriting? And Emma had the advantage of hearing her own silly compliment repeated twice over, before the good old lady could comprehend it. She was pondering in the meanwhile upon the possibility, without seeming very rude, of making her escape from Jane Fairfax's letter, and had almost resolved on hurrying away directly under some slight excuse, when Miss Bates turned to her again and seized her attention. "'My mother's deafness is very trifling, you see, just nothing at all. By only raising my voice and saying anything two or three times over, she is sure to hear. But then, she is used to my voice. But it is very remarkable that she should always hear Jane better than she does me. Jane speaks so distinct. However, she will not find her grandmamma at all deafer than she was two years ago, which is saying a great deal at my mother's time of life. And it really is full two years, you know, since she was here. We never were so long without seeing her before, and as I was telling Mrs. Cole, we shall hardly know how to make enough of her now." "'Are you expecting Miss Fairfax here soon?' "'Oh, yes! Next week!' Indeed, that must be a very great pleasure. Thank you. You are very kind. Yes, next week everybody is so surprised, and everybody says the same obliging things. I am sure she will be as happy to see her friends at Highbury as they can be to see her. Yes, Friday or Saturday. She cannot say which, because Colonel Campbell will be wanting the carriage himself one of those days. So very good of them to send her the whole way. But they always do, you know. Oh, yes, Friday or Saturday next. That is what she writes about. That's the reason of her writing out of rule, as we call it. For in the common course we should not have heard from her before next Tuesday or Wednesday." Yes, so I imagined. I was afraid there could be little chance of my hearing anything of Miss Fairfax to-day. So obliging of you! No, we should not have heard it, if not been for this particular circumstance of her being to come here so soon. My mother is so delighted, for she is to be three months with us at least. Three months, she says so, positively, as I am going to have the pleasure of reading to you. The case is, you see, that the Campbells are going to Ireland. Mrs. Dixon has persuaded her father and mother to come over and see her directly. They had not intended to go over till the summer, but she is so impatient to see them again, for till she married last October she was never away from them so much as a week, which must make it very strange to be in different kingdoms, I was going to say, but however different countries, and so she wrote a very urgent letter to her mother or her father, I declare I do not know which it was, but we shall see presently in Jane's letter, wrote in Mr. Dixon's name as well as her own, to press their coming over directly, and they would give them the meeting in Dublin, and take them back to their country seat. Bally Craig, a beautiful place, I fancy. Jane has had a great deal of its beauty. 
from Mr. Dixon, I mean. I do not know that she ever heard about it from anybody else. But it was very natural, you know, that he should like to speak of his own place while he was paying his addresses, and as Jane used to be very often walking out with them, for Colonel and Mrs. Campbell were very particular about their daughters not walking out often with only Mr. Dixon, for which I do not at all blame them. Of course she heard everything he might be telling Miss Campbell about his own home in Ireland, and I think she wrote us word that he had shown them some drawings of the place, views that he had taken himself. He is a most amiable, charming young man, I believe. Jane was quite longing to go to Ireland from his account of things." At this moment, an ingenious and animating suspicion entering Emma's brain with regard to Jane Fairfax, this charming Mr. Dixon, and the not going to Ireland, she said with the insidious design of farther discovery, "'You must feel it very fortunate that Miss Fairfax should be allowed to come to you at such a time. Considering the very particular friendship between her and Mrs. Dixon, you could hardly have expected her to be excused from accompanying Colonel and Mrs. Campbell." "'Very true, very true indeed! The very thing that we have always been rather afraid of! For we should not have liked to have her at such distance from us, for months together, not able to come if anything was to happen. But you see, everything turns out for the best. They want her, Mr. and Mrs. Dixon, excessively to come over with Colonel and Mrs. Campbell. Quite depend upon it. Nothing can be more kind or pressing than their joint invitation, Jane says, as you will hear presently. Mr. Dixon does not seem in the least backward in any attention. He is a most charming young man. Ever since the service he rendered Jane at Weymouth, when they were out in that party on the water, and she, by the sudden whirling round of something or other among the sails, would have been dashed into the sea at once, and actually was all but gone, if he had not, with the greatest presence of mind, caught hold of her habit. I can never think of it without trembling. But ever since we had the history of that day, I have been so fond of Mr. Dixon." But in spite of her friend's urgency, and her own wish of seeing Ireland, Miss Fairfax prefers devoting the time to you and Mrs. Bates. Yes, entirely her own doing, entirely her own choice, and Colonel and Mrs. Campbell think she does quite right, just what they should recommend, and indeed they particularly wish her to try her native air, as she has not been quite so well as usual lately. I am concerned to hear of it. I think they judge wisely. But Mrs. Dixon must be very much disappointed. Mrs. Dixon, I understand, has no remarkable degree of personal beauty, is not by any means to be compared with Miss Fairfax? Oh, no! You are very obliging to say such things, but certainly not. There is no comparison between them. Miss Campbell always was absolutely plain, but extremely elegant and amiable." Yes, that of course. Jane caught a bad cold, poor thing, so long ago as the 7th of November, as I am going to read to you, and has never been well since. A long time is it not for a cold to hang upon her? She never mentioned it before, because she would not alarm us just like her, so considerate. But, however, she is so far from well that her kind friends the Campbells think she had better come home, and try an air that always agrees with her, and they have no doubt that three or four months at Highbury will entirely cure her, and it is certainly a great deal better that she should come here than go to Ireland, if she is unwell. Nobody could nurse her as we should do." It appears to me the most desirable arrangement in the world. And so she is to come to us next Friday or Saturday, and the Campbells leave town and their way to Holyhead the Monday following, as you will find from Jane's letter. So sudden! You may guess, dear Miss Woodhouse, what a flurry it has thrown me in, if it would not for the drawback of her illness. But I am afraid we must expect to see her grown thin and looking very poorly. I must tell you what an unlucky thing happened to me as to that. I always make a point of reading Jane's letters through to myself first, before I read them aloud to my mother, you know, for fear of there being anything in them to distress her. Jane desired me to do it, so I always do. And so I began to-day with my usual caution. But no sooner did I come to the mention of her being unwell, than I burst out quite frightened with, "'Bless me! Poor Jane is ill!' which my mother, being on the watch, heard distinctly, and was sadly alarmed at. However, when I read on, I found it was not near so bad as I had fancied at first, and I make so light of it now to her that she does not think about it much. But I cannot imagine how I could be so off my guard. If Jane does not get well soon, we will call in Mr. Perry. The expense shall not be thought of, and though he is so liberal and so fond of Jane that I dare say he would not mean to charge anything for attendance, we could not suffer it to be so, you know. He has a wife and a family to maintain, and is not to be giving away his time. Well, now I have just given you a hint of what Jane writes about, we will turn to her letter, and I am sure she tells her own story a great deal better than I can tell it for her." 
"'I am afraid we must be running away,' said Emma, glancing at Harriet and beginning to rise. "'My father will be expecting us. I had no intention, I thought I had no power of staying more than five minutes when I first entered the house. I merely called, because I would not pass the door without inquiring after Mrs. Bates. But I have been so pleasantly detained. Now, however, we must wish you and Mrs. Bates good morning." And not all that could be urged to detain her succeeded. She regained the street, happy in this that though much had been forced on her against her will, though she had in fact heard the whole substance of Jane Fairfax's letter, she had been able to escape the letter itself. End of chapter 1 Volume 2, Chapter 2 of Emma. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Emma by Jane Austen. Volume 2, Chapter 2. Jane Fairfax was an orphan, the only child of Mrs. Bates's youngest daughter. The marriage of Lieutenant Fairfax of the Blank Regiment of Infantry and Miss Jane Bates had had its day of fame and pleasure, hope and interest, but now nothing remained of it save the melancholy remembrance of him dying in action abroad, of his widow sinking under consumption and grief soon afterwards, and this girl. By birth she belonged to Highbury, and when at three years old, on losing her mother, she became the property, the charge, the consolation, the fondling of her grandmother and aunt, there had seemed every probability of her being permanently fixed there, of her being taught only what very limited means could command, and growing up with no advantages of connection or improvement, to be engrafted on what nature had given her in a pleasing person, good understanding, and warm-hearted, well-meaning relations. But the compassionate feelings of a friend of her father gave a change to her destiny. This was Colonel Campbell, who had very highly regarded Fairfax, as an excellent officer and most deserving young man and farther had been indebted to him for such attentions, during a severe camp-fever, as he believed had saved his life. These were claims which he did not learn to overlook, though some years passed away from the death of poor Fairfax, before his own return to England put anything in his power. When he did return, he sought out the child and took notice of her. He was a married man with only one living child, a girl about Jane's age, and Jane became their guest paying them long visits and growing a favourite with all, and before she was nine years old, his daughter's great fondness for her, and his own wish of being a real friend, united to produce an offer from Colonel Campbell of undertaking the whole charge of her education. It was accepted, and from that period Jane had belonged to Colonel Campbell's family, and had lived with them entirely, only visiting her grandmother from time to time. The plan was that she should be brought up for educating others, the very few hundred pounds which she inherited from her father, making independence impossible. To provide for her otherwise was out of Colonel Campbell's power, for though his income by pay and appointments was handsome, his fortune was moderate and must be all his daughter's. But by giving her an education, he hoped to be supplying the means of respectable subsistence hereafter. Such was Jane Fairfax's history. She had fallen into good hands, known nothing but kindness from the Campbells, and been given an excellent education. Living constantly with right-minded and well-informed people, her heart and understanding had received every advantage of discipline and culture, and Colonel Campbell's residence being in London, every lighter talent had been done full justice to, by the attendance of first-rate masters. Her disposition and abilities were equally worthy of all that friendship could do, and at eighteen or nineteen she was, as far as such an early age can be qualified for the care of children, fully competent to the office of instruction herself, but she was too much beloved to be parted with. Neither father nor mother could promote, and the daughter could not endure it. The evil day was put off. It was easy to decide that she was still too young, and Jane remained with them sharing, as another daughter, in all the rational pleasures of an elegant society, and a judicious mixture of home and amusement, with only the drawback of the future, the sobering suggestions of her own good understanding, to remind her that all this might soon be over. The affection of the whole family, the warm attachment of Miss Campbell in particular, was the more honourable to each party from the circumstance of Jane's decided superiority, both in beauty and acquirements. That nature had given it in feature could not be unseen by the young woman, nor could her higher powers of mind be unfelt by the parents. They continued together with unabated regard, however, till the marriage of Miss Campbell, 
who by that chance, that luck which so often defies anticipation in matrimonial affairs, giving attraction to what is moderate rather than to what is superior, engaged the affections of Mr. Dixon, a young man, rich and agreeable, almost as soon as they were acquainted, and was eligibly and happily settled, while Jane Fairfax had yet her bread to earn. This event had very lately taken place, too lately for anything to be yet attempted by her less fortunate friend towards entering on her path of duty, though she had now reached the age which her own judgment had fixed on for beginning. She had long resolved that one and twenty should be the period. With the fortitude of a devoted novitiate, she had resolved at one and twenty to complete the sacrifice, and retire from all the pleasures of life, of rational intercourse, equal society, peace and hope, to penance and mortification for ever. The good sense of Colonel and Mrs. Campbell could not oppose such a resolution, though their feelings did. As long as they lived, no exertions would be necessary, their home might be hers for ever, and for their own comfort they would have retained her wholly. But this would be selfishness. What must be at last had better be soon. Perhaps they began to feel it might have been kinder and wiser to have resisted the temptation of any delay, and spared her from a taste of such enjoyments of ease and leisure as must now be relinquished. Still, however, affection was glad to catch at any reasonable excuse for not hurrying on the wretched moment. She had never been quite well since the time of their daughter's marriage, and till she should have completely recovered her usual strength, they must forbid her engaging in duties which, so far from being compatible with a weakened frame and varying spirits, seemed, under the most favourable circumstances, to require something more than human perfection of body and mind to be discharged with tolerable comfort. With regard to her not accompanying them to Ireland, her account to her aunt contained nothing but truth, though there might be some truths not told. It was her own choice to give the time of their absence to Highbury, to spend, perhaps, her last months of perfect liberty with those kind relations to whom she was so very dear. And the Campbells, whatever might be their motive or motives, whether single or double or treble, gave the arrangement their ready sanction, and said that they depended more on a few months spent in her native air for the recovery of her health than on anything else. Certain it was that she was to come and that Highbury, instead of welcoming that perfect novelty which had been so long promised it, Mr. Frank Churchill, must put up for the present with Jane Fairfax, who could bring only the freshness of a two years' absence. Emma was sorry. To have to pay civilities to a person she did not like through three long months, to be always doing more than she wished and less than she ought, why she did not like Jane Fairfax might be a difficult question to answer. Mr. Knightley had once told her it was because she saw in her the really accomplished young woman which she wanted to be thought herself. And though the accusation had been eagerly refuted at the time, there were moments of self-examination in which her conscience could not quite acquit her. But she could never get acquainted with her. She did not know how it was, but there was such coldness and reserve, such apparent indifference whether she pleased or not and then her aunt was such an eternal talker, and she was made such a fuss with by everybody. And it had always been imagined that they were to be so intimate, because their ages were the same, everybody had supposed they must be so fond of each other. These were her reasons. She had no better. It was a dislike so little just, every imputed fault was so magnified by fancy, that she never saw Jane Fairfax the first time after any considerable absence, without feeling that she had injured her. And now, when the due visit was paid, on her arrival, after a two years' interval, she was particularly struck with the very appearance and manners, which for those two whole years she had been depreciating. Jane Fairfax was very elegant, remarkably elegant and she had herself the highest value for elegance. Her height was pretty, just such as almost everybody would think tall, and nobody could think very tall. Her figure particularly graceful, her size a most becoming medium, between fat and thin, though a slight appearance of ill-health seemed to point out the likeliest evil of the two. Emma could not but feel all this, and then her face, her features. There was more beauty in them altogether than she had remembered. It was not regular, but it was a very pleasing beauty. Her eyes, a deep grey, with dark eyelashes and eyebrows, had never been denied their praise. But the skin, which she had been used to cavil at, as wanting colour, 
had a clearness and delicacy which really needed no fuller bloom. It was a style of beauty of which elegance was the reigning character, and as such she must, in honour by all her principles, admire it. Elegance, which, whether of person or of mind, she saw so little in Highbury. There, not to be vulgar, was distinction and merit. In short, she sat, during the first visit, looking at Jane Fairfax with twofold complacency, the sense of pleasure and the sense of rendering justice, and was determining that she would dislike her no longer. When she took in her history, indeed her situation, as well as her beauty, when she considered what all this elegance was destined to, what she was going to sink from, how she was going to live, it seemed impossible to feel anything but compassion and respect, especially if to every well-known particular entitling her to interest were added the highly probable circumstance of an attachment to Mr. Dixon, which she had so naturally started to herself. In that case, nothing could be more pitiable or more honourable than the sacrifices she had resolved on. Emma was very willing now to acquit her of having seduced Mr. Dixon's actions from his wife, or of anything mischievous which her imagination had suggested at first. If it were love, it might be simple, single, successless love on her side alone. She might have been unconsciously sucking in the sad poison, while a share of his conversation with her friend and from the best, the purest of motives, might now be denying herself this visit to Ireland, and resolving to divide herself effectually from him and his connections, by soon beginning her career of laborious duty. Upon the whole, Emma left her with such softened, charitable feelings as made her look around in walking home, and lament that Highbury afforded no young man worthy of giving her independence, nobody she could wish to scheme about for her. These were charming feelings, but not lasting before she had committed herself by any public profession of eternal friendship for Jane Fairfax, or done more towards a recantation of past prejudices and errors, than saying to Mr. Knightley, "'She certainly is handsome. She is better than handsome.' Jane had spent an evening at Hartfield with her grandmother and aunt, and everything was relapsing much into its usual state. Former provocations reappeared. The aunt was as tiresome as ever more tiresome, because anxiety for her health was now added to admiration of her powers, and they had to listen to the description of exactly how little bread and butter she ate for breakfast, and how small a slice of mutton for dinner, as well as to see exhibitions of new caps and new work-bags for her mother and herself, and Jane's offences rose again. They had music, Emma was obliged to play, and the thanks and praise which necessarily followed appeared to her an affectation of candour, an air of greatness, meaning only to show off in higher style her own very superior performance. She was, besides, which was the worst of all, so cold, so cautious. There was no getting at her real opinion. Wrapped up in a cloak of politeness, she seemed determined to hazard nothing. She was disgustingly, was suspiciously reserved. If anything could be more where all was most, she was more reserved on the subject of Weymouth and the Dixons than anything. She seemed bent on giving no real insight into Mr. Dixon's character, or her own value for his company, or opinion of the suitableness of the match. It was all general approbation and smoothness, nothing delineated or distinguished. It did her no service, however. Her caution was thrown away. Emma saw its artifice, and returned to her first surmises. There probably was something more to conceal than her own preference. Mr. Dixon, perhaps, had been very near changing one friend for the other, or been fixed only to Miss Campbell, for the sake of the future twelve thousand pounds. The like reserve prevailed on other topics. She and Mr. Frank Churchill had been at Weymouth at the same time. It was known that they were a little acquainted. But not a syllable of real information could Emma procure as to what he truly was. Was he handsome? She believed he was reckoned a very fine young man. Was he agreeable? He was generally thought so. Did he appear a sensible young man, a young man of information? At a watering-place, or in a common London acquaintance, it was difficult to decide on such points. Manners were all that could be safely judged of, under a much longer knowledge than they had had yet of Mr. Churchill. She believed everybody found his manners pleasing. Emma could not forgive her. End of chapter 2 Volume 2, Chapter 3 of Emma. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Emma by Jane Austen. Volume two, chapter three. Emma could not forgive her, but as neither provocation nor resentment were discerned by Mr. Knightley, who had been of the party, and had seen only proper attention and pleasing behaviour on each side, he was expressing the next morning, being at Hartfield again on business with Mr. Woodhouse, his approbation of the whole, not so openly as he might have done had her father been out of the room, but speaking plain enough to be very intelligible to Emma. He had been used to think her unjust to Jane, and had now great pleasure in marking an improvement. "'A very pleasant evening,' he began, as soon as Mr. Woodhouse had been talked into what was necessary, told that he understood, and the papers swept away. "'Particularly pleasant. You and Miss Fairfax gave us some very good music. I do not know a more luxurious state, sir, than sitting at one's ease to be entertained a whole evening by two such young women, sometimes with music and sometimes with conversation. I am sure Miss Fairfax must have found the evening pleasant, Emma. You left nothing undone. I was glad you made her play so much, for having no instrument at her grandmother's, it must have been a real indulgence." "'I am happy you approved,' said Emma, smiling. But I hope I am not often deficient in what is due to guests at Hartfield." "'No, my dear,' said her father instantly. "'That I am sure you are not. There is nobody half so attentive and civil as you are. If anything, you are too attentive. The muffin last night, if it had been handed round once, I think it would have been enough.' "'No,' said Mr. Knightley, nearly at the same time. "'You are not often deficient not often deficient either in manner or comprehension. I think you understand me, therefore." An arch look expressed, "'I understand you well enough,' but she said only, "'Miss Fairfax is reserved.' "'I always told you she was, a little, but you will soon overcome all that part of her reserve which ought to be overcome, all that has its foundation in diffidence. What arises from discretion must be honoured. You think her diffident. I do not see it." "'My dear Emma,' said he, moving from his chair into one close by her, "'you are not going to tell me, I hope, that you had not a pleasant evening?' "'Oh, no! I was pleased with my own perseverance in asking questions, and amused to think how little information I obtained." "'I am disappointed was his only answer. "'I hope everybody had a pleasant evening,' said Mr. Woodhouse, in his quiet way. "'I had. Once I felt the fire rather too much. But then I moved back my chair a little, a very little, and it did not disturb me. Miss Bates was very chatty and good-humoured, as she always is, though she speaks rather too quick. However, she is very agreeable and Mrs. Bates, too, in a different way. I like old friends. And Miss Jane Fairfax is a very pretty sort of young lady, a very pretty and a very well-behaved young lady indeed. She must have found the evening agreeable, Mr. Knightley, because she had Emma." "'True, sir. And Emma, because she had Miss Fairfax." Emma saw his anxiety, and wishing to appease it, at least for the present, said, and with a sincerity which no one could question, "'She is a sort of elegant creature that one cannot keep one's eyes from. I am always watching her to admire, and I do pity her from my heart.' Mr. Knightley looked as if he were more gratified than he cared to express, and before he could make any reply, Mr. Woodhouse, whose thoughts were on the Bateses, said, it is a great pity that their circumstances should be so confined, a great pity indeed, and I have often wished. But it is so little one can venture to do, small trifling presents of anything uncommon. Now we have killed a porker, and Emma thinks of sending them a loin or a leg. It is very small and delicate. Hartfield pork is not like any other pork. But still, it is pork. 
And, my dear Emma, unless one could be sure of their making it into steaks nicely fried, as ours are fried, without the smallest grease, and not roast it, for no stomach can bear roast pork, I think we had better send the leg. Do not you think so, my dear?" "'My dear papa, I sent the whole hind quarter. I knew you would wish it. There will be the leg to be salted, you know, which is so very nice, and the loin to be dressed directly in any manner they like." "'That's right, my dear, very right. I had not thought of it before, but that is the best way. They must not over-salt the leg. And then, if it is not over-salted, and if it is very thoroughly boiled, just as Searle boils ours, and eaten very moderately of, with a boiled turnip and a little carrot or parsnip, I do not consider it unwholesome." "'Emma,' said Mr. Knightley presently, "'I have a piece of news for you. You like news, and I heard an article in my way hither that I think will interest you." "'News? Oh, yes, I always like news. What is it? Why do you smile so? Where did you hear it? At Randall's?" He had time only to say, "'No, not at Randall's. I have not been near Randall's." When the door was thrown open, and Miss Bates and Miss Fairfax walked into the room. Full of thanks and full of news, Miss Bates knew not which to give quickest. Mr. Knightley soon saw that he had lost his moment, and that not another syllable of communication could rest with him. "'Oh! My dear sir! How are you this morning? My dear Miss Woodhouse, I am quite overpowered! Such a beautiful hind-quarter of pork! You are too bountiful! Have you heard the news? Mr. Elton is going to be married!' Emma had not had time even to think of Mr. Elton, and she was so completely surprised that she could not avoid a little start, and a little blush at the sound. "'There is my news. I thought it would interest you,' said Mr. Knightley, with a smile which implied a conviction of some part of what had passed between them. "'But where could you hear it?' cried Miss Bates. "'Where could you possibly hear it, Mr. Knightley? For it is not five minutes since I received Mrs. Cole's note. No, it cannot be more than five, or at least ten, for I had got my bonnet and spencer on, just ready to come out. I was only gone down to speak to Patty again about the pork. Jane was standing in the passage. We're not you, Jane, for my mother was so afraid that we had not any salting-pan large enough. So I said I would go down and see, and Jane said, Shall I go down instead? For I think you have a little cold, and Patty has been washing the kitchen. Oh, my dear, said I, well, and just then came the note. A Miss Hawkins, that's all I know, a Miss Hawkins of Bath. But, Mr. Knightley, how could you possibly have heard it? For the very moment Mr. Cole told Mrs. Cole of it, she sat down and wrote to me, a Miss Hawkins. I was with Mr. Cole on business an hour and a half ago. He had just read Elton's letter as I was shown in, and handed it to me directly. Well, that is quite— I suppose there was never a piece of news more generally interesting. My dear sir, you really are too bountiful. My mother desires her very best compliments and regards, and a thousand thanks, and says you really quite oppress her." "'We consider our Hartfield pork,' replied Mr. Woodhouse. "'Indeed, it certainly is so very superior to all other pork, that Emma and I cannot have a greater pleasure than—'Oh, my dear sir, as my mother says, our friends are only too good to us. If ever there were people who, without having great wealth themselves, had everything they could wish for, I am sure it is us. We may well say that our lot is cast in a goodly heritage. Well, Mr. Knightley, and so you actually saw the letter. Well!' It was short, merely to announce, but cheerful, exulting, of course. Here was a sly glance at Emma. He had been so fortunate as to—I forget the precise words, one has no business to remember them. The information was, as you state, that he was going to be married to a Miss Hawkins. By his style, I should imagine it just settled. "'Mr. Elton going to be married,' said Emma, as soon as she could speak. He will have everybody's wishes for his happiness. He is very young to settle, was Mr. Woodhouse's observation. He had better not be in a hurry. He seemed to me very well off as he was. We were always glad to see him at Hartfield. 
a new neighbour for us all, Miss Woodhouse," said Miss Bates joyfully. "My mother is so pleased. She says she cannot bear to have the poor old vicarage without a mistress. This is great news indeed. Jane, you have never seen Mr. Elton. No wonder that you have such a curiosity to see him." Jane's curiosity did not appear of that absorbing nature as wholly to occupy her. "'No. I have never seen Mr. Elton,' she replied, starting on this appeal. "'Is he—is he at all, man?' "'Who shall answer that question?' cried Emma. "'My father would say yes, Mr. Knightley no, and Miss Bates and I that he is just the happy medium. When you have been here a little longer, Miss Fairfax, you will understand that Mr. Elton is the standard of perfection in Highbury, both in person and mind." "'Very true, Miss Woodhouse. So she will. He is the very best young man. But, my dear Jane, if you remember, I told you yesterday he was precisely the height of Mr. Perry. Miss Hawkins! I dare say an excellent young woman. His extreme attention to my mother, wanting her to sit in the vicarage pew that she might hear the better, for my mother is a little deaf, you know. It is not much, but she does not hear quite quick. Jane says that Colonel Campbell is a little deaf. He fancied bathing might be good for it, the warm bath, but she says it did him no lasting benefit. Colonel Campbell, you know, is quite our angel, and Mr. Dixon seems a very charming young man, quite worthy of him. It is such a happiness when good people get together, and they always do. Now here will be Mr. Elton and Miss Hawkins, and there are the Coles, such very good people, and the Perrys. I suppose there never was a happier or a better couple than Mr. and Mrs. Perry. I say, sir," turning to Mr. Woodhouse, I think there are few places with such society as Highbury. I always say we are quite blessed in our neighbours. My dear sir, if there is one thing my mother loves better than another, it is pork, a roast loin of pork." "'As to who or what Miss Hawkins is, or how long he has been acquainted with her,' said Emma, "'nothing, I suppose, can be known. One feels that it cannot be a very long acquaintance. He has been gone only four weeks.' Nobody had any information to give, and after a few more wonderings, Emma said, "'You are silent, Miss Fairfax. But I hope you mean to take an interest in this news. You who have been hearing and seeing so much of late on these subjects, who must have been so deep in the business on Miss Campbell's account, we shall not excuse your being indifferent about Mr. Elton and Miss Hawkins." "'When I have seen Mr. Elton,' replied Jane, "'I dare say I shall be interested. But I believe it requires that with me. And as it is some months since Miss Campbell married, the impression may be a little worn off." "'Yes, he has been gone just four weeks, as you observe, Miss Woodhouse,' said Miss Bates. Four weeks yesterday! A Miss Hawkins! Well, I had always rather fancied it would be some young lady hereabouts. Not that I ever—Mrs. Cole once whispered to me, but I immediately said, "'No, Mr. Elton is a most worthy young man, but—' In short, I do not think I am particularly quick at those sorts of discoveries. I do not pretend to it. What is before me, I see. At the same time, nobody could wonder if Mr. Elton should have aspired. Oh, Miss Woodhouse lets me chatter on so good-humouredly. She knows I would not offend for the world. How does Miss Smith do? She seems quite recovered now. Have you heard from Mrs. John Knightley lately? Oh, those dear little children! Jane, do you know I always fancy Mr. Dixon quite like Mr. John Knightley? I mean in person, tall and with that sort of look, and not very talkative." "'Quite wrong, my dear aunt. There is no likeness at all." "'Very odd. But one never does form a just idea of anybody beforehand. One takes up a notion and runs away with it. Mr. Dixon, you say, is not, strictly speaking, handsome." "'Handsome? Oh, no! Far from it. Certainly plain. I told you he was plain." My dear, you said that Miss Campbell would not allow him to be plain, and that you yourself— Oh, as for me, my judgment is worth nothing. Where I have a regard, I always think a person well-looking. But I gave what I believed the general opinion, when I called him plain. Well, my dear Jane, I believe we must be running away. The weather does not look well, and Grandmamma will be uneasy. You are too obliging, my dear Miss Woodhouse, but we really must take leave. This has been a most agreeable piece of news indeed. I shall just go round by Mrs. Coles, but I shall not stop three minutes. And Jane, you had better go home directly. I would not have you out in a shower. We think she is the better for Highbury already. 
thank you, we do indeed. I shall not attempt calling on Mrs. Goddard, for I really do not think she cares for anything but boiled pork. When we dress the leg, it will be another thing. Good morning to you, my dear sir. Oh, Mr. Knightley is coming too. Well, that is so very— I am sure if Jane is tired, you will be so kind as to give her your arm. Mr. Elton and Miss Hawkins, good morning to you." Emma, alone with her father, had half her attention wanted by him while he lamented that young people would be in such a hurry to marry, and to marry strangers, too, and the other half she could give to her own view of the subject. It was to herself an amusing and a very welcome piece of news, as proving that Mr. Elton could not have suffered long. But she was sorry for Harriet. Harriet must feel it, and all that she could hope was, by giving the first information herself, to save her from hearing it abruptly from others. It was now about the time that she was likely to call. If she were to meet Miss Bates in her way—and upon its beginning to rain, Emma was obliged to expect that the weather would be detaining her at Mrs. Goddard's, and that the intelligence would undoubtedly rush upon her without preparation. The shower was heavy, but short and it had not been over five minutes, when in came Harriet, with just the heated, agitated look which hurrying thither with a full heart was likely to give, and the, "'Oh, Miss Woodhouse, what do you think has happened?' which instantly burst forth, had all the evidence of corresponding perturbation. As the blow was given, Emma felt that she could not show greater kindness than in listening, and Harriet, unchecked, ran eagerly through what she had to tell. She had set out from Mrs. Goddard's half an hour ago. She had been afraid it would rain. She had been afraid it would pour down every moment. But she thought she might get to Hartfield first. She had hurried on as fast as possible. But then she was passing by the house where a young woman was making up a gown for her. She thought she would just step in and see how it went on. And though she did not seem to stay half a moment there, soon after she came out it began to rain and she did not know what to do. So she ran on directly, as fast as she could, and took shelter at Ford's. Ford's was the principal woollen-draper, linen-draper, and haberdasher's shop united, the shop first in size and fashion in the place. And so, there she had sat, without an idea of anything in the world, full ten minutes, perhaps, when all of a sudden, who should come in? To be sure it was so very odd, but they always dealt at Ford's. Who should come in but Elizabeth Martin and her brother? Dear Miss Woodhouse, only think! I thought I should have fainted. I did not know what to do. I was sitting near the door. Elizabeth saw me directly, but he did not. He was busy with the umbrella. I am sure she saw me, but she looked away directly and took no notice. And they both went to quite the farther end of the shop, and I kept sitting near the door. Oh, dear! I was so miserable! I am sure I must have been as white as my gown. I could not go away, you know, because of the rain, but I did so wish myself anywhere in the world but there. Oh, dear Miss Woodhouse! Well, at last, I fancy, he looked round and saw me, for instead of going on with her buyings, they began whispering to one another. I am sure they were talking of me, and I could not help thinking that he was persuading her to speak to me. Do you think he was, Miss Woodhouse? For presently she came forward, came quite up to me, and asked how I did, and seemed ready to shake hands if I would. She did not do any of it in the same way that she used. I could see that she was altered. But, however, she seemed to try to be quite friendly, and we shook hands and stood talking some time. But I know no more what I said. I was in such a tremble, and I remember she said she was sorry we never met now, which I thought almost too kind. Dear Miss Woodhouse, I was absolutely miserable. By that time it was beginning to hold up, and I was determined that nothing should stop me from getting away. And then, only think, I found he was coming up towards me too, slowly, you know, and as if he did not quite know what to do. And so he came and spoke, and I answered, and I stood for a minute feeling dreadfully, you know, one can't tell how, and then I took courage and said it did not rain, and I must go, and so off I set, and I had not got three yards from the door when he came after me, only to say if I was going to Hartfield, he thought I had much better go round by Mr. Cole's stables, for I should find the near way quite floated by this rain. Oh, dear, I thought it would have been the death of me. So I said, I was very much obliged to him. You know I could not do less. And then he went back to Elizabeth, and I came round by the stables. I believe I did. But I hardly knew where I was, or anything about it. Oh, Miss Woodhouse, I would rather done anything that have it happen. And yet, you know, there was a sort of satisfaction in seeing him behave so pleasantly and so kindly. 
and Elizabeth, too. Oh, Miss Woodhouse, do talk to me and make me comfortable again." Very sincerely did Emma wish to do so, but it was not immediately in her power. She was obliged to stop and think. She was not thoroughly comfortable herself. The young man's conduct and his sister's seemed the result of real feeling, and she could not but pity them. As Harriet described it, there had been an interesting mixture of wounded affection and genuine delicacy in their behaviour. But she had believed them to be well-meaning, worthy people before, and what difference did this make in the evils of the connection? It was folly to be disturbed by it. Of course he must be sorry to lose her, they must all be sorry. Ambition as well as love had probably been mortified. They might all have hoped to rise by Harriet's acquaintance, and besides what was the value of Harriet's description? So easily pleased, so little discerning, what signified her praise? She exerted herself and did try to make her comfortable, by considering all that had passed as a mere trifle, and quite unworthy of being dwelt on. "'It might be distressing for the moment,' said she. "'But you seem to have behaved extremely well, and it is over, and may never, can never, as a first meeting, occur again, and therefore you need not think about it.' Harriet said, "'Very true,' and she would not think about it. But still she talked of it. Still she could talk of nothing else, and Emma, at last, in order to put the Martins out of her head, was obliged to hurry on the news, which she had meant to give with so much tender caution, hardly knowing herself whether to rejoice or be angry, ashamed or only amused, at such a state of mind in poor Harriet, such a conclusion of Mr. Elton's importance with her. Mr. Elton's rights, however, gradually revived. Though she did not feel the first intelligence as she might have done the day before, or an hour before, its interest soon increased, and before their first conversation was over, she had talked herself into all the sensations of curiosity, wonder and regret, pain and pleasure, as to this fortune at Miss Hawkins, which could conduce to place the Martins under proper subordination in her fancy. Emma learned to be rather glad that there had been such a meeting. It had been serviceable in deadening the first shock, without retaining any influence to alarm. As Harriet now lived, the Martins could not get at her, without seeking her, where hitherto they had wanted either the courage or the condescension to seek her. For since her refusal of the brother, the sisters never had been at Mrs. Goddard's, and a twelve-month might pass without their being thrown together again, with any necessity, or even any power of speech. End of chapter 3 Volume two, chapter four of Emma. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Emma by Jane Austen. Volume two, chapter four. Human nature is so well disposed towards those who are in interesting situations that a young person who either marries or dies is sure of being kindly spoken of. A week had not passed since Miss Hawkins's name was first mentioned in Highbury, before she was, by some means or other, discovered to have every recommendation of person and mind, to be handsome, elegant, highly accomplished, and perfectly amiable. And when Mr. Elton himself arrived to triumph in his happy prospects, and circulate the fame of her merits, there was very little more for him to do than to tell her Christian name, and say whose music she principally played. Mr. Elton returned a very happy man. He had gone away rejected and mortified, disappointed in a very sanguine hope, after a series of what appeared to him strong encouragement, and not only losing the right lady, but finding himself debased to the level of a very wrong one. He had gone away deeply offended. He came back engaged to another, and to another as superior, of course, to the first, as under such circumstances what is gained always is to what is lost. He came back gay and self-satisfied, eager and busy, caring nothing for Miss Woodhouse, and defying Miss Smith. The charming Augusta Hawkins, in addition to all the usual advantages of perfect beauty and merit, was in possession of an independent fortune, of so many thousands as would be always called ten, a point of some dignity, as well as some convenience. The story told well. He had not thrown himself away. He had gained a woman of ten thousand pounds or thereabouts, and he had gained her with such delightful rapidity, 
the first hour of introduction had been so very soon followed by distinguishing notice, the history which he had to give Mrs. Cole of the rise and progress of the affair was so glorious, the steps so quick, from the accidental rencontre to the dinner at Mr. Green's and the party at Mrs. Brown's, smiles and blushes rising in importance, with consciousness and agitation richly scattered, the lady had been so easily impressed, so sweetly disposed had, in short, to use a most intelligible phrase, been so very ready to have him, that vanity and prudence were equally contented. He had caught both substance and shadow, both fortune and affection, and was just the happy man he ought to be, talking only of himself and his own concerns, expecting to be congratulated, ready to be laughed at, and with cordial fearless smiles, now addressing all the young ladies of the place, to whom, a few weeks ago, he would have been more cautiously gallant. The wedding was no distant event, as the parties had only themselves to please, and nothing but the necessary preparations to wait for. And when he set out for Bath again, there was a general expectation, which a certain glance of Mrs. Cole's did not seem to contradict, that when he next entered Highbury, he would bring his bride. During his present short stay, Emma had barely seen him, but just enough to feel that the first meeting was over, and to give her the impression of his not being improved by the mixture of pique and pretension now spread over his air. She was, in fact, beginning very much to wonder that she had ever thought him pleasing at all, and his sight was so inseparably connected with some very disagreeable feelings, that except in a moral light, as a penance, a lesson, a source of profitable humiliation to her own mind, she would have been thankful to be assured of never seeing him again. She wished him very well, but he gave her pain, and his welfare twenty miles off would administer most satisfaction. The pain of his continued residence in Highbury, however, must certainly be lessened by his marriage. Many vain solicitudes would be prevented, many awkwardnesses smoothed by it. A Mrs. Elton would be an excuse for any change of intercourse. Former intimacy might sink without remark. It would be almost beginning their life of civility again. Of the lady individually, Emma thought very little. She was good enough for Mr. Elton, no doubt, accomplished enough for Highbury, handsome enough, to look plain, probably by Harriet's side. As to connection, there Emma was perfectly easy. Persuaded that after all his own vaunted claims and disdain of Harriet, he had done nothing. On that article truth seemed attainable. What she was must be uncertain, but who she was might be found out and setting aside the twenty thousand pounds, it did not appear that she was at all Harriet's superior. She brought no name, no blood, no alliance. Miss Hawkins was the youngest of the two daughters of a Bristol merchant. Of course he must be called. But as the whole of the profits of his mercantile life appeared so very moderate, it was not unfair to guess the dignity of his line of trade had been a very moderate also. Part of every winter she had been used to spend in Bath, but Bristol was her home, the very heart of Bristol. For though the father and mother had died some years ago, an uncle remained, in the law line, nothing more distinctly honourable was hazarded of him than that he was in the law line, and with him the daughter had lived. Emma guessed him to be the drudge of some attorney, and too stupid to rise. And all the grandeur of the connection seemed dependent on the elder sister, who was very well married, to a gentleman in a great way, near Bristol, who kept two carriages. That was the wind-up of the history. That was the glory of Miss Hawkins. Could she but have given Harriet her feelings about it all? She had talked her into love, but, alas, she was not so easily to be talked out of it. The charm of an object to accompany the many vacancies of Harriet's mind was not to be talked away. He might be superseded by another. He certainly would, indeed. Nothing could be clearer. Even a Robert Martin would have been sufficient but nothing else, she feared, would cure her. Harriet was one of those who, having once begun, would be always in love. And now, poor girl, she was considerably worse from this reappearance of Mr. Elton. She was always having a glimpse of him somewhere or other. Emma saw him only once, but two or three times every day Harriet was sure just to meet with him, or just to miss him, just to hear his voice, or see his shoulder, just to have something occur to preserve him in her fancy, in all the favouring warmth of surprise and conjecture. She was, moreover, perpetually hearing about him. 
for, excepting when at Hartfield, she was always among those who saw no fault in Mr. Elton, and found nothing so interesting as the discussion of his concerns, and every report, therefore, every guess, all that had already occurred, all that might occur in the arrangement of his affairs, comprehending income, servants, and furniture, was continually in agitation around her. Her regard was receiving strength by invariable praise of him, and her regrets kept alive, and feelings irritated by ceaseless repetitions of Miss Hawkins' happiness, and continual observation of how much he seemed attached, his air as he walked by the house, the very sitting of his hat, being all in proof of how much he was in love. Had it been allowable entertainment, had there been no pain to her friend or reproach to herself in the waverings of Harriet's mind, Emma would have been amused by its variations. Sometimes Mr. Elton predominated, sometimes the Martins, and each was occasionally useful as a check to the other. Mr. Elton's engagement had been the cure of the agitation of meeting Mr. Martin. The unhappiness produced by the knowledge of that engagement had been a little put aside by Elizabeth Martin's calling at Mrs. Goddard's a few days afterwards. Harriet had not been at home, but a note had been prepared and left for her, written in the very style to touch, a small mixture of reproach, with a great deal of kindness, and till Mr. Elton himself appeared, she had been much occupied by it, continually pondering over what could be done in return, and wishing to do more than she dared to confess. But Mr. Elton in person had driven away all such cares. While he stayed, the Martins were forgotten, and on the very morning of his setting off for Bath again, Emma, to dissipate some of the distress it occasioned, judged it best for her to return Elizabeth Martin's visit. How that visit was to be acknowledged, what would be necessary, and what might be safest, had been a point of some doubtful consideration. Absolute neglect of the mother and sisters, when invited to come, would be ingratitude. It must not be. And yet the danger of a renewal of the acquaintance. After much thinking, she could determine on nothing better than Harriet's returning the visit, but in a way that, if they had understanding, should convince them that it was only to be a formal acquaintance. She meant to take her in the carriage, leave her at the Abbey Mill while she drove a little further, and call for her again so soon, as to allow no time for insidious applications or dangerous recurrences to the past, and give the most decided proof of what degree of intimacy was chosen for the future. She could think of nothing better and though there was something in it which her own heart could not approve, something of ingratitude merely glossed over, it must be done, or what would become of Harriet. End of chapter 4 Volume 2, Chapter 5 of Emma This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett Emma by Jane Austen Volume Two, Chapter Five. Small heart had Harriet for visiting. Only half an hour before her friend called for her at Mrs. Goddard's, her evil stars had led her to the very spot where, at that moment, a trunk directed to the Reverend Philip Elton, White Hart, Bath, was to be seen under the operation of being lifted into the butcher's cart, which was to convey it to where the coaches passed, and everything in this world, excepting that trunk and the direction, was consequently a blank. She went, however, and when they reached the farm, and she was to be put down at the end of the broad, neat gravel walk, which led between espalier apple-trees to the front door, the sight of everything which had given her so much pleasure the autumn before, was beginning to revive a little local agitation, and when they parted, Emma observed her to be looking around with a sort of fearful curiosity, which determined her not to allow the visit to exceed the proposed quarter of an hour. She went on herself, to give that portion of time to an old servant who was married, and settled in Donwell. The quarter of an hour brought her punctually to the white gate again, and Miss Smith, receiving her summons, was with her without delay, and unattended by any alarming young man. She came solitarily down the gravel walk, a Miss Martin just appearing at the door, and parting with her seemingly with ceremonious civility. Harriet could not very soon give an intelligible account. She was feeling too much. But at last Emma collected from her enough to understand the sort of meeting, and the sort of pain it was creating. She had seen only Mrs. Martin and the two girls. They had received her doubtingly, if not coolly, and nothing beyond the merest commonplace had been talked almost all the time. 
till just at last, when Mrs. Martin sang all of a sudden that she thought Miss Smith was grown, had brought on a more interesting subject and a warmer manner. In that very room she had been measured last September, with her two friends. There were the pencilled marks and memorandums on the wainscot by the window. He had done it. They all seemed to remember the day, the hour, the party, the occasion, to feel the same consciousness, the same regrets, to be ready to return to the same good understanding, and they were just growing again like themselves, Harriet, as Emma must suspect, as ready as the best of them to be cordial and happy, when the carriage reappeared, and all was over. The style of the visit, and the shortness of it, were then felt to be decisive. Fourteen minutes to be given to those with whom she had thankfully passed six weeks, not six months ago. Emma could not but picture it all, and feel how justly they might resent, how naturally Harriet must suffer. It was a bad business. She would have given a great deal, or endured a great deal, to have had the Martins in a higher rank of life. They were so deserving, that a little higher should have been enough. But as it was, how could she have done otherwise? Impossible! She could not repent. They must be separated. But there was a great deal of pain in the process, so much to herself at this time, that she soon felt the necessity of a little consolation, and resolved on going home by way of Randall's to procure it. Her mind was quite sick of Mr. Elton and the Martins. The refreshment of Randall's was absolutely necessary. It was a good scheme, but on driving to the door they heard that neither master nor mistress was at home. They had both been out some time. The man believed they were gone to Hartfield. "'This is too bad,' cried Emma, as they turned away. "'And now we shall just miss them. Too provoking. I do not know when I have been so disappointed.' And she leaned back in the corner, to indulge her murmurs, or to reason them away. Probably a little of both, such being the commonest process of a not ill-disposed mind. Presently the carriage stopped. She looked up. It was stopped by Mr. and Mrs. Weston, who were standing to speak to her. There was instant pleasure in the sight of them, and still greater pleasure was conveyed in sound, for Mr. Weston immediately accosted her with, "'How do you do? How do you do? We have been sitting with your father. Glad to see him so well. Frank comes to-morrow. I had a letter this morning. We see him to-morrow by dinner-time to a certainty. He is at Oxford to-day, and he comes for a whole fortnight. I knew it would be so. If he had come at Christmas, he could not have stayed three days. I was always glad he did not come at Christmas. Now we are going to have just the right weather for him. Fine, dry, settled weather. We shall enjoy him completely. Everything has turned out exactly as we could wish." There was no resisting such news, no possibility of avoiding the influence of such a happy face as Mr. Weston's, confirmed as it all was by the words and the countenance of his wife, fewer and quieter, but not less to the purpose. To know that she thought his coming certain was enough to make Emma consider it so, and sincerely did she rejoice in their joy. It was a most delightful reanimation of exhausted spirits. The worn-out past was sunk in the freshness of what was coming, and in the rapidity of half a moment's thought she hoped Mr. Elton would now be talked of no more. Mr. Weston gave her the history of the engagements at Enscombe, which allowed his son to answer for having an entire fortnight at his command, as well as the route and the method of his journey, and she listened, and smiled, and congratulated. "'I shall soon bring him over to Hartfield,' said he at the conclusion. Emma could imagine she saw a touch of the arm at this speech, from his wife. "'We had better move on, Mr. Weston,' said she. "'We are detaining the girls.' "'Well, well, I am ready,' and turning again to Emma, "'but you must not be expecting such a very fine young man. You have only had my account, you know. I dare say he is really nothing extraordinary.' Though his own sparkling eyes at the moment were speaking a very different conviction. Emma could look perfectly unconscious and innocent, and answer in a manner that appropriated nothing. "'Think of me to-morrow, my dear Emma, about four o'clock.' was Mrs. Weston's parting injunction, spoken with some anxiety, and meant only for her. Four o'clock! Depend upon it, he will be here by three, was Mr. Weston's quick amendment, and so ended a most satisfactory meeting. Emma's spirits were mounted quite up to happiness, everything wore a different air, James and his horses seemed not half so sluggish as before. When she looked at the hedges, she thought the elder, at least, must soon be coming out, and when she turned round to Harriet, she saw something like a look of spring, 
a tender smile even there. "'Will Frank Churchill pass through Bath as well as Oxford?' was a question, however, which did not augur much. But neither geography nor tranquillity could come all at once, and Emma was now in a humour to resolve that they should both come in time. The morning of the interesting day arrived, and Mrs. Weston's faithful pupil did not forget either at ten, or eleven, or twelve o'clock, that she was to think of her at four. "'My dear, dear anxious friend!' said she in mental soliloquy, while walking downstairs from her own room, "'always over-careful for everybody's comfort but your own. I see you now, in all your little fidgets, going again and again into his room, to be sure that all is right.' The clock struck twelve as she passed through the hall. "'Tis twelve. I shall not forget to think of you four hours hence, and by this time to-morrow, perhaps, or a little later, I may be thinking of the possibility of their all calling here. I am sure they will bring him soon." She opened the parlour door, and saw two gentlemen sitting with her father, Mr. Weston and his son. They had been arrived only a few minutes, and Mr. Weston had scarcely finished his explanation of Frank's being a day before his time, and her father was yet in the midst of his very civil welcome and congratulations, when she appeared, to have her share of surprise, introduction, and pleasure. The Frank Churchill, so long talked of, so high in interest, was actually before her, he was presented to her, and she did not think too much had been said in his praise. He was a very good-looking young man. Height, air, address, all were unexceptionable, and his countenance had a great deal of the spirit and liveliness of his father's. He looked quick and sensible. She felt immediately that she should like him, and there was a well-bred ease of manner, and a readiness to talk, which convinced her that he came intending to be acquainted with her, and that acquainted they soon must be. He had reached Randall's the evening before. She was pleased with the eagerness to arrive which had made him alter his plan, and travel earlier, later, and quicker, that he might gain half a day. "'I told you yesterday,' cried Mr. Weston, with exultation, "'I told you all that he would be here before the time named. I remembered what I used to do myself. One cannot creep upon a journey. One cannot help getting on faster than one has planned. And the pleasure of coming in upon one's friends before the lookout begins is worth a great deal more than any little exertion it needs." "'It is a great pleasure where one can indulge in it,' said the young man, "'though there are not many houses that I should presume on so far. But in coming home I felt I might do anything." The word home made his father look on him with fresh complacency. Emma was directly sure that he knew how to make himself agreeable. The conviction was strengthened by what followed. He was very much pleased with Randall's, thought it a most admirably arranged house, would hardly allow it even to be very small, admired the situation, the walk to Highbury, Highbury itself, Hartfield still more, and professed himself to have always felt the sort of interest in the country which none but one's own country gives, and the greatest curiosity to visit it. That he should never have been able to indulge so amiable a feeling before, passed suspiciously through Emma's brain. But still, if it were a falsehood, it was a pleasant one, and pleasantly handled. His manner had no air of study or exaggeration. He did really look and speak as if in a state of no common enjoyment. Their subjects in general were such as belonged to an opening acquaintance. On his side were the inquiries, Was she a horsewoman? Pleasant rides? Pleasant walks? Had they a large neighbourhood? Highbury, perhaps, afforded society enough? There were several very pretty houses in and about it. Balls? Had they balls? Was it a musical society?" But when satisfied on all these points, and their acquaintance proportionately advanced, he contrived to find an opportunity, while their two fathers were engaged with each other, of introducing his mother-in-law, and speaking of her with so much handsome praise, so much warm admiration, so much gratitude for the happiness she secured to his father, and her very kind reception of himself, as was an additional proof of his knowing how to please, and of his certainly thinking it worth while to try to please her, he did not advance a word of praise beyond what she knew to be thoroughly deserved by Mrs. Weston but undoubtedly he could know very little of the matter. He understood what would be welcome. He could be sure of little else. "'His father's marriage,' he said, "'had been the wisest measure. Every friend must rejoice in it. And the family from whom he had received such a blessing must be ever considered as having conferred the highest obligation on him.' 
he got as near as he could to thanking her for Miss Taylor's merits, without seeming quite to forget that in the common course of things it was to be rather supposed that Miss Taylor had formed Miss Woodhouse's character, than Miss Woodhouse Miss Taylor's. And at last, as if resolved to qualify his opinion completely for travelling round to its object, he wound it all up with astonishment at the youth and beauty of her person. "'Elegant, agreeable manners I was prepared for,' said he. But I confess that, considering everything, I had not expected more than a very tolerably well-looking woman of a certain age. I did not know that I was to find a pretty young woman in Mrs. Weston." "'You cannot see too much perfection in Mrs. Weston for my feelings,' said Emma. Were you to guess her to be eighteen, I should listen with pleasure. But she would be ready to quarrel with you for using such words. Don't let her imagine that you have spoken of her as a pretty young woman." "'I hope I should know better,' he replied. No, depend upon it," with a gallant bow, that in addressing Mrs. Weston I should understand whom I might praise, without any danger of being thought extravagant in my terms. Emma wondered whether the same suspicion of what might be expected from their knowing each other, which had taken strong possession of her mind, had ever crossed his, and whether his compliments were to be considered as marks of acquiescence, or proofs of defiance. She must see more of him to understand his ways. At present she only felt they were agreeable. She had no doubt of what Mr. Weston was thinking about. His quick eye she detected again and again glancing towards them with a happy expression, and even when he might have determined not to look, she was confident that he was often listening. Her own father's perfect exemption from any thought of the kind, the entire deficiency in him of all such sort of penetration of, or suspicion, was a most comfortable circumstance. Happily he was not farther from approving matrimony than from foreseeing it. Though always objecting to every marriage that was arranged, he never suffered beforehand from the apprehension of any. It seemed as if he could not think so ill of any two persons' understanding, as to suppose they meant to marry till it were proved against them. She blessed the favouring blindness. He could now, without the drawback of a single unpleasant surmise, without a glance forward at any possible treachery in his guest, give way to all his natural kind-hearted civility, in solicitous inquiries after Mr. Frank Churchill's accommodation on his journey, through the sad evils of sleeping two nights on the road, and express very genuine unmixed anxiety, to know that he had certainly escaped catching cold which, however, he could not allow him to feel quite assured of himself till after another night. A reasonable visit paid, Mr. Weston began to move. He must be going. He had business at the Crown about his hay, and a great many errands for Mrs. Weston at Ford's. But he need not hurry anybody else." His son, too well bred to hear the hint, rose immediately also, saying, as you are going farther on business, sir, I will take the opportunity of paying a visit, which must be paid some day or other, and therefore may as well be paid now. I have the honour of being acquainted with a neighbour of yours," turning to Emma, a lady residing in or near Highbury, a family of the name of Fairfax. I shall have no difficulty, I suppose, in finding the house. Though Fairfax, I believe, is not the proper name, I should rather say Barnes or Bates. Do you know any family of that name? "'To be sure we do,' cried his father. "'Mrs. Bates, we passed her house. I saw Miss Bates at the window. True, true, you are acquainted with Miss Fairfax. I remember you knew her at Weymouth. And a fine girl she is. Call upon her, by all means.' "'There is no necessity for my calling this morning,' said the young man. "'Another day would do as well. But there was that degree of acquaintance at Weymouth which—' "'Oh, go to-day, go to-day. Do not defer it. What is right to be done cannot be done too soon. And besides, I must give you a hint, Frank. Any want of attention to her here should be carefully avoided. You saw her with the Campbells, when she was the equal of everybody she mixed with. But here she is with a poor old grandmother, who has barely enough to live on. If you do not call early, it will be a slight." The son looked convinced. "'I have heard her speak of the acquaintance,' said Emma. She is a very elegant young woman." He agreed to it but with so quiet a yes, as inclined her almost to doubt his real concurrence, and yet there must be a very distinct sort of elegance for the fashionable world, if Jane Fairfax could be thought only ordinarily gifted with it. "'If you were never particularly struck by her manners before,' said she, "'I think you will to-day. You will see her to advantage. See her and hear her. No, I am afraid you will not hear her at all, for she has an aunt who never holds her tongue.' 
"'You are acquainted with Miss Jane Fairfax, sir, are you?' said Mr. Woodhouse, always the last to make his way in conversation. "'Then give me leave to assure you that you will find her a very agreeable young lady. She is staying here on a visit to her grandmamma and aunt, very worthy people. I have known them all my life. They will be extremely glad to see you, I am sure, and one of my servants shall go with you to show you the way. My dear sir, upon no account in the world, my father can direct me. But your father is not going so far. He is only going to the Crown, quite on the other side of the street, and there are a great many houses. You might be very much at a loss, and it is a very dirty walk, unless you keep on the footpath. But my coachman can tell you where you had best cross the street." Mr. Frank Churchill still declined it, looking as serious as he could, and his father gave his hearty support by calling out, "'My good friend, this is quite unnecessary. Frank knows a puddle of water when he sees it, and as to Mrs. Bates, he may get there from the crown in a hop, step, and jump.' They were permitted to go alone, and with a cordial nod from one, and a graceful bow from the other, the two gentlemen took leave. Emma remained very well pleased with this beginning of the acquaintance, and could now engage to think of them all at Randall's any hour of the day, with full confidence in their comfort. End of chapter 5 Volume 2, Chapter 6 of Emma This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett Emma by Jane Austen Volume Two, Chapter Six. The next morning brought Mr. Frank Churchill again. He came with Mrs. Weston, to whom and to Highbury he seemed to take very cordially. He had been sitting with her, it appeared, most companionably at home, till her usual hour of exercise, and on being desired to choose their walk, immediately fixed on Highbury. He did not doubt there being very pleasant walks in every direction, but if left to him, he should always choose the same. Highbury, that airy, cheerful, happy-looking Highbury, would be his constant attraction. Highbury, with Mrs. Weston, stood for Hartfield, and she trusted to its bearing the same construction with him. They walked thither directly. Emma had hardly expected them, for Mr. Weston, who had called in for half a minute, in order to hear that his son was very handsome, knew nothing of their plans, and it was an agreeable surprise to her, therefore, to perceive them walking up to the house together, arm in arm. She was wanting to see him again, and especially to see him in company with Mrs. Weston, upon his behaviour to whom her opinion of him was to depend. If he were deficient there, nothing should make amends for it. But on seeing them together, she became perfectly satisfied. It was not merely in fine words, or hyperbolical compliment, that he paid his duty. Nothing could be more proper or pleasing than his whole manner to her. Nothing could more agreeably denote his wish of considering her as a friend, and securing her affection and there was time enough for Emma to form a reasonable judgment, as their visit included all the rest of the morning. They were all three walking about together for an hour or two, first round the shrubberies of Hartfield, and afterwards in Highbury. He was delighted with everything, admired Hartfield sufficiently for Mr. Woodhouse's ear, and when their going farther was resolved on, confessed his wish to be made acquainted with the whole village, and found matter of commendation and interest much oftener than Emma could have supposed. Some of the objects of his curiosity spoke very amiable feelings. He begged to be shown the house which his father had lived in so long, and which had been the home of his father's father, and on recollecting that an old woman who had nursed him was still living, walked in quest of her cottage from one end of the street to the other, and though in some points of pursuit or observation there was no positive merit, they showed altogether a good will towards Highbury in general, which must be very like a merit to those he was with. Emma watched and decided that with such feelings as were now shown, it could not be fairly supposed that he had ever been voluntarily absenting himself, that he had not been acting a part, or making a parade of insincere professions, and that Mr. Knightley certainly had not done him justice. Their first pause was at the Crown Inn, an inconsiderable house, though the principal one of the sort, where a couple of pair of post-horses were kept, more for the convenience of the neighbourhood than from any run on the road and his companions had not expected to be detained by any interest excited there. But in passing it they gave the history of the large room visibly added. It had been built many years ago for a ballroom, and while the neighbourhood had been in particularly populous, dancing state, had been occasionally used as such. But such brilliant days had long passed away, 
and now the highest purpose for which it was ever wanted, was to accommodate a whist-club established among the gentlemen and half-gentlemen of the place. He was immediately interested. Its character as a ballroom caught him, and instead of passing on, he stopped for several minutes at the two superior sashed windows which were open, to look in and contemplate its capabilities, and lament that its original purpose should have ceased. He saw no fault in the room. He would acknowledge none which they suggested. No, it was long enough, broad enough, handsome enough. It would hold the very number for comfort. They ought to have balls there at least every fortnight through the winter. Why had not Miss Woodhouse revived the former good old days of the room? She who could do anything in Highbury. The want of proper families in the place, and the conviction that none beyond the place in its immediate environs could be tempted to attend, were mentioned. But he was not satisfied. He could not be persuaded that so many good-looking houses as he saw all around them, could not furnish numbers enough for such a meeting. And even when particulars were given and families described, he was still unwilling to admit that the inconvenience of such a mixture would be anything, or that there would be the smallest difficulty in everybody's returning to their proper place the next morning. He argued like a young man very much bent on dancing, and Emma was rather surprised to see the constitution of the Weston prevail so decidedly against the habits of the Churchills. He seemed to have all the life and spirit, cheerful feelings, and social inclinations of his father, and nothing of the pride or reserve of Enscombe. Of pride, indeed, there was perhaps scarcely enough. His indifference to a confusion of rank bordered too much on inelegance of mind. He could be no judge, however, of the evil he was holding cheap. It was but an effusion of lively spirits. At last he was persuaded to move on from the front of the crown, and being now almost facing the house where the Bateses lodged, Emma recollected his intended visit the day before, and asked him if he had paid it. "'Yes, oh, yes,' he replied. "'I was just going to mention it. A very successful visit. I saw all the three ladies, and felt very much obliged to you for your preparatory hint. If the talking aunt had taken me quite by surprise, it must have been the death of me. As it was, I was only betrayed into paying a most unreasonable visit. Ten minutes would have been all that was necessary, perhaps all that was proper, and I had told my father I should certainly be home before him. But there was no getting away, no pause, and to my utter astonishment I found when he, finding me nowhere else, joined me there at last, that I had actually been sitting with them very nearly three-quarters of an hour. The good lady had not given me the possibility of escape before." "'And how did you think Miss Fairfax looking?' "'Ill, very ill. That is, if a young lady can ever be allowed to look ill. But the expression is hardly admissible, Mrs. Weston, is it? Ladies can never look ill. And seriously, Miss Fairfax is naturally so pale, as almost always to give the appearance of ill-health, a most deplorable want of complexion." Emma would not agree to this, and began a warm defence of Miss Fairfax's complexion. It was certainly never brilliant, but she would not allow it to have a sickly hue in general. And there was a softness and delicacy in her skin, which gave peculiar elegance to the character of her face." He listened with all due deference, acknowledged that he had heard many people say the same, but yet he must confess that to him nothing could make amends for the want of the fine glow of health. Where features were indifferent, a fine complexion gave beauty to them all, and where they were good, the effect was—fortunately, he need not attempt to describe what the effect was. "'Well,' said Emma, there is no disputing about taste. At least you admire her, except her complexion." He shook his head, and laughed. "'I cannot separate Miss Fairfax and her complexion.' "'Did you see her often at Weymouth? Were you often in the same society?' At this moment they were approaching Ford's, and he hastily exclaimed, "'Ha! This must be the very shop that everybody attends every day of their lives, as my father informs me. He comes to Highbury himself, he says, six days out of the seven, and has always business at Ford's. If it be not inconvenient to you, pray let us go in, that I may prove myself to belong to the place, to be a true citizen of Highbury. I must buy something at Ford's. It will be taking out my freedom. I dare say they sell gloves." "'Oh, yes! Gloves and everything! I do admire your patriotism. You will be adored in Highbury. You were very popular before you came, because you were Mr. Weston's son. But lay out half a guinea at Ford's, and your popularity will stand upon your own virtues." They went in, and while the sleek, well-tied parcels of men's beavers and York tan were bringing down and displaying on the counter, he said, 
But I beg your pardon, Miss Woodhouse. You were speaking to me. You were saying something at the very moment of this burst of my amour patrie. Do not let me lose it. I assure you the utmost stretch of public fame would not make me amends for the loss of any happiness in private life." I merely asked whether you had known much of Miss Fairfax in her party at Weymouth. And now that I understand your question, I must pronounce it to be a very unfair one. It is always the lady's right to decide on the degree of acquaintance. Miss Fairfax must have already given her account. I shall not commit myself by claiming more than she may choose to allow." Upon my word! You answer as discreetly as she could do herself. But her account of everything leaves so much to be guessed, she is so very reserved, so very unwilling to give the least information about anybody, that I really think you may say what you like of your acquaintance with her." "'May I indeed? Then I will speak the truth, and nothing suits me so well. I met her frequently at Weymouth. I had known the Campbells a little in town, and at Weymouth we were very much in the same set. Colonel Campbell is a very agreeable man, and Mrs. Campbell a friendly, warm-hearted woman. I like them all." You know Miss Fairfax's situation in life, I conclude. What she is destined to be?" Yes, rather hesitatingly. I believe I do. You get upon delicate subjects, Emma," said Mrs. Weston, smiling. Remember that I am here. Mr. Frank Churchill hardly knows what to say when you speak of Miss Fairfax's situation in life. I will move a little farther off." "'I certainly do forget to think of her,' said Emma, as having ever been but anything but my friend and my dearest friend." He looked as if he fully understood and honoured such a sentiment. When the gloves were bought, and they had quitted the shop again, "'Did you ever hear the young lady we were speaking of play?' said Frank Churchill. "'Ever hear her?' repeated Emma. You forget how much she belongs to Highbury. I have heard her every year of our lives since we both began. She plays charmingly." "'You think so, do you? I wanted the opinion of some one who could really judge. She appeared to me to play well, that is, with considerable taste, but I know nothing of the matter myself. I am excessively fond of music, but without the smallest skill or right of judging of anybody's performance. I have been used to hear hers admired and I remember one proof of her being thought to play well. A man, a very musical man, and in love with another woman, engaged to her, on the point of marriage, would yet never ask that other woman to sit down to the instrument, if the lady in question could sit down instead, never seemed to like to hear one if he could hear the other. That, I thought, in a man of known musical talent, was some proof." "'Proof, indeed,' said Emma, highly amused. Mr. Dixon is very musical, is he? We shall know more about them all in half an hour, from you, than Miss Fairfax would have vouchsafed in half a year." Yes, Mr. Dixon and Miss Campbell were the persons, and I thought it a very strong proof. Certainly, very strong it was. To own the truth a great deal stronger than, if I had been Miss Campbell, would have been at all agreeable to me. I could not excuse a man's having more music than love, more ear than I, a more acute sensibility to fine sounds than to my feelings. How did Miss Campbell appear to like it?" "'It was a very particular friend, you know.' "'Poor comfort,' said Emma, laughing. One would rather have a stranger preferred than one's very particular friend. With a stranger it might not recur again. But the misery of having a very particular friend always at hand, to do everything better than one does oneself. Poor Mrs. Dixon! Well, I am glad she has gone to settle in Ireland." "'You are right. It was not very flattering to Miss Campbell. But really she did not seem to feel it." And "'So much the better. Or so much the worse. I do not know which. But be it sweetness, or be it stupidity in her, quickness of friendship, or dullness of feeling, there was one person, I think, who must have felt it. Miss Fairfax herself. She must have felt the improper and dangerous distinction." "'As to that, I do not—oh, do not imagine that I expect an account of Miss Fairfax's sensations from you, or from anybody else. They are known to no human being, I guess, but herself. But if she continued to play whenever she was asked by Mr. Dixon, one may guess what one chooses." There appeared such a perfectly good understanding among them all," he began rather quickly, but checking himself added, "'However, it is impossible for me to say on what terms they really were, how it might be all behind the scenes. I can only say that there was smoothness outwardly. 
But you, who have known Miss Fairfax from a child, must be a better judge of her character, and of how she is likely to conduct herself in critical situations than I can be." "'I have known her from a child, undoubtedly. We have been children and women together, and it is natural to suppose that we should be intimate, that we should have taken to each other whenever she visited her friends. But we never did. I hardly know how it has happened a little, perhaps, from that wickedness on my side, which was prone to take disgust towards a girl so idolised, and so cried up as she always was, by her aunt and grandmother, and all their set. And then her reserve! I never could attach myself to any one so completely reserved." "'It is a most repulsive quality, indeed,' said he. Oftentimes very convenient, no doubt, but never pleasing. There is safety in reserve, but no attraction. One cannot love a reserved person. Not till the reserve ceases towards oneself, and then the attraction may be the greater. But I must be more in want of a friend, or an agreeable companion, than I have yet been, to take the trouble of conquering anybody's reserve to procure one. Intimacy between Miss Fairfax and me is quite out of the question. I have no reason to think ill of her, not the least except that such extreme and perpetual cautiousness of word and manner, such a dread of giving a distinct idea about anybody, is apt to suggest of there being something to conceal." He perfectly agreed with her, and after walking together so long, and thinking so much alike, Emma felt herself so well acquainted with him, that she could hardly believe it to be only their second meeting. He was not exactly what she had expected less of the man of the world in some of his notions, less of the spoiled child of fortune, therefore better than she had expected. His ideas seemed more moderate, his feelings warmer. She was particularly struck by his manner of considering Mr. Elton's house, which, as well as the church, he would go and look at, and would not join them in finding much fault with. No, he could not believe it a bad house, not such a house as a man was to be pitied for having. If it were to be shared with the woman he loved, he could not think any man to be pitied for having that house. There must be ample room in it for every real comfort. The man must be a blockhead who wanted more." Mrs. Weston laughed, and said he did not know what he was talking about. Used only to a large house himself, and without ever thinking how many advantages and accommodations were attached to its size, he could be no judge of the privations inevitably belonging to a small one. But Emma, in her own mind, determined that he did know what he was talking about, and that he showed a very amiable inclination to settle early in life, and to marry, from worthy motives. He might not be aware of the inroads on domestic peace to be occasioned by no housekeeper's room, or a bad butler's pantry, but no doubt he did perfectly feel that Enscombe could not make him happy, and that whenever he were attached, he would willingly give up much of wealth, to be allowed an early establishment. End of chapter 6「Volume Two, Chapter Seven of Emma. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Emma by Jane Austen. Volume Two, Chapter Seven. Emma's very good opinion of Frank Churchill was a little shaken the following day by hearing that he was gone off to London merely to have his hair cut. A sudden freak seemed to have seized him at breakfast, and he had sent for a chaise and set off, intending to return to dinner, but with no more important view that appeared than having his hair cut. There was certainly no harm in his travelling sixteen miles twice over on such an errand, but there was an air of foppery and nonsense in it which he could not approve. It did not accord with the rationality of plan, the moderation in expense, or even the unselfish warmth of heart which she had believed herself to discern in him yesterday. Vanity, extravagance, love of change, restlessness of temper, which must be doing something, good or bad, heedlessness as to the pleasure of his father and Mrs. Weston, indifferent as to how his conduct might appear in general, he became liable to all these charges. His father only called him a coxcomb, and thought it a very good story, but that Mrs. Weston did not like it was clear enough, by her passing it over as quickly as possible, and making no other comment than that, all young people would have their little whims." With the exception of this little blot, Emma found that his visit hitherto had given her friend only good ideas of him. Mrs. Weston was very ready to say how attentive and pleasant a companion he made himself, how much she saw to like in his disposition altogether. He appeared to have a very open temper, certainly a very cheerful and lively one, 
She could observe nothing wrong in his notions, a great deal decidedly right. He spoke of his uncle with warm regard, was fond of talking to him, said that he would be the best man in the world if he were left to himself, and though there was no being attached to the aunt, he acknowledged her kindness with gratitude, and seemed to mean always to speak of her with respect. This was all very promising. And, but for such an unfortunate fancy for his having his hair cut, there was nothing to denote him unworthy of the distinguished honour which her imagination had given him. The honour, if not of being really in love with her, of being at least very near it, and saved only by her own indifference, for still her resolution held of never marrying. The honour, in short, of being marked out for her by all their joint acquaintance. Mr. Weston, on his side, added a virtue to the account which must have some weight. He gave her to understand that Frank admired her extremely, thought her very beautiful and very charming, and with so much to be said for him altogether, she found she must not judge him harshly. As Mrs. Western observed, "'All young people would have their little whims.' There was one person among his new acquaintance in Surrey not so leniently disposed. In general he was judged, throughout the parishes of Donwell and Highbury, with great candour. Liberal allowances were made for the little excesses of such a handsome young man, one who smiled so often, and bowed so well. But there was one spirit among them not to be softened, from its power of censure, by bows or smiles. Mr. Knightley. The circumstance was told him at Hartfield. For the moment he was silent, but Emma heard him almost immediately afterwards say to himself, over a newspaper he held in his hand, "'Hm! Just the trifling silly fellow I took him for!' She had half a mind to resent, but an instant's observation convinced her that it was really said only to relieve his own feelings, and not meant to provoke, and therefore she let it pass. Although in one instance the bearers of not good tidings, Mr. and Mrs. Weston's visit this morning was in another respect particularly opportune. Something occurred while they were at Hartfield, to make Emma want their advice, and which was still more lucky, she wanted exactly the advice they gave. This was the occurrence. The Coles had been settled some years in Highbury, and were a very good sort of people, friendly, liberal, and unpretending, but on the other hand they were of low origin, in trade, and only moderately genteel. On their first coming into the country, they had lived in proportion to their income, quietly, keeping little company, and that little unexpensively. But the last year or two had brought them a considerable increase of means, the house in town had yielded greater profits, and fortune in general had smiled on them. With their wealth, their views increased, their want of a larger house, their inclination for more company. They added to their house, to their number of servants, to their expenses of every sort, and by this time were, in fortune and style of living, second only to the family at Hartfield. Their love of society, and their new dining-room, prepared everybody for their keeping dinner company, and a few parties, chiefly among the single men, had already taken place. The regular and best families Emma could hardly suppose they would presume to invite, neither Donwell, nor Hartfield, nor Randalls. Nothing should tempt her to go, if they did, and she regretted that her father's known habits would be giving her refusal less meaning than she could wish. The Coles were very respectable in their way, but they ought to be taught that it was not for them to arrange the terms on which the superior families would visit them. This lesson, she very much feared, they would receive only from herself. She had little hope of Mr. Knightley none of Mr. Weston. But she had made up her mind how to meet this presumption so many weeks before it appeared, that when the insult came at last, it found her very differently affected. Donwell and Randalls had received their invitation, and none had come for her father and herself, and Mrs. Weston's accounting for it with, "'I suppose they will not take the liberty with you. They know you do not dine out,' was not quite sufficient. She felt that she should like to have had the power of refusal and afterwards, as the idea of the party to be assembled there, consisting precisely of those whose society was dearest to her, occurred again and again, she did not know that she might not have been tempted to accept. Harriet was to be there in the evening, and the Bateses. They had been speaking of it as they walked about Highbury the day before, and Frank Churchill most earnestly lamented her absence. Might not the evening end in a dance? had been a question of his. The bare possibility of it acted as a farther irritation on her spirits, and her being left in solitary grandeur, even supposing the omission to be intended as a compliment, was but poor comfort. It was the arrival of this very invitation while the Westons were at Hartfield, which made their presence so acceptable, for though her first remark, on reading it, was that, "'Of course it must be declined,' 
She so very soon proceeded to ask them what they advised her to do, that their advice for her going was most prompt and successful. She owned that, considering everything, she was not absolutely without inclination for the party. The coals expressed themselves so properly, there was so much real attention in the manner of it, so much consideration for her father. They would have solicited the honour earlier, but had been waiting upon the arrival of a folding screen from London, which they hoped might keep Mr. Woodhouse from any draught of air, and therefore induce him the more readily to give them the honour of his company. Upon the whole she was very persuadable, and it being briefly settled among themselves how it might be done without neglecting his comfort, how certainly Mrs. Goddard, if not Mrs. Bates, might be depended on for bearing him company, Mr. Woodhouse was to be talked into an acquiescence of his daughter's going out to dinner, on a day now near at hand, and spending the whole evening away from him. As for his going, Emma did not wish him to think it possible. The hours would be too late, and the party too numerous. He was soon pretty well resigned. "'I am not fond of dinner-visiting,' said he. "'I never was. No more is Emma. Late hours do not agree with us. I am sorry Mr. and Mrs. Cole should have done it. I think it would be much better if they would come in one afternoon next summer, and take their tea with us, take us in their afternoon walk, which they might do, as our hours are so reasonable, and yet get home without being out in the damp of the evening. The dews of a summer evening are what I would not expose anybody to. However, as they are so very desirous to have dear Emma dine with them, and as you will both be there, and Mr. Knightley too, to take care of her, I cannot wish to prevent it, provided the weather be what it ought, neither damp, nor cold, nor windy." Then, turning to Mrs. Weston, with a look of gentle reproach, "'Ah, Miss Taylor, if you had not married, you would have stayed at home with me.' "'Well, sir,' cried Mr. Weston, "'as I took Miss Taylor away, it is incumbent on me to supply her place if I can, and I will step to Mrs. Goddard's in a moment, if you wish it.' But the idea of anything to be done in a moment was increasing, not lessening, Mr. Woodhouse's agitation. The ladies knew better how to allay it. Mr. Weston must be quiet, and everything deliberately arranged. With this treatment Mr. Woodhouse was soon composed enough for talking as usual. He should be happy to see Mrs. Goddard. He had a great regard for Mrs. Goddard, and Emma should write a line and invite her. James could take the note. But first of all there must be an answer written to Mrs. Cole. You will make excuses, my dear, as civilly as possible. You will say that I am quite an invalid, and go nowhere, and therefore must decline their obliging invitation, beginning with my compliments, of course. But you will do everything right. I need not tell you what is to be done. We must remember to let James know that the carriage will be wanted on Tuesday. I shall have no fears for you with him. We have never been there above once since the new approach was made, but still I have no doubt that James will take you very safely. And when you get there, you must tell him at what time you would have him come for you again, and you had better name an early hour. You will not like staying late. You will get very tired when tea is over." "'But you would not wish me to come away before I am tired, papa." "'Oh, no, my love, but you will soon be tired. There will be a great many people talking at once. You will not like the noise.' "'But, my dear sir,' cried Mr. Weston, "'if Emma comes away too early, it will be breaking up the party.' "'And no great harm if it does,' said Mr. Woodhouse. "'The sooner every party breaks up, the better.' "'But you do not consider how it may appear to the coals. Emma's going away directly after tea might be giving offence. They are good-natured people, and think little of their own claims, but still they must feel that anybody's hurrying away is no great compliment, and Miss Woodhouse's doing it would be more thought of than any other person's in the room. You would not wish to disappoint and mortify the coals, I am sure, sir, friendly, good sort of people as ever lived, and who have been your neighbours these ten years." "'Oh, no, upon no account in the world, Mr. Weston. I am much obliged to you for reminding me. I should be extremely sorry to be giving them any pain. I know what worthy people they are. Perry tells me that Mr. Cole never touches malt liquor. You would not think it to look at him. But he is bilious. Mr. Cole is very bilious. No, I would not be the means of giving them any pain. My dear Emma, we must consider this. I am sure, rather than run the risk of hurting Mr. and Mrs. Cole, you would stay a little longer than you might wish. You will not regard being tired. You will be perfectly safe, you know, among your friends." "'Oh, yes, papa! I have no fears at all for myself, and I should have no scruples of staying as late as Mrs. Weston. But on your account, 
I am only afraid of your sitting up for me. I am not afraid of your being extremely comfortable with Mrs. Goddard. She loves piquet, you know. But when she has gone home, I am afraid you'll be sitting up by yourself, instead of going to bed at your usual time, and the idea of that would entirely destroy my comfort. You must promise me not to sit up." He did, on the condition of some promises on her side, such as that, if she came home cold, she would be sure to warm herself thoroughly, if hungry, that she would take something to eat, that her own maid should sit up for her, and that Searle and the butler should see that everything were safe in the house, as usual. End of chapter 7 Volume 2, Chapter 8 of Emma This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett Emma by Jane Austen Volume 2, Chapter 8 Frank Churchill came back again, and if he kept his father's dinner waiting, it was not known at Hartfield, for Mrs. Weston was too anxious for his being a favourite with Mr. Woodhouse to betray any imperfection which could be concealed. He came back, had had his hair cut, and laughed at himself with a very good grace, but without seeming really at all ashamed of what he had done. He had no reason to wish his hair longer, to conceal any confusion of face, no reason to wish the money unspent to improve his spirits. He was quite as undaunted and as lively as ever, and after seeing him, Emma thus moralised to herself. I do not know whether it ought to be so, but certainly silly things do cease to be silly if they are done by sensible people in an impudent way. Wickedness is always wickedness, but folly is not always folly. It depends upon the character of those who handle it. Mr. Knightley, he is not a trifling silly young man. If he were, he would have done this differently. He would either have gloried in the achievement, or been ashamed of it. There would have been either the ostentation of a coxcomb, or the evasions of a mind too weak to defend its own vanities. No, I am perfectly sure he is not trifling or silly. With Tuesday came the agreeable prospect of seeing him again, and for a longer time than hitherto of judging of his general manners, and by inference of the meaning of his manners towards herself, of guessing how soon it might be necessary for her to throw coldness into her air, and of fancying what the observations of all those might be, who were now seeing them together for the first time. She meant to be very happy, in spite of the scene being laid at Mr. Cole's, and without being able to forget that among the failings of Mr. Elton, even in the days of his favour, none had disturbed her more than his propensity to dine with Mr. Cole. Her father's comfort was amply secured, Mrs. Bates as well as Mrs. Goddard being able to come, and her last pleasing duty before she left the house was to pay her respects to them as they sat together after dinner, and while her father was fondly noticing the beauty of her dress, to make the two ladies all the amends in her power by helping them to large slices of cake and full glasses of wine. For whatever unwilling self-denial his care of their constitution might have obliged them to practice during the meal. She had provided a plentiful dinner for them. She wished she could know that they had been allowed to eat it. She followed another carriage to Mr. Cole's door, and was pleased to see that it was Mr. Knightley's, for Mr. Knightley, keeping no horses, having little spare money and a great deal of health, activity, and independence, was too apt, in Emma's opinion, to get about as he could, and not use his carriage so often as became the owner of Donwell Abbey. She had an opportunity now of speaking her approbation while warm from her heart, for he stopped to hand her out. "'This is coming as you should do,' said she. "'Like a gentleman. I am quite glad to see you.' He thanked her, observing, "'How lucky that we should arrive at the same moment! For if we had met first in the drawing-room, I doubt whether you would have discerned me to be more of a gentleman than usual. You might not have distinguished how I came, by my look or manner.' Yes, I should. I am sure I should. There is always a look of consciousness or bustle when people come in a way which they know to be beneath them. You think you carry it off very well, I dare say, but with you it is a sort of bravado, an air of affected unconcern. I always observe it whenever I meet you under those circumstances. Now you have nothing to try for. You are not at all afraid of being supposed ashamed. You are not striving to look taller than anybody else. Now I shall really be very happy to walk into the same room with you." "'Nonsensical girl!'
was his reply, but not at all in anger. Emma had as much reason to be satisfied with the rest of the party as with Mr. Knightley. She was received with a cordial respect which could not but please, and given all the consequence she could wish for. When the Westons arrived, the kindest looks of love, the strongest of admiration, were for her, from both husband and wife. The son approached her with a cheerful eagerness which marked her as his peculiar object, and at dinner she found him seated by her, and as she firmly believed, not without some dexterity on his side. The party was rather large, as it included one other family, a proper unobjectionable country family, whom the Coles had the advantage of naming among their acquaintance, and the male part of Mr. Cox's family, the lawyer of Highbury. The less worthy females were to come in the evening, with Miss Bates, Miss Fairfax, and Miss Smith, but already at dinner they were too numerous for any subject of conversation to be general, and while politics and Mr. Elton were talked over, Emma could fairly surrender all her attention to the pleasantness of her neighbour. The first remote sound to which she felt herself obliged to attend was the name of Jane Fairfax. Mrs. Cole seemed to be relating something of her that was expected to be very interesting. She listened and found it well worth listening to. That very dear part of Emma, her fancy, received an amusing supply. Mrs. Cole was telling that she had been calling on Miss Bates, and as soon as she entered the room had been struck by the sight of a pianoforte, a very elegant-looking instrument, not a grand, but a large-sized square pianoforte, and the substance of the story, the end of all the dialogue which ensured of surprise and inquiry, and congratulations on her side, and explanation on Miss Bates's, was that this pianoforte had arrived from Broadwoods the day before, to the great astonishment of both aunt and niece, entirely unexpected, that at first, by Miss Bates's account, Jane herself was quite at a loss, quite bewildered to think who could possibly have ordered it, but now they were both perfectly satisfied that it could be from only one quarter. Of course, it must be from Colonel Campbell. "'One can suppose nothing else,' added Mrs. Cole, "'and I was only surprised that there could ever have been a doubt. But Jane, it seems, had a letter from them very lately, and not a word was said about it. She knows their ways best, but I should not consider their silence as any reason for their not meaning to make the present. They might choose to surprise her." Mrs. Cole had many to agree with her. Everybody who spoke on the subject was equally convinced that it must come from Colonel Campbell, and equally rejoiced that such a present had been made, and there were enough ready to speak to allow Emma to think her own way, and still listen to Mrs. Cole. I declare I do not know when I have heard anything that has given me more satisfaction. It has always hurt me that Jane Fairfax, who plays so delightfully, should not have an instrument. It seemed quite a shame, especially considering how many houses there are where fine instruments are absolutely thrown away. This is like giving ourselves a slap, to be sure. And it was but yesterday I was telling Mr. Cole, I really was ashamed to look at our new grand pianoforte in the drawing-room, while well, I do not know one note from another and our little girls, who are but just beginning, perhaps may never make anything of it. And there is poor Jane Fairfax, who is mistress of music, has not anything of the nature of an instrument, not even the pitifulest old spinet in the world to amuse herself with. I was saying this to Mr. Cole but yesterday, and he quite agreed with me, only he is so particularly fond of music that he could not help indulging himself in the purchase, hoping that some of our good neighbours might be so obliging occasionally to put it to better use than we can, and that really is the reason why the instrument was bought, or else I am sure we ought to be ashamed of it. We are in great hopes that Miss Woodhouse may be prevailed with to try it this evening." Miss Woodhouse made the proper acquiescence, and finding that nothing more was to be entrapped from any communication of Mrs. Cole's, turned to Frank Churchill. "'Why do you smile?' said she. "'Nay, why do you?' "'Me! I suppose I smile for pleasure at Colonel Campbell's being so rich and so liberal. It is a handsome present.' "'Very.' "'I rather wonder that it was never made before.' Perhaps Miss Fairfax has never been staying here so long before. Or oh, that he did not give her the use of their own instrument, which must now be shut up in London, untouched by anybody. That is a grand pianoforte, and he might think it too large for Mrs. Bates's house. You may say what you choose, but your countenance testifies that your thoughts on this subject are very much like mine. 
I do not know. I rather believe you are giving me more credit for acuteness than I deserve. I smile because you smile, and shall probably suspect whatever I find you suspect. But at present I do not see what there is to question. If Colonel Campbell is not the person, who can be? What do you say to Mrs. Dixon? Mrs. Dixon? Very true indeed. I had not thought of Mrs. Dixon. She must know, as well as her father, how acceptable an instrument would be. And perhaps the mode of it, the mystery, the surprise, is more like a young woman's scheme than an elderly man's. It is, Mrs. Dixon, I dare say. I told you that your suspicions would guide mine. If so, you must extend your suspicions, and comprehend Mr. Dixon in them. Mr. Dixon? Very well. Yes, I immediately perceive that it must be the joint present of Mr. and Mrs. Dixon. We were speaking the other day, you know, of his being so warm an admirer of her performance." Yes, and what you told me on that head confirmed an idea which I had entertained before. I do not mean to reflect upon the good intentions of either Mr. Dixon or Miss Fairfax, but I cannot help suspecting either that, after making his proposals to her friend, he had the misfortune to fall in love with her, or that he became conscious of a little attachment on her side. One might guess twenty things without guessing exactly the right, but I am sure there must be a particular cause for her choosing to come to Highbury instead of going with the Campbells to Ireland. Here she must be leading a life of privation and penance, there it would have been all enjoyment. As to the pretence of trying her native air, I look upon that as a mere excuse. In the summer it might have passed, but what can anybody's native air do for them in the months of January, February, and March? Good fires and carriages would be much more to the purpose in most cases of delicate health, and I dare say in hers. I do not require you to adopt all my suspicions, though you make so noble a profession of doing it, but I honestly tell you what they are. And upon my word, they have an air of great probability. Mr. Dixon's preference of her music to her friends, I can answer for being very decided. And then he saved her life. Did you ever hear of that? a water-party, and by some accident she was falling overboard. He caught her." "'He did. I was there, one of the party.' "'Were you really? Well! But you observed nothing, of course, for it seems to be a new idea to you. If I had been there, I think I should have rather made some discoveries.' "'I dare say you would. But I, simple I, saw nothing but the fact that Miss Fairfax was very nearly dashed from the vessel, and that Mr. Dixon caught her. It was the work of a moment. And though the consequent shock and alarm was very great and much more durable—indeed, I believe it was half an hour before any of us were comfortable again—yet that was too general a sensation for anything of peculiar anxiety to be observable. I do not mean to say, however, that you might not have made discoveries." The conversation was here interrupted. They were called on to share in the awkwardness of a rather long interval between the courses, and obliged to be as formal and as orderly as the others. But when the table was again safely covered, when every corner dish was placed exactly right, and occupation and ease were generally restored, Emma said, "'The arrival of this pianoforte is decisive with me. I wanted to know a little more, and this tells me quite enough. Depend upon it, we shall soon hear that it is a present from Mr. and Mrs. Dixon.' And if the Dixon should absolutely deny all knowledge of it, we must conclude it to come from the Campbells. No, I am sure it is not from the Campbells. Miss Fairfax knows it is not from the Campbells, or they would have been a guest at first. She would not have been puzzled had she dared fix on them. I may not have convinced you, perhaps, but I am perfectly convinced myself that Mr. Dixon is a principal in the business. Indeed, you injure me if you suppose me unconvinced. Your reasonings carry my judgment along with them entirely. At first, while I supposed you satisfied that Colonel Campbell was the giver, I saw it only as paternal kindness, and thought it the most natural thing in the world. But when you mentioned Mrs. Dixon, I felt how much more probable that it should be the tribute of warm female friendship, and now I can see it in no other light than as an offering of love." There was no occasion to press the matter farther. The conviction seemed real. He looked as if he felt it. She said no more. Other subjects took their turn, and the rest of the dinner passed away, the dessert succeeded, the children came in, and were talked to and admired amid the usual rate of conversation, a few clever things said, a few downright silly, 
but by much the larger proportion neither the one nor the other. Nothing worse than everyday remarks, dull repetitions, old news, and heavy jokes. The ladies had not been long in the drawing-room before the other ladies, in their different divisions, arrived. Emma watched the entree of her own particular little friend, and if she could not exult in her dignity and grace, she could not only love the blooming sweetness and the artless manner, but could most heartily rejoice in that light, cheerful, unsentimental disposition which allowed her so many alleviations of pleasure in the midst of the pangs of disappointed affection. There she sat, and who would have guessed how many tears she had lately been shedding? To be in company, nicely dressed herself, and seeing others nicely dressed, to sit and smile and look pretty and say nothing, was enough for the happiness of the present hour. Jane Fairfax did look and move superior, but Emma suspected she might have been glad to change feelings with Harriet, very glad to have purchased the mortification of having loved, yes, of having loved even Mr. Elton in vain, by the surrender of all the dangerous pleasure of knowing herself beloved by the husband of her friend. In so large a party it was not necessary that Emma should approach her. She did not wish to speak of the pianoforte, she felt too much in the secret herself, to think the appearance of curiosity or interest fair, and therefore purposely kept at a distance. But by the others the subject was almost immediately introduced, and she saw the blush of consciousness with which congratulations were received, the blush of guilt which accompanied the name of "'My excellent friend, Colonel Campbell.' Mrs. Weston, kind-hearted and musical, was particularly interested by the circumstance, and Emma could not help being amused at her perseverance in dwelling on the subject, and having so much to ask and to say as to tone, touch, and pedal, wholly unsuspicious of that wish of saying as little about it as possible, which she plainly read in the fair heroine's countenance. They were soon joined by some of the gentlemen, and the very first of the early was Frank Churchill. In he walked, the first and the handsomest, and after paying his compliments en passant to Miss Bates and her niece, made his way directly to the opposite side of the circle, where sat Miss Woodhouse, and till he could find a seat by her, would not sit at all. Emma divined what everybody present must be thinking. She was his object, and everybody must perceive it. She introduced him to her friend Miss Smith, and at convenient moments afterwards, heard what each thought of the other. He had never seen so lovely a face, and was delighted with her naïveté. And she, only to be sure it was paying him too great a compliment, but she did think there were some looks a little like Mr. Elton. Emma restrained her indignation, and only turned from her in silence. Smiles of intelligence passed between her and the gentleman, on first glancing towards Miss Fairfax, but it was most prudent to avoid speech. He told her that he had been impatient to leave the dining-room, hated sitting long, was always the first to move when he could, that his father, Mr. Knightley, Mr. Cox, and Mr. Cole, were left very busy over parish business, that as long as he had stayed, however, it had been pleasant enough, as he had found them in general a set of gentlemanlike, sensible men, and spoke so handsomely of Highbury altogether, thought it so abundant and agreeable families, that Emma began to feel she had been used to despise the place rather too much. She questioned him as to the society in Yorkshire, the extent of the neighbourhood about Enscombe and the sort, and could make out from his answers that as far as Enscombe was concerned there was very little going on, that their visitings were among a range of great families, none very near, and that even when days were fixed, and invitations accepted, it was an even chance that Mrs. Churchill was not in health and spirits for going, that they made a point of visiting no fresh person and that, though he had his separate engagements, it was not without difficulty, without considerable address at times, that he could get away, or introduce an acquaintance for a night. She saw that Enscombe could not satisfy, and that Highbury, taken at its best, might reasonably please a young man who had more retirement at home than he liked. His importance at Enscombe was very evident. He did not boast, but it naturally betrayed itself, that he had persuaded his aunt where his uncle could do nothing, and on her laughing and noticing it, he owned that he believed, excepting one or two points, he could with time persuade her to anything. One of those points on which his influence failed, he then mentioned. He had wanted very much to go abroad, had been very eager indeed to be allowed to travel, but she would not hear of it. This had happened the year before. Now, he said, he was beginning to have no longer the same wish. The unpersuadable point, which he did not mention, Emma guessed to be good behaviour to his father. "'I have made a most wretched discovery,' 
said he, after a short pause, I have been here a week to-morrow, half my time. I never knew days fly so fast. A week to-morrow! And I have hardly begun to enjoy myself, but just got acquainted with Mrs. Weston and others. I hate the recollection. Perhaps you may now begin to regret that you spent one whole day out of so few in having your hair cut." No said he, smiling. That is no subject of regret at all. I have no pleasure in seeing my friends, unless I can believe myself fit to be seen." The rest of the gentlemen being now in the room, Emma found herself obliged to turn from him for a few minutes, and listen to Mr. Cole. When Mr. Cole had turned away, and her attention could be restored as before, she saw Frank Churchill looking intently across the room at Miss Fairfax, who was sitting exactly opposite. "'What is the matter?' said she. He started. "'Thank you for rousing me,' he replied. "'I believe I have been very rude. But really Miss Fairfax has done her hair in so odd a way, so very odd a way, that I cannot keep my eyes from her. I never saw anything so outré. Those curls! This must be a fancy of her own. I see nobody else looking like her. I must go and ask her whether it is an Irish fashion. Shall I?' Yes, I will. I declare I will, and you shall see how she takes it, whether she colours." He was gone immediately, and Emma soon saw him standing before Miss Fairfax and talking to her. But as to its effect on the young lady, as he had improvidently placed himself exactly between them, exactly in front of Miss Fairfax, she could absolutely distinguish nothing. Before he could return to his chair, it was taken by Mrs. Weston. This is the luxury of a large party," said she. One can get near everybody, and say everything. My dear Emma, I am longing to talk to you. I have been making discoveries and forming plans, just like yourself, and I must tell them while the idea is fresh. Do you know how Miss Bates and her niece came here?" How? They were invited, were not they? Oh, yes, but how they were conveyed hither, the manner of their coming. They walked, I conclude. How else could they come?" Very true. Well, a little while ago it occurred to me how very sad it would be to have Jane Fairfax walking home again late at night, and cold as the nights are now. And as I looked at her, though I never saw her appear to more advantage, it struck me that she was heated, and would therefore be particularly liable to take cold. Poor girl! I could not bear the idea of it. So as soon as Mr. Weston came into the room, and I could get at him, I spoke to him about the carriage. You may guess how readily he came into my wishes, and having his approbation I made my way directly to Miss Bates, to assure her that the carriage would be at her service before it took us home, for I thought it would be making her comfortable at once. Good soul! She was as grateful as possible, you may be sure. Nobody was ever so fortunate as herself, but with many, many thanks. There was no occasion to trouble us, for Mr. Knightley's carriage had brought, and was to take them home again. I was very surprised, very glad, I am sure, but really quite surprised. Such a very kind attention, and so thoughtful an attention, the sort of thing that so few men would think of, and in short, from knowing his usual ways, I am very much inclined to think that it was for their accommodation the carriage was used at all. I do suspect he would not have had a pair of horses for himself, and that it was only an excuse for assisting them." "'Very likely,' said Emma. "'Nothing more likely. I know no man more likely than Mr. Knightley to do the sort of thing, to do anything really good-natured, useful, considerate, or benevolent. He is not a gallant man, but he is a very humane one. And this, considering Jane Fairfax's ill health, would appear a case of humanity to him. And for an act of unostentatious kindness, there is nobody whom I would fix on more than Mr. Knightley. I know he had horses to-day, for we arrived together, and I laughed at him about it, but he said not a word that could betray." "'Well,' said Mrs. Weston, smiling, "'you give him credit for more simple disinterested benevolence in this instance than I do. For while Miss Bates was speaking, a suspicion darted into my head, and I have never been able to get it out again. The more I think of it, the more probable it appears. In short, I have made a match between Mr. Knightley and Jane Fairfax. See the consequence of keeping you company. What do you say to it?" "'Mr. Knightley and Jane Fairfax!' exclaimed Emma. "'Dear Mrs. Weston, how could you think of such a thing? Mr. Knightley! 
Mr. Knightley must not marry. You would not have little Henry cut out from Donwell. Oh, no, no, Henry must have Donwell. I cannot at all consent to Mr. Knightley's marrying, and I am sure it is not at all likely. I am amazed that you should think of such a thing." "'My dear Emma, I have told you what led me to think of it. I do not want the match. I do not want to injure little Henry. But the idea has been given me by circumstances, and if Mr. Knightley really wished to marry, you would not have him refrain on Henry's account, a boy of six years old who knows nothing of the matter." "'Yes, I would. I could not bear to have Henry supplanted. Mr. Knightley marry. No, I have never had such an idea, and I cannot adopt it now. And Jane Fairfax, too, of all women." "'Nay, she has always been a first favourite with him, as you very well know." "'But the imprudence of such a match—' "'I am not speaking of its prudence, merely its probability.' "'I see no probability in it, unless you have any better foundation than what you mention. His good nature, his humanity, as I tell you, would be quite enough to account for the horses. He has a great regard for the Bates, as you know, independent of Jane Fairfax, and is always glad to show them attention. My dear Mrs. Weston, do not take to match-making. You do it very ill. Jane Fairfax, mistress of the Abbey! Oh, no, no! Every feeling revolts! For his own sake I would not have him do so mad a thing." imprudent, if you please, but not mad. Excepting inequality of fortune, and perhaps a little disparity of age, I can see nothing unsuitable." "'But Mr. Knightley does not want to marry. I am sure he has not the least idea of it. Do not put it into his head. Why should he marry? He is as happy as possible by himself, with his farm, and his sheep, and his library, and all the parish to manage, and he is extremely fond of his brother's children. He has no occasion to marry, either to fill up his time or his heart." "'My dear Emma, as long as he thinks so, it is so. But if he really loves Jane Fairfax—" "'Nonsense! He does not care about Jane Fairfax. In the way of love, I am sure he does not. He would do any good to her or her family, but—well,' said Mrs. Weston, laughing, "'perhaps the greatest good he could do them would be to give Jane such a respectable home." If it would be good to her, I am sure it would be evil to himself. A very shameful and degrading connection. How would he bear to have Miss Bates belonging to him? To have her haunting the Abbey, and thanking him all day long for his great kindness in marrying Jane! So very kind and obliging! But he has always been such a very kind neighbour! And then fly off through half a sentence to her mother's old petticoat! Not that it was such very old petticoat, either, for still it would last a great while, and indeed she must say thankfully that their petticoats were all very strong. For shame, Emma! Do not mimic her. You divert me against my conscience, and upon my word I do not think Mr. Knightley would be much disturbed by Miss Bates. Little things do not irritate him. She might talk on, and if he wanted to say anything himself, he would only talk louder and drown her voice. But the question is not whether it would be a bad connection for him, but whether he wishes it, and I think he does. I have heard him speak, and so must you, so very highly of Jane Fairfax. The interest he's taken in her, his anxiety about her health, his concern that she should have no happier prospect. I have heard him express himself so warmly on those points. Such an admirer of her performance on the pianoforte, and of her voice. I have heard him say that he could listen to her for ever. Oh! and I had almost forgotten one idea that occurred to me. This pianoforte that has been sent here by somebody, though we have all been so well satisfied to consider it a present from the Campbells, may it not be from Mr. Knightley? I cannot help suspecting him. I think he is just the person to do it, even without being in love." "'Then it could be no argument to prove that he is in love. But I do not think it is at all a likely thing for him to do. Mr. Knightley does nothing mysteriously." I have heard him lamenting her having no instrument repeatedly, oftener than I should suppose such a circumstance would, in the common course of things, occur to him. Very well, and if he had intended to give her one, he would have told her so. There might be scruples of delicacy, my dear Emma. I have a very strong notion that it comes from him. I am sure he was particularly silent when Mrs. Cole told us of it at dinner." 
You take up an idea, Mrs. Weston, and run away with it, as you have many a time reproached me with doing. I see no sign of attachment. I believe nothing of the pianoforte, and proof shall only convince me that Mr. Knightley has any thought of marrying Jane Fairfax." They combated the point some time longer in the same way, Emma rather gaining ground over the mind of her friend, for Mrs. Weston was the most used of the two to yield, till a little bustle in the room showed them that tea was over, and the instrument in preparation, and at the same moment Mr. Cole approaching to entreat Miss Woodhouse would do them the honour of trying it. Frank Churchill, of whom, in the eagerness of her conversation with Mrs. Weston, she had been seeing nothing, except that he had found a seat by Miss Fairfax, followed Mr. Cole to add his very pressing entreaties, and as, in every respect, it suited Emma best to lead, she gave a very proper compliance. She knew the limitations of her own powers too well to attempt more than she could perform with credit. She wanted neither taste nor spirit in the little things which are generally acceptable, and could accompany her own voice well. One accompaniment to her song took her agreeably by surprise, a second, slightly but correctly taken by Frank Churchill. Her pardon was duly begged at the close of the song, and everything usual followed. He was accused of having a delightful voice, and a perfect knowledge of music, which was properly denied, and that he knew nothing of the matter, and had no voice at all, roundly asserted. They sang together once more, and Emma would then resign her place to Miss Fairfax, whose performance, both vocal and instrumental, she never could attempt to conceal from herself, was infinitely superior to her own. With mixed feelings she seated herself at a little distance from the numbers round the instrument, to listen. Frank Churchill sang again. They had sung together once or twice, it appeared, at Weymouth. But the sight of Mr. Knightley among the most attentive soon drew away half Emma's mind, and she fell into a train of thinking on the subject of Mrs. Weston's suspicions, to which the sweet sounds of the united voices gave only momentary interruptions. Her objections to Mr. Knightley's marrying did not in the least subside. She could see nothing but evil in it. It would be a great disappointment to Mr. John Knightley, consequently to Isabella, a real injury to the children, a most mortifying change, and material loss to them all a very great deduction from her father's daily comfort, and as to herself she could not at all endure the idea of Jane Fairfax at Donwell Abbey, a Mrs. Knightley for them all to give way to. No, Mr. Knightley must never marry. Little Henry must remain the heir of Donwell. Presently Mr. Knightley looked back and came and sat down by her. They talked at first only of the performance. His admiration certainly was very warm, yet she thought but for Mrs. Weston it would not have struck her. As a sort of touchstone, however, she began to speak of his kindness in conveying the aunt and niece, and though his answer was in the spirit of cutting the matter short, she believed it to indicate only his disinclination to dwell on any kindness of his own. "'I often feel concern,' said she, "'that I dare not make our carriage more useful on such occasions. It is not that I am without the wish, but you know how impossible my father would deem it that James should put to for such a purpose. "'Quite out of the question, quite out of the question,' he replied. "'But you must often wish it, I am sure.' And he smiled with such seeming pleasure at the conviction, that she must proceed another step. "'This present from the Campbells,' said she, "'this pianoforte is very kindly given.' "'Yes,' he replied, and without the smallest apparent embarrassment. "'But they would have done better had they given her notice of it. Surprises are foolish things. The pleasure is not enhanced, and the inconvenience is often inconsiderable. I should have expected better judgment in Colonel Campbell." From that moment Emma could have taken her oath that Mr. Knightley had had no concern in giving the instrument. But whether he were entirely free from peculiar attachment, whether there were no actual preference, remained a little longer doubtful. Toward the end of Jane's second song, her voice grew thick. "'That will do,' said he, when it was finished, thinking aloud. You have sung quite enough for one evening. Now be quiet." Another song, however, was soon begged for. One more they would not fatigue Miss Fairfax on any account, and would only ask for one more. And Frank Churchill was heard to say, "'I think you could manage this without effort. The first part is so very trifling. The strength of the song falls on the second. Mr. Knightley grew angry. "'That fellow,' said he, indignantly, "'thinks of nothing but showing off his own voice. This must not be." And touching Miss Bates, who at that moment passed near, "'Miss Bates, are you mad to let your niece sing herself hoarse in this manner? Go and interfere. They have no mercy on her.' 
Miss Bates, in her real anxiety for Jane, could hardly stay even to be grateful, before she stepped forward and put an end to all farther singing. Here ceased the concert part of the evening, for Miss Woodhouse and Miss Fairfax were the only young lady performers. But soon, within five minutes, the proposal of dancing, originating nobody knew exactly where, was so effectually promoted by Mr. and Mrs. Cole, that everything was rapidly clearing away to give proper space. Mrs. Weston, capital in her country dances, was seated, and beginning an irresistible waltz, and Frank Churchill, coming up with most becoming gallantry to Emma, had secured her hand and led her to the top. While waiting till the other young people could pair themselves off, Emma found time, in spite of the compliments she was receiving on her voice and her taste, to look about, and see what became of Mr. Knightley. This would be a trial. He was no dancer in general. If he were to be very alert in engaging Jane Fairfax now, it might augur something. There was no immediate appearance. No. He was talking to Mrs. Cole. He was looking on unconcerned. Jane was asked by somebody else, and he was still talking to Mrs. Cole. Emma had no longer an alarm for Henry, his interest was yet safe, and she led off the dance with genuine spirit and enjoyment. Not more than five couple could be mustered, but the rarity and the suddenness of it made it very delightful, and she found herself well matched in a partner. They were a couple worth looking at. Two dances, unfortunately, were all that could be allowed. It was growing late, and Miss Bates became anxious to get home on her mother's account. After some attempts, therefore, to be permitted to begin again, they were obliged to thank Mrs. Weston, look sorrowful, and have done. "'Perhaps it is as well,' said Frank Churchill, as he attended Emma to her carriage. "'I must have asked Miss Fairfax, and her languid dancing would not have agreed with me after yours.'" End of chapter 8 Volume Two, Chapter Nine of Emma. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Emma by Jane Austen. Volume Two, Chapter Nine. Emma did not repent her condescension in going to the Coles. The visit afforded her many pleasant recollections the next day, and all that she might be supposed to have lost on the side of dignified seclusion must be amply repaid in the splendor of popularity. She must have delighted the Coles, worthy people who deserved to be made happy, and left a name behind her that would not soon die away. Perfect happiness, even in memory, is not common, and there were two points on which she was not quite easy. She doubted whether she had not transgressed the duty of woman by woman, in betraying her suspicions of Jane Fairfax's feelings to Frank Churchill. It was hardly right but it had been so strong an idea, that it would escape her, and his submission to all that she told was a compliment to her penetration, which made it difficult for her to be quite certain that she ought to have held her tongue. The other circumstance of regret related also to Jane Fairfax, and there she had no doubt. She did unfeignedly and unequivocally regret the inferiority of her own playing and singing. She did most heartily grieve over the idleness of her childhood, and sat down and practised vigorously an hour and a half. She was then interrupted by Harriet's coming in, and if Harriet's praise could have satisfied her, she might soon have been comforted. "'Oh! if I could but play as well as you and Miss Fairfax!' "'Don't class us together, Harriet. My playing is no more like hers than a lamp is like sunshine.' "'Oh, dear! I think you play the best of the two. I think you play quite as well as she does. I am sure I would much rather hear you. Everybody last night said how well you played." Those who knew anything about it must have felt the difference. The truth is, Harriet, that my playing is just good enough to be praised, but Jane Fairfax's is much beyond it. "'Well, I shall always think that you play quite as well as she does, or that if there is any difference nobody would ever find it out. Mr. Cole said how much taste you had, and Mr. Frank Churchill talked a great deal about your taste, and that he valued taste much more than execution." "'Ah! But Jane Fairfax has them both, Harriet." "'Are you sure? I saw she had execution, but I did not know she had any taste. Nobody talked about it. And I hate Italian singing. There is no understanding a word of it. Besides, if she does play so very well, you know it is no more than she is obliged to do, because she will have to teach. The Coxes were wondering last night whether she would get into any great family. How did you think the Coxes looked?" "'Just as they always do. Very vulgar." "'They told me something,' 
said Harriet, rather hesitatingly, "'but it is nothing of any consequence.' Emma was obliged to ask what they had told her, though fearful of its producing Mr. Elton. "'They told me—that Mr. Martin dined with them last Saturday.' "'Oh?' "'He came to their father upon some business, and he asked him to stay to dinner.' "'Oh!' "'They talked a great deal about him, especially Anne Cox. I do not know what she meant, but she asked me if I thought I should go and stay there again next summer." She meant to be impertinently curious, just as such an Anne Cox should be. She said he was very agreeable the day he dined there. He sat by her at dinner. Miss Nash thinks either of the Coxes would be very glad to marry him. Very likely. I think they are, without exception, the most vulgar girls in Highbury." Harriet had business at Ford's. Emma thought it most prudent to go with her. Another accidental meeting with the Martins was possible, and in her present state would be dangerous. Harriet, tempted by everything and swayed by half a word, was always very long at a purchase, and while she was still hanging over muslins and changing her mind, Emma went to the door for amusement. Much could not be hoped from the traffic of even the busiest part of Highbury. Mr. Perry walking hastily by, Mr. William Cox letting himself in at the office door, Mr. Cole's carriage-horses returning from exercise, or a stray letter-boy on an obstinate mule, were the liveliest objects she could presume to expect. And when her eyes fell only on the butcher with his tray, a tidy old woman travelling homewards from shop with her full basket, two curs quarrelling over a dirty bone, and a string of dawdling children round the baker's little bow window eyeing the gingerbread, she knew she had no reason to complain, and was amused enough, quite enough still to stand at the door. A mind lively and at ease can do with seeing nothing, and can see nothing that does not answer. She looked down the Randalls road. The scene enlarged. Two persons appeared. Mrs. Weston and her son-in-law. They were walking into Highbury. To Hartfield, of course. They were stopping, however, in the first place at Mrs. Bates's, whose house was a little nearer Randall's than Ford's, and had all but knocked when Emma caught their eye. Immediately they crossed the road and came forward to her, and the agreeableness of yesterday's engagement seemed to give fresh pleasure to the present meeting. Mrs. Weston informed her that she was going to call on the Bateses, in order to hear the new instrument. "'For my companion tells me,' said she, "'that I absolutely promised Miss Bates last night that I would come this morning. I was not aware of it myself. I did not know that I had fixed a day. But as he says I did, I am going now.' "'And while Mrs. Weston pays her visit, I may be allowed, I hope,' said Frank Churchill, "'to join your party and wait for her at Hartfield, if you are going home.' Mrs. Weston was disappointed. "'I thought you meant to go with me. They would be very much pleased." "'Me? I should be quite in the way. But perhaps I may be equally in the way here. Miss Woodhouse looks as if she did not want me. My aunt always sends me off when she is shopping. She says I fidget her to death. And Miss Woodhouse looks as if she could almost say the same. What am I to do?' "'I am here on no business of my own,' said Emma. "'I am only waiting for my friend. She will probably have soon done, and then we shall go home. But you had better go with Mrs. Weston and hear the instrument." "'Well, if you advise it. But,' with a smile, "'if Colonel Campbell should have employed a careless friend, and if it should prove to have an indifferent tone, what shall I say? I shall be no support to Mrs. Weston. She might do very well by herself. A disagreeable truth would be palatable through her lips, but I am the wretchedest being in the world at a civil falsehood." "'I do not believe any such thing replied Emma. I am persuaded that you can be as insincere as your neighbours when it is necessary, but there is no reason to suppose the instrument is indifferent. Quite otherwise, indeed, if I understood Miss Fairfax's opinion last night." "'Do come with me,' said Mrs. Weston. If it be not very disagreeable to you, it need not detain us long. We will go to Hartfield afterwards. We will follow them to Hartfield. I really wish you to call with me. It will be felt so great an attention and I always thought you meant it." He could say no more, and with the hope of Hartfield to reward him, returned with Mrs. Weston to Mrs. Bates's door. Emma watched them in, and then joined Harriet at the interesting counter, trying with all the force of her own mind to convince her that if she wanted plain muslin it was of no use to look at figured, and that a blue ribbon, be it ever so beautiful, would still never match her yellow pattern. 
At last it was all settled, even to the destination of the parcel. "'Should I send it to Mrs. Goddard's, ma'am?' asked Mrs. Ford. "'Yes. No. Yes, to Mrs. Goddard's. Only my pattern gown is at Hartfield. No, you shall send it to Hartfield, if you please. But then Mrs. Goddard will want to see it. And I could take the pattern gown home any day. But I shall want the ribbon directly, so it had better go to Hartfield, at least the ribbon. You could make it into two parcels, Mrs. Ford, could not you?" "'It is not worth while, Harriet, to give Mrs. Ford the trouble of two parcels." "'No more it is.' "'No trouble in the world, ma'am,' said the obliging Mrs. Ford. "'Oh, but indeed, I would much rather have it only in one. Then, if you please, you shall send it all to Mrs. Goddard's. I do not know. No, I think, Miss Woodhouse, I may just as well have it sent to Hartfield, and take it home with me at night. What do you advise?" "'That you do not give another half-second to the subject. To Hartfield, if you please, Mrs. Ford." "'Aye, that will be much the best,' said Harriet, quite satisfied. I should not at all like it to have it sent to Mrs. Goddard's." Voices approached the shop, or rather one voice and two ladies. Mrs. Weston and Miss Bates met them at the door. "'My dear Miss Woodhouse,' said the latter, I am just run across to entreat the favour of you to come and sit down with us a little while, and give us your opinion of our new instrument. You and Miss Smith—how do you do, Miss Smith? Very well, I thank you. And I beg Mrs. Weston to come with me, that I might be sure of succeeding." "'I hope Mrs. Bates and Miss Fairfax are—' "'Very well. I am much obliged to you. My mother is delightfully well. And Jane caught no cold last night. How is Mr. Woodhouse? I am so glad to hear such a good account. Mrs. Weston told me you were here. Oh, then I said, I must run across. I am sure Miss Woodhouse will allow me just to run across and entreat her to come in. My mother will be so very happy to see her. And now we are such a nice party, she cannot refuse. I pray do, said Mr. Frank Churchill. Miss Woodhouse's opinion of the instrument will be worth having. But, said I, I shall be more sure of succeeding if one of you will go with me. Oh, said he, wait half a minute till I have finished my job. For would you believe it, Miss Woodhouse, there he is, in the most obliging manner in the world, fastening the rivet of my mother's spectacles. The rivet came out, you know, this morning. So very obliging! For my mother had no use of her spectacles, could not put them on. And by the by, everybody ought to have two pair of spectacles. They should indeed. Jane said so. I meant to take them over to John Saunders the first thing I did, but something or other hindered me all the morning. First one thing, then another. There is no saying what, you know. At one time Patty came to say she thought the kitchen chimney wanted sweeping. Oh, said I, Patty, do not come with your bad news to me. Here is the rivet of your mistress's spectacles out. Then the baked apples came home. Mrs. Wallace sent them by her boy. They are extremely civil and obliging to us, the Wallaces, always. I have heard some people say that Mrs. Wallace can be uncivil and give a very rude answer, but we have never known anything but the greatest attention from them. And it cannot be for the value of our custom now, for what is our consumption of bread, you know? Only three of us, besides dear Jane at present, and she really eats nothing. Makes such a shocking breakfast. You would be quite frightened if you saw it. I dare not let my mother know how little she eats. So I say one thing, and then I say another, and it passes off. But about the middle of the day she gets hungry, and there is nothing she likes so well as these baked apples, and they are extremely wholesome. For I took the opportunity the other day of asking Mr. Perry. I happened to meet him in the street. Not that I had any doubt before. I have so often heard Mr. Woodhouse recommend baked apple. I believe it is the only way that Mr. Woodhouse thinks the fruit thoroughly wholesome. We have apple dumplings, however, very often. Patty makes an excellent apple dumpling. Well, Mrs. Weston, you have prevailed, I hope, and these ladies will oblige us." Emma would be very happy to wait on Mrs. Bates, etc. And they did at last move out of the shop, with no farther delay from Miss Bates than, "'How do you do, Mrs. Ford? I beg your pardon, I did not see you before. I hear you have a charming collection of new ribbons from town. Jane came back delighted yesterday. Thank ye, the gloves do very well, only a little too large about the wrist, but Jane is taking them in." "'What was I talking of?' said she, beginning again when they were all in the street. Emma wondered on what of all the medley she would fix. "'I declare I cannot recollect what I was talking of. Oh, my mother's spectacles! So very obliging, Mr. Frank Churchill! Oh, said he, I do think I can fasten the rivet. I like a job of this kind excessively, which you know showed him to be so very. Indeed, I must say that as much as I had heard of him before, and much as I had expected, he very far exceeds anything. I do congratulate you, Mrs. Weston, most warmly. He seems everything the fondest parent could—' "'Oh!' said he, "'I can fasten the rivet. I like a job of that sort excessively. 
I never shall forget his manner, and when I brought out the baked apples from the closet, and hoped our friends would be very so much obliging as to take some, oh, said he directly, there is nothing in the way of fruit half so good, and these are the finest-looking home-baked apples I ever saw in my life. That, you know, was so very, and I am sure by his manner it was no compliment. Indeed, they are very delightful apples, and Mrs. Wallace does them full justice. Only we do not have them baked more than twice, and Mr. Woodhouse made us promise to have them done three times. But Miss Woodhouse will be so good as not to mention it. The apples themselves are the very finest sort for baking, beyond a doubt. All from Donwell, some of Mr. Knightley's most liberal supply. He sends us a sack every year, and certainly there never was such a keeping apple anywhere as one of his trees. I believe there is two of them. My mother says the orchard was always famous in her younger days, but I was really quite shocked the other day, for Mr. Knightley called one morning, and Jane was eating these apples, and we talked about them and said how much she enjoyed them, and he asked whether we were not got to the end of our stock. I am sure you must be, said he, and I will send you another supply, for I have a great many more than I can ever use. William Larkins let me keep a larger quantity than usual this year. I will send you some more before they get good for nothing. So I begged he would not, for really, as to ours being gone, I could not absolutely say that we had a great many left. It was but half a dozen indeed, but they should be all kept for Jane, and I could not at all bear that he should be sending us more, so liberal as he has been already. And Jane said the same, and when he was gone she almost quarrelled with me. No, I should not say quarrelled, for we never had a quarrel in our lives, but she was quite distressed that I had owned the apples were so nearly gone. She wished I had made him believe we had a great many left. Oh, said I, my dear, I did say as much as I could. However, the very same evening William Larkins came over with a large basket of apples, the same sort of apples, a bushel at least, and I was very much obliged, and went down and spoke to William Larkins, and said everything, as you may suppose. William Larkins is such an old acquaintance. I am always glad to see him. But, however, I found afterwards from Patty that William said it was all the apples of that sort his master had. He had brought them all, and now his master had not one left to bake or boil. William did not seem to mind it himself. He was so pleased to think his master had sold so many, for William, you know, thinks more of his master's profit than anything. But Mrs. Hodges, he said, was quite displeased at their being all sent away. She could not bear that her master should not be able to have another apple tart this spring. He told Patty this, but bid her not mind it, and be sure not to say anything to us about it. For Mrs. Hodges would be cross sometimes, and as long as so very many sacks were sold, it did not signify who ate the remainder. And so Patty told me, and I was excessively shocked indeed. I would not have Mr. Knightley know anything about it for the world. He would be so very—I wanted to keep it from Jane's knowledge, but unluckily I had mentioned it before I was aware." Miss Bates had just done as Patty opened the door, and her visitors walked upstairs without having any regular narration to attend to, pursued only by the sounds of her desultory goodwill. Pray take care, Mrs. Weston. There is a step at the turning. Pray take care, Miss Woodhouse. Ours is a rather a dark staircase, rather darker and narrower than one could wish. Miss Smith, pray take care. Miss Woodhouse, I am quite concerned. I am sure you hit your foot. Miss Smith, the step at the turning. End of chapter 9this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Emma by Jane Austen. Volume two, chapter ten. The appearance of the little sitting room as they entered was tranquillity itself. Mrs. Bates, deprived of her usual employment, slumbering on one side of the fire, Frank Churchill at a table near her, most deedily occupied about her spectacles, and Jane Fairfax standing with her back to them intent on her pianoforte. Busy as he was, however, the young man was yet able to show a most happy countenance on seeing Emma again. "'This is a pleasure,' said he, in rather a low voice, "'coming at least ten minutes earlier than I had calculated. You find me trying to be useful. Tell me if you think I shall succeed.' "'What?' said Mrs. Weston. "'Have not you finished it yet? You would not earn a very good livelihood as a working silversmith at this rate.' I have not been working uninterruptedly," he replied. I have been assisting Miss Fairfax in trying to make her instrument stand steadily. It was not quite firm—an unevenness in the floor, I believe. You see we have been wedging one leg with paper. This was very kind of you to be persuaded to come. I was almost afraid you would be hurrying home." He contrived that she should be seated by him, and was sufficiently employed in looking out the best baked apple for her, and trying to make her help or advise him in his work 
till Jane Fairfax was quite ready to sit down to the pianoforte again. That she was not immediately ready, Emma did suspect to arise from the state of her nerves. She had not yet possessed the instrument long enough to touch it without emotion. She must reason herself into the power of performance, and Emma could not but pity such feelings, whatever their origin, and could not but resolve never to expose them to her neighbour again. At last Jane began, and though the first bars were feebly given, the powers of the instrument were gradually done full justice to. Mrs. Weston had been delighted before, and was delighted again. Emma joined her in all her praise, and the pianoforte, with every proper discrimination, was pronounced to be altogether of the highest promise. "'Whoever Colonel Campbell might employ,' said Frank Churchill, with a smile at Emma, "'the person has not chosen ill. I heard a good deal of Colonel Campbell's taste in Weymouth, and the softness of the upper notes I am sure is exactly what he and all that party would particularly prize. I dare say, Miss Fairfax, that he either gave his friend very minute directions, or wrote to Broadwood himself. Do not you think so?" Jane did not look round. She was not obliged to hear. Mrs. Weston had been speaking to her at the same moment. "'It is not fair,' said Emma, in a whisper. "'Mine was a random guess. Do not distress her.' He shook his head with a smile, and looked as if he had very little doubt, and very little mercy. Soon afterwards he began again. "'How much your friends in Ireland must be enjoying your pleasure on this occasion, Miss Fairfax! I dare say they often think of you, and wonder which will be the day, the precise day of the instrument's coming to hand. Do you imagine Colonel Campbell knows the business to be going forward just at this time? Do you imagine it to be the consequence of an immediate commission from him, or that he may have sent only a general direction, an order indefinite as to time, to depend upon contingencies and conveniences?" He paused. She could not but hear. She could not avoid answering. "'Till I have a letter from Colonel Campbell,' said she, in a voice of forced calmness, "'I can imagine nothing with any confidence. It must be all conjecture.' "'Conjecture? Ay, sometimes one conjectures right, and sometimes one conjectures wrong. I wish I could conjecture how soon I shall make this rivet quite firm. What nonsense one talks, Miss Woodhouse, when hard at work, if one talks at all! Your real workmen, I suppose, hold their tongues. But we gentlemen labourers, if we get hold of a word, Miss Fairfax said something about conjecturing. There it is done. I have the pleasure, madam, to Mrs. Bates, of restoring your spectacles, healed for the present. He was very warmly thanked by both mother and daughter. To escape a little from the latter, he went to the pianoforte, and begged Miss Fairfax, who was still sitting at it, to play something more. "'If you are very kind,' said he, "'it will be one of the waltzes we danced last night. Let me live them over again. You did not enjoy them as I did. You appeared tired the whole time. I believe you were glad we danced no longer, but I would have given worlds all the worlds one ever has to give, for another half-hour." She played. "'What felicity it is to hear a tune again which has made one happy! If I mistake not, that was danced at Weymouth." She looked up at him for a moment, coloured deeply, and played something else. He took some music from a chair near the pianoforte, and turning to Emma, said, "'Here is something quite new to me. Do you know it? Kramer. And here are a new set of Irish melodies. That, from such a quarter, one might expect. This was all sent with the instrument. Very thoughtful of Colonel Campbell, was it not? He knew Miss Fairfax could have no music here. I honour that part of the attention particularly. It shows it to have been so thoroughly from the heart. Nothing hastily done, nothing incomplete. True affection only could have prompted it." Emma wished he would be less pointed, yet could not help being amused, and when, on glancing her eye towards Jane Fairfax, she caught the remains of a smile, when she saw that with all the deep blush of consciousness there had been a smile of secret delight, she had less scruple in the amusement, and much less compunction with respect to her. This amiable, upright, perfect Jane Fairfax was apparently cherishing very reprehensible feelings. He brought all the music to her, and they looked it over together. Emma took the opportunity of whispering, "'You speak too plain. She must understand you.' "'I hope she does. I would have her understand me. I am not in the least ashamed of my meaning.' 
But really I am half ashamed, and wish I had never taken up the idea." I am very glad you did, and that you communicated it to me. I have now a key to all her odd looks and ways. Leave shame to her. If she does wrong, she ought to feel it." She is not entirely without it, I think. I do not see much sign of it. She is playing Robin Adair at this moment, his favourite. Shortly afterwards Miss Bates, passing near the window, descried Mr. Knightley on horseback not far off. "'Mr. Knightley, I declare! I must speak to him, if possible, just to thank him. I will not open the window here. It will give you all cold. But I can go into my mother's room, you know. I dare say he will come in when he knows who is here. Quite delightful to have you all meet so! Our little room so honoured. She was in the adjoining chamber while she still spoke, and opening the casement there, immediately called Mr. Knightley's attention, and every syllable of their conversation was as distinctly heard by the others as if it had passed within the same apartment. "'How do you do? How do you do? Oh, very well, I thank you. So obliged to you for the carriage last night. We were just in time, my mother just ready for us. Pray come in, do come in, you will find some friends here.' So began Miss Bates, and Mr. Knightley seemed determined to be heard in his turn, for most resolutely and commandingly did he say, "'How is your niece, Miss Bates? I want to inquire after you all, but particularly your niece. How is Miss Fairfax? I hope she caught no cold last night. How is she to-day? Tell me how Miss Fairfax is.' And Miss Bates was obliged to give a direct answer before he would hear her in anything else. The listeners were amused, and Mrs. Weston gave Emma a look of particular meaning but Emma still shook her head in steady scepticism. "'So obliged to you! So very much obliged to you for the carriage!' resumed Miss Bates. He cut her short with, "'I am going to Kingston. Can I do anything for you?' "'Oh, dear! Kingston, are you? Mrs. Cole was saying the other day she wanted something from Kingston.' "'Mrs. Cole has servants to send. Can I do anything for you?' "'No, I thank you. But do come in. Who do you think is here? Miss Woodhouse and Miss Smith. So kind as to call to hear the new pianoforte. Do put up your horse at the Crown and come in.' "'Well,' said he, in a deliberating manner, "'for five minutes, perhaps.' "'And here is Mrs. Weston and Frank Churchill, too. Quite delightful. So many friends.' "'No, not now, I thank you. I could not stay two minutes. I must get on to Kingston as fast as I can.' "'Oh, do come in. They will be so very happy to see you.' "'No, no, your room is full enough. I will call another day and hear the pianoforte.' "'Well, I am so sorry. Oh, Mr. Knightley, what a delightful party last night, and how extremely pleasant! Did you ever see such dancing? Was not it delightful? Miss Woodhouse and Mr. Frank Churchill, I never saw anything equal to it.' "'Oh, very delightful indeed. I can say nothing less, for I suppose Miss Woodhouse and Mr. Frank Churchill are hearing everything that passes. And," raising his voice still more, "'I do not see why Miss Fairfax should not be mentioned too. I think Miss Fairfax dances very well, and Mrs. Weston is the very best country dance player without exception in England. Now, if your friends have any gratitude, they will say something pretty loud about you and me in return, but I cannot stay to hear it.' "'Oh, Mr. Knightley, one moment more, something of consequence, so shocked! Jane and I are both so shocked about the apples!' "'What is the matter now?' "'To think of your sending us all your store apples! You said you had a great many, and now you have not one left! We really are so shocked! Mrs. Hodges may well be angry. William Larkins mentioned it here. You should not have done it, indeed you should not! Ah, he is off. He never can bear to be thanked. But I thought he would have stayed now, and it would have been a pity not to have mentioned. Well, returning to the room, I have not been able to succeed. Mr. Knightley cannot stop. He is going to Kingston. He asked me if he could do anything. Yes, said Jane. We heard his kind offers. We heard everything. Oh, yes, my dear, I dare say you might, because you know the door was open and the window was open, and Mr. Knightley spoke loud. You must have heard everything, to be sure. Can I do anything for you at Kingston? said he. So I just mentioned. Oh, Miss Woodhouse, must you be going? You seem but just come. So very obliging of you." Emma found it really time to be at home. The visit had already lasted long, and on examining watches so much of the morning was perceived to be gone, that Mrs. Weston and her companion, taking leave also, could allow themselves only to walk with the two young ladies to Hartfield Gates, before they set off for Randall's. End of chapter 10
Volume Two, Chapter Eleven of Emma. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Emma by Jane Austen. Volume Two, Chapter Eleven. It may be possible to do without dancing entirely. Instances have been known of young people passing many, many months successively, without being at any ball of any description, and no material injury accrue either to body or mind. But when a beginning is made, when the felicities of rapid motion have once been, though slightly felt, it must be a very heavy set that does not ask for more. Frank Churchill had danced once at Highbury, and longed to dance again and the last half-hour of an evening which Mr. Woodhouse was persuaded to spend with his daughter at Randall's, was passed by the two young people in schemes on the subject. Frank's was the first idea, and his the greatest zeal in pursuing it, for the lady was the best judge of the difficulties, and the most solicitous for accommodation and appearance. But still she had inclination enough for showing people again how delightfully Mr. Frank Churchill and Miss Woodhouse danced for doing that in which she need not blush to compare herself with Jane Fairfax, and even for simple dancing itself without any of the wicked aids of vanity, to assist him first in pacing out the room where they were in to see what it could be made to hold, and then in taking the dimensions of the other parlour in the hope of discovering, in spite of all that Mr. Weston could say of their exactly equal size, that it was a little the largest. His first proposition and request, that the dance begun at Mr. Cole's should be finished there, that the same party should be collected, and the same musician engaged, met with the readiest acquiescence. Mr. Weston entered into the idea with thorough enjoyment, and Mrs. Weston most willingly undertook to play as long as they could wish to dance, and the interesting employment had followed, of reckoning up exactly who there would be, and apportioning out the indispensable division of space to every couple. "'You and Miss Smith, and Miss Fairfax will be three, and the two Miss Coxes five, had been repeated many times over. "'And there will be the two Gilberts, young Cox, my father and myself, besides Mr. Knightley. Yes, that will be quite enough for pleasure. You and Miss Smith, and Miss Fairfax will be three, and the two Miss Coxes five, and for five couple there will be plenty of room.' But soon it came to be on one side. "'But will there be good room for five couple? I really do not think there will.' on another. And after all, five couple are not enough to make it worth while to stand up. Five couple are nothing, when one thinks seriously about it. It will not do to invite five couple. It can be allowable only as the thought of the moment." Somebody said that Miss Gilbert was expected at her brother's, and must be invited with the rest. Somebody else believed Mrs. Gilbert would have danced the other evening if she had been asked. A word was put in for a second young Cox, and at last Mr. Weston naming one family of cousins who must be included, and another of very old acquaintance who could not be left out, it became a certainty that the five couple would be at least ten, and a very interesting speculation in what possible manner they could be disposed of. The doors of the two rooms were just opposite each other. Might not they use both rooms, and dance across the passage? It seemed the best scheme and yet it was not so good but that many of them wanted a better. Emma said it would be awkward, Mrs. Weston was in distress about the supper, and Mr. Woodhouse opposed it earnestly on the score of health. It made him so very unhappy, indeed, that it could not be persevered in. "'Oh, no,' said he, "'it would be the extreme of imprudence. I could not bear it for Emma. Emma is not strong. She would catch a dreadful cold. So would poor little Harriet. So would you all. "'Mrs. Weston, you would be quite laid up. Do not let them talk of such a wild thing. Pray do not let them talk of it. That young man," speaking lower, "'is very thoughtless. Do not tell his father, but that young man is not quite the thing. He has been opening the doors very often this evening, and keeping them open very inconsiderately. He does not think of the draught. I do not mean to set you against him, but indeed he is not quite the thing." Mrs. Weston was sorry for such a charge. She knew the importance of it, and said everything in her power to do it away. Every door was now closed, the passage plan given up, and the first scheme of dancing only in the room they were in resorted to again, and with such good will on Frank Churchill's part, that the space which a quarter of an hour before had been deemed barely sufficient for five couple, was now endeavoured to be made out quite enough for ten. "'We were too magnificent,' said he. 
We allowed unnecessary room. Ten couple may stand here very well." Emma demurred. It would be a crowd, a sad crowd, and what could be worse than dancing without space to turn in? Very true, he gravely replied. It was very bad. But still he went on measuring, and still he ended with, I think there will be very tolerable room for ten couple. No, no, said she. You are quite unreasonable. It would be dreadful to be standing so close. Nothing can be farther from pleasure than to be dancing in a crowd, and a crowd in a little room. There is no denying it, he replied. I agree with you exactly. A crowd in a little room. Miss Woodhouse, you have the art of giving pictures in a few words. Exquisite, quite exquisite. Still, however, having proceeded so far, one is unwilling to give the matter up. It would be a disappointment to my father. And altogether, I do not know that. I am rather of opinion that ten couple might stand here very well." Emma perceived that the nature of his gallantry was a little self-willed, and that he would rather oppose than lose the pleasure of dancing with her. But she took the compliment and forgave the rest. Had she ever intended to marry him, it might have been worth while to pause and consider, and try to understand the value of his preference and the character of his temper. But for all the purposes of their acquaintance, he was quite amiable enough. Before the middle of the next day he was at Hartfield, and he entered the room with such an agreeable smile as certified the continuance of the scheme. It soon appeared that he came to announce an improvement. "'Well, Miss Woodhouse,' he almost immediately began, "'your inclination for dancing has not been quite frightened away, I hope, by the terrors of my father's little rooms. I bring a new proposal on that subject a thought of my father's which waits only your approbation to be acted upon. May I hope for the honour of your hand for the first two dances of this little projected ball, to be given, not at Randall's, but at the Crown Inn?" "'The Crown?' "'Yes. And if you and Mr. Woodhouse see no objection, and I trust you cannot, my father hopes his friends will be so kind as to visit him there. Better accommodations he can promise them, and not a less grateful welcome than at Randall's. It is his own idea. Mrs. Weston sees no objection in it, provided you are satisfied. This is what we all feel. Oh, you were perfectly right. Ten couple in either of the Randalls' rooms would have been insufferable, dreadful. I felt how right you were the whole time, but I was too anxious for securing anything to like to yield. Is it not a good exchange? You consent. I hope you consent." It appears to me a plan that nobody can object to, if Mr. and Mrs. Weston do not. I think it admirable, and as far as I can answer for myself, shall be most happy. It seems the only improvement that could be. Papa, do you not think it an excellent improvement?" She was obliged to repeat and explain it, before it was fully comprehended, and then, being quite new, farther representations were necessary to make it acceptable. No, he thought it very far from an improvement, a very bad plan much worse than the other. A room at an inn was always damp and dangerous, never properly aired or fit to be inhabited. If they must dance, they had better dance at Randall's. He had never been in the room at the Crown in his life, did not know the people who kept it by sight. Oh, no, a very bad plan. They would catch worse colds at the Crown than anywhere." "'I was going to observe, sir,' said Frank Churchill that one of the great recommendations of this change would be the very little danger of anybody's catching cold. So much less danger at the Crown than at Randall's. Mr. Perry might have reason to regret the alteration, but nobody else could." "'Sir,' said Mr. Woodhouse, rather warmly, "'you are very much mistaken if you suppose Mr. Perry to be that sort of character. Mr. Perry is extremely concerned when any of us are ill. But I do not understand how the room at the Crown can be safer for you than your father's house." from the very circumstance of its being larger, sir. We shall have no occasion to open the windows at all, not once the whole evening. And it is that dreadful habit of opening the windows, letting in cold air upon heated bodies, which, as you well know, sir, does the mischief." "'Open the windows! But surely, Mr. Churchill, nobody would think of opening the windows at Randall's. Nobody could be so imprudent. I never heard of such a thing, dancing with open windows. I am sure neither your father nor Mrs. Weston, poor Miss Taylor that was, would suffer it." "'Ah, sir, but a thoughtless young person will sometimes step behind a window curtain and throw up a sash, without its being suspected. I have often known it done myself." "'Have you indeed, sir? Bless me! I never could have supposed it. But 
I live out of the world, and am often astonished at what I hear. However, this does make a difference, and perhaps when we come to talk it over. But these sort of things require a good deal of consideration. One cannot resolve upon them in a hurry. If Mr. and Mrs. Weston will be so obliging as to call here one morning, we may talk it over and see what can be done." "'But unfortunately, sir, my time is so limited—' "'Oh!' interrupted Emma. "'There will be plenty of time for talking everything over. There is no hurry at all. If it can be contrived to be at the Crown, papa, it will be very convenient for the horses. They will be so near their own stable.' And "'So they will, my dear. That is a great thing. Not that James ever complains, but it is right to spare our horses when we can. If I could be sure of the rooms being thoroughly aired. But is Mrs. Stokes to be trusted? I doubt it. I do not know her, even by sight." "'I can answer for everything of that nature, sir, because it will be under Mrs. Weston's care. Mrs. Weston undertakes to direct the whole." "'There, papa. Now you must be satisfied. Our own dear Mrs. Weston, who is carefulness itself. Do not you remember what Mr. Perry said so many years ago, when I had the measles? If Miss Taylor undertakes to wrap Miss Emma up, you need not have any fears, sir. How often have I heard you speak of it as such a compliment to her?" "'Aye, very true. Mr. Perry did say so. I shall never forget it. Poor little Emma! You were very bad with the measles. That is, you would have been very bad, but for Perry's great attention. He came four times a day for a week. He said from the first it was a very good sort, which was our great comfort. But the measles are a dreadful complaint. I hope, whenever poor Isabella's little ones have the measles, she will send for Perry." "'My father and Mrs. Weston are at the Crown at this moment,' said Frank Churchill, examining the capabilities of the house. I left them there, and came on to Hartfield, impatient for your opinion, and hoping you might be persuaded to join them and give your advice on the spot. I was desired to say so from both. It would be the greatest pleasure to them if you could allow me to attend you there. They can do nothing satisfactorily without you." Emma was most happy to be called to such a council, and her father, engaging to think it all over while she was gone, the two young people set off together without delay for the crown. There were Mr. and Mrs. Weston, delighted to see her and receive her approbation, very busy and very happy in their different way, she in some little distress, and he finding everything perfect. Emma," said she, this paper is worse than I expected. Look, in places you see it is dreadfully dirty, and the wainscot is more yellow and forlorn than anything I could have imagined." "'My dear, you are too particular,' said her husband. What does all that signify? You will see nothing of it by candlelight. It will be as clean as Randall's by candlelight. We never see anything of it on our club nights." The ladies here probably exchanged looks which meant, Men never know when things are dirty or not. And the gentleman perhaps thought each to himself, Women will have their little nonsenses and needless cares. One perplexity, however, arose which the gentleman did not disdain. It regarded a supper-room. At the time of the ballrooms being built, suppers had not been in question, and a small card-room adjoining was the only addition. What was to be done? This card-room would be wanted as a card-room now, or, if cards were conveniently voted unnecessary by their four selves, still was it not too small for any comfortable supper? Another room of much better size might be secured for the purpose, but it was at the other end of the house, and a long, awkward passage must be gone through to get at it. This made a difficulty. Mrs. Weston was afraid of draughts for the young people in that passage, and neither Emma nor the gentleman could tolerate the prospect of being miserably crowded at supper. Mrs. Weston proposed having no regular supper, merely sandwiches, etc., set out in the little room, but that was scouted as a wretched suggestion. A private dance, without sitting down to supper, was pronounced an infamous fraud upon the rights of men and women, and Mrs. Weston must not speak of it again. She then took another line of expediency, and looking into the doubtful room, observed, "'I do not think it is so very small. We shall not be many, you know.' And Mr. Weston, at the same time, walking briskly with long steps through the passage, was calling out, "'You talk a great deal of the length of this passage, my dear. It is a mere nothing, after all, and not the least draught from the stairs.' "'I wish,' said Mrs. Weston, "'one could know which arrangement our guests in general would like best. To do what would be most generally pleasing must be our object. If one could but tell what that would be." "'Yes, very true,' 
cried Frank, very true. You want your neighbours' opinions. I do not wonder at you. If one could ascertain what the chief of them—the Coles, for instance—they are not far off. Shall I call upon them? Or Miss Bates, she is still nearer. And I do not know whether Miss Bates is not as likely to understand the inclinations of the rest of the people as anybody. I think we do want a larger council. Suppose I go and invite Miss Bates to join us." "'Well, if you please,' said Mrs. Weston, rather hesitating, "'if you think she'll be of any use.' "'You will get nothing to the purpose from Miss Bates,' said Emma. "'She will be all delight and gratitude, but she will tell you nothing. She will not even listen to your questions. I see no advantage in consulting Miss Bates.' But she is so amusing, so extremely amusing. I am very fond of hearing Miss Bates talk, and I need not bring the whole family, you know." Here Mr. Weston joined them, and on hearing what was proposed, gave it his decided approbation. "'I do, Frank. Go and fetch Miss Bates, and let us end the matter at once. She will enjoy the scheme, I am sure, and I do not know a properer person for showing us how to do away difficulties. Fetch Miss Bates. We are growing a little too nice. She is a standing lesson of how to be happy. But fetch them both. Invite them both." "'Both, sir? Can the old lady—' "'The old lady? No, the young lady, to be sure. I shall think you a great blockhead, Frank, if you bring the aunt without the niece." "'Oh! I beg your pardon, sir. I did not immediately recollect. Undoubtedly, if you wish it, I will endeavour to persuade them both." And away he ran. Long before he reappeared, attending the short, neat, brisk-moving aunt and her elegant niece, Mrs. Weston, like a sweet-tempered woman and a good wife, had examined the passage again, and found the evils of it much less than she had supposed before, indeed very trifling. And here ended the difficulties of decision. All the rest, in speculation at least, was perfectly smooth. All the minor arrangements of table and chair, lights and music, tea and supper, made themselves, or were left as mere trifles to be settled at any time between Mrs. Weston and Mrs. Stokes. Everybody invited was certainly to come. Frank had already written to Enscombe to propose staying a few days beyond his fortnight, which could not possibly be refused, and a delightful dance it was to be. Most cordially, when Miss Bates arrived, did she agree that it must, as a counsellor she was not wanted, but as an approver, a much safer character, she was truly welcome. Her approbation, at once general and minute, warm and incessant, could not but please, and for another half-hour they were all walking to and fro, between the different rooms, some suggesting, some attending, and all in happy enjoyment of the future. The party did not break up without Emma's being positively secured for the first two dances by the hero of the evening, nor without her overhearing Mr. Weston whisper to his wife, "'He has asked her, my dear. That's right. I knew he would.'" End of chapter 11 Volume 2, Chapter 12 of Emma. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Emma by Jane Austen. Volume 2, Chapter 12. One thing only was wanting to make the prospect of the ball completely satisfactory to Emma, its being fixed for a day within the granted term of Frank Churchill's stay in Surrey, for in spite of Mr. Weston's confidence, she could not think it so very impossible that the Churchills might not allow their nephew to remain a day beyond his fortnight. But this was not judged feasible. The preparations must take their time, nothing could be properly ready till the third week were entered on, and for a few days they must be planning, proceeding, and hoping in uncertainty, at the risk, in her opinion, the great risk of its being all in vain. Enscombe, however, was gracious, gracious in fact, if not in word. His wish of staying longer evidently did not please, but it was not opposed. All was safe and prosperous, and as the removal of one solicitude generally makes way for another, Emma, being now certain of her ball, began to adopt as the next vexation Mr. Knightley's provoking indifference about it. Either because he did not dance himself, or because the plan had been formed without his being consulted, he seemed resolved that it should not interest him determined against its exciting any present curiosity, or affording him any future amusement. To her voluntary communications Emma could get no more approving reply than, "'Very well. 
if the Westons think it worth while to be all this trouble for a few hours of noisy entertainment, I have nothing to say against it, but that they shall not choose pleasures for me. Oh, yes, I must be there, I could not refuse, and I will keep as much awake as I can. But I would rather be at home, looking over William Larkin's weak account, much rather, I confess. Pleasure in seeing dancing! Not I, indeed. I never look at it. I do not know who does. Fine dancing, I believe, like virtue, must be its own reward. Those who are standing by are usually thinking of something very different." This, Emma felt, was aimed at her, and it made her quite angry. It was not in compliment to Jane Fairfax, however, that he was so indifferent, or so indignant. He was not guided by her feelings in reprobating the ball, for she enjoyed the thought of it to an extraordinary degree. It made her animated, open-hearted. She voluntarily said, "'Oh, Miss Woodhouse, I hope nothing may happen to prevent the ball. What a disappointment it would be!' I do look forward to it, I own, with very great pleasure." It was not to oblige Jane Fairfax, therefore, that he would have preferred the society of William Larkins. No, she was more and more convinced that Mrs. Weston was quite mistaken in that surmise. There was a great deal of friendly and of compassionate attachment on his side, but no love. Alas! there was soon no leisure for quarrelling with Mr. Knightley. Two days of joyful security were immediately followed by the overthrow of everything. A letter arrived from Mr. Churchill to urge his nephew's instant return. Mrs. Churchill was unwell, far too unwell to do without him. She had been in a very suffering state, so said her husband, when writing to her nephew two days before, though from her usual unwillingness to give pain, and constant habit of never thinking of herself, she had not mentioned it. But now she was too ill to trifle, and must entreat him to set off for Enscombe without delay. The substance of this letter was forwarded to Emma, in a note from Mrs. Weston, instantly. As to his going, it was inevitable. He must be gone within a few hours, though without feeling any real alarm for his aunt, to lessen his repugnance. He knew her illnesses. They never occurred but for her own convenience. Mrs. Weston added, that he could only allow himself time to hurry to Highbury after breakfast, and take leave of the few friends there whom he could suppose to feel any interest in him, and that he might be expected at Hartfield very soon. This wretched note was the finale of Emma's breakfast. When once it had been read, there was no doing anything but lament and exclaim. The loss of the ball, the loss of the young man, and all that the young man might be feeling! It was too wretched! Such a delightful evening as it would have been! everybody so happy, and she and her partner the happiest. I said it would be so, was the only consolation. Her father's feelings were quite distinct. He thought principally of Mrs. Churchill's illness, and wanted to know how she was treated, and as for the ball, it was shocking to have dear Emma disappointed, but they would all be safer at home. Emma was ready for her visitor some time before he appeared, but if this reflected at all upon his impatience, his sorrowful look and total want of spirits when he did come might redeem him. He felt the going away almost too much to speak of it. His dejection was most evident. He sat really lost in thought for the first few minutes, and when rousing himself it was only to say, "'Of all horrid things, leave-taking is the worst.' "'But you will come again,' said Emma. This will not be your only visit to Randall's." Ah! shaking his head, the uncertainty of when I may be able to return. I shall try for it with a zeal. It will be the object of all my thoughts and cares. And if my uncle and aunt go to town this spring! But I am afraid they did not stir last spring. I am afraid it is a custom gone for ever. Our poor ball must be quite given up. Ah, that ball! Why did we wait for anything? Why not seize the pleasure at once? How often is happiness destroyed by preparation, foolish preparation! You told us it would be so. Oh, Miss Woodhouse, why are you always so right?" Indeed, I am very sorry to be right in this instance. I would much rather have been merry than wise. If I can come again, we are still to have our ball. My father depends on it. Do not forget your engagement. Emma looked graciously. "'Such a fortnight as it has been,' he continued. "'Every day more precious and more delightful than the day before. Every day making me less fit to bear any other place. Happy those who can remain at Highbury!' 
"'As you do us such ample justice now,' said Emma, laughing, "'I will venture to ask whether you did not come a little doubtfully at first. Do not we rather surpass your expectations? I am sure we do. I am sure you did not much expect to like us. You would not have been so long in coming if you had had a pleasant idea of Highbury." He laughed rather consciously, and though denying the sentiment, Emma was convinced that it had been so. "'And you must be off this very morning?' "'Yes. My father is to join me here. We shall walk back together, and I must be off immediately. I am almost afraid that every moment will bring him." "'Not five minutes to spare even for your friends Miss Fairfax and Miss Bates. How unlucky! Miss Bates's powerful, argumentative mind might have strengthened yours." "'Yes, I have called there. Passing the door I thought it better. It was a right thing to do. I went in for three minutes and was detained by Miss Bates's being absent. She was out, and I felt it impossible not to wait till she came in. She is a woman that one may, that one must, laugh at, but that one would not wish to slight. It was better to pay my visit, then." He hesitated, got up, walked to a window. "'In short,' said he, "'perhaps, Miss Woodhouse, I think you can hardly be quite without suspicion—' He looked at her, as if wanting to read her thoughts. She hardly knew what to say. It seemed like the forerunner of something absolutely serious, which she did not wish. Forcing herself to speak, therefore, in the hope of putting it by, she calmly said, "'You are quite in the right. It was most natural to pay your visit, then.' He was silent. She believed he was looking at her, probably reflecting on what she had said, and trying to understand the manner. She heard him sigh. It was natural for him to feel that he had cause to sigh. He could not believe her to be encouraging him. A few awkward moments passed, and he sat down again, and in a more determined manner said, "'It was something to feel that all the rest of my time might be given to Hartfield. My regard for Hartfield is most warm.' He stopped again, rose again, and seemed quite embarrassed. He was more in love with her than Emma had supposed, and who can say how it might have ended if his father had not made his appearance? Mr. Woodhouse soon followed, and the necessity of exertion made him composed. A very few minutes more, however, completed the present trial. Mr. Weston, always alert when business was to be done, and as incapable of procrastinating any evil that was inevitable, as of foreseeing any that was doubtful, said, it was time to go. And the young man, though he might and did sigh, could not but agree to take leave. "'I shall hear about you all,' said he. "'That is my chief consolation. I shall hear of everything that is going on among you. I have engaged Mrs. Weston to correspond with me. She has been so kind as to promise it. Oh, the blessing of a female correspondent, when one is really interested in the absent! She will tell me everything. In her letters I shall be at dear Highbury again." A very friendly shake of the hand, a very earnest, "'Good-bye!" closed the speech, and the door had soon shut out Frank Churchill. Short had been the notice, short their meeting, he was gone and Emma felt so sorry to part, and foresaw so great a loss to their little society from his absence, as to begin to be afraid of being too sorry, and feeling it too much. It was a sad change. They had been meeting almost every day since his arrival. Certainly his being at Randalls had given great spirit to the last two weeks, indescribable spirit. The idea, the expectation of seeing him which every morning had brought, the assurance of his attentions, his liveliness, his manners, it had been a very happy fortnight, and forlorn must be the sinking from it into the common course of Hartfield days. To complete every other recommendation, he had almost told her that he loved her. What strength, or what constancy of affection he might be subject to, was another point. But at present she could not doubt his having a decidedly warm admiration, a conscious preference of herself. And this persuasion, joined to all the rest, made her think that she must be a little in love with him, in spite of every previous determination against it. "'I certainly must,' said she. "'This sensation of listlessness, weariness, stupidity, this disinclination to sit down and employ myself, this feeling of everything's being dull and insipid about the house. I must be in love. I should be the oddest creature in the world if I were not. For a few weeks, at least. Well, evil to some is always good to others. 
I shall have many fellow mourners for the ball, if not for Frank Churchill. But Mr. Knightley will be happy. He may spend the evening with his dear William Larkins now, if he likes." Mr. Knightley, however, showed no triumphant happiness. He could not say that he was sorry on his own account. His very cheerful look would have contradicted him if he had. But he said, and very steadily, that he was sorry for the disappointment of the others, and with considerable kindness added, "'You, Emma, who have so few opportunities of dancing, you are really out of luck. You are very much out of luck." It was some days before she saw Jane Fairfax, to judge of her honest regret in this woeful change, but when they did meet, her composure was odious. She had been particularly unwell, however, suffering from headache to a degree, which made her aunt declare that had the ball taken place, she did not think Jane could have attended it, and it was charity to impute some of her unbecoming indifference to the languor of ill health. End of chapter 12 Volume Two, Chapter Thirteen of Emma. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Emma, by Jane Austen, Volume Two, Chapter Thirteen. Emma continued to entertain no doubt of her being in love. Her ideas only varied as to the how much. At first, she thought it was a good deal, and afterwards, but little. She had great pleasure in hearing Frank Churchill talked of, and for his sake greater pleasure than ever in seeing Mr. and Mrs. Weston. She was very often thinking of him, and quite impatient for a letter, that she might know how he was, how were his spirits, how was his aunt, and what was the chance of his coming to Randall's again this spring. But on the other hand, she could not admit herself to be unhappy, nor, after the first morning, to be less disposed for employment than usual. She was still busy and cheerful, and pleasing as he was, she could yet imagine him to have faults, and farther, though thinking of him so much, and as she sat drawing or working, forming a thousand amusing schemes for the progress and close of their attachment, fancying interesting dialogues and inventing elegant letters, the conclusion of every imaginary declaration on his side was that she refused him. Their affection was always to subside into friendship. Everything tender and charming was to mark their parting, but still they were to part. When she became sensible of this, it struck her that she could not be very much in love, for in spite of her previous and fixed determination never to quit her father, never to marry, a strong attachment certainly must produce more of a struggle than she could foresee in her own feelings. "'I do not find myself making any use of the word sacrifice,' said she. In not one of all my clever replies, my delicate negatives, is there any allusion to making a sacrifice? I do suspect that he is not really necessary to my happiness. So much the better. I certainly will not persuade myself to feel more than I do. I am quite enough in love. I should be sorry to be more." Upon the whole, she was equally contented with her view of his feelings. He is undoubtedly very much in love. Everything denotes it very much in love indeed, and when he comes again, if his affection continue, I must be on my guard not to encourage it. It would be most inexcusable to do otherwise, as my own mind is quite made up. Not that I imagine he can think I have been encouraging him hitherto. No, if he had believed me at all to share his feelings, he would not have been so wretched. Could he have thought himself encouraged, his looks and language at parting would have been different. Still, however, I must be on my guard. This is in the supposition of his attachment continuing what it now is. But I do not know that I expect it will. I do not look upon him to be quite the sort of man. I do not altogether build upon his steadiness or constancy. His feelings are warm, but I can imagine them rather changeable. Every consideration of the subject, in short, makes me thankful that my happiness is not more deeply involved. I shall do very well again after a little while. And then it will be a good thing over for they say everybody is in love once in their lives, and I shall have been let off easily." When his letter to Mrs. Weston arrived, Emma had the perusal of it, and she read it with a degree of pleasure and admiration which made her at first shake her head over her own sensations, and think she had undervalued their strength. It was a long, well-written letter, giving the particulars of his journey and of his feelings, expressing all the affection, gratitude, and respect which was natural and honourable, and describing everything exterior and local that could be supposed attractive, with spirit and precision. 
no suspicious flourishes now of apology or concern. It was the language of real feeling towards Mrs. Weston, and the transition from Highbury to Enscombe, the contrast between the places in some of the first blessings of social life, was just enough touched on to show how keenly it was felt, and how much more might have been said but for the restraints of propriety. The charm of her own name was not wanting. Miss Woodhouse appeared more than once, and never without a something of pleasing connection, either a compliment to her taste, or a remembrance of what she had said, and in the very last time of its meeting her eye, unadorned as it was by any such broad wreath of gallantry, she yet could discern the effect of her influence, and acknowledge the greatest compliment perhaps of all conveyed. Compressed into the very lowest vacant corner were these words. I had not a spare moment on Tuesday, as you know, for Miss Woodhouse's beautiful little friend. Pray make my excuses and adieus to her." This, Emma could not doubt, was all for herself. Harriet was remembered only from being her friend. His information and prospects as to Enscombe were neither worse nor better than had been anticipated. Mrs. Churchill was recovering, and he dared not yet, even in his own imagination, fix a time for coming to Randall's again. Gratifying, however, and stimulative as was the letter in the material part, its sentiments, she yet found, when it was folded up and returned to Mrs. Weston, that it had not added any lasting warmth, that she could still do without the writer, and that he must learn to do without her. Her intentions were unchanged. Her resolution of refusal only grew more interesting by the addition of a scheme for his subsequent constellation and happiness. His recollection of Harriet, and the words which clothed it, the beautiful little friend, suggested to her the idea of Harriet succeeding her in his affections. Was it impossible? No. Harriet undoubtedly was greatly his inferior in understanding, but he had been very much struck with the loveliness of her face and the warm simplicity of her manner, and all the probabilities of circumstance and connection were in her favour. For Harriet it would be advantageous and delightful indeed. I must not dwell upon it," said she. I must not think of it. I know the danger of indulging such speculations. But stranger things have happened, and when we cease to care for each other as we do now, it will be the means of confirming us in that sort of true disinterested friendship which I can already look forward to with pleasure." It was well to have a comfort in store on Harriet's behalf, though it might be wise to let the fancy touch it seldom, for evil in that quarter was at hand. As Frank Churchill's arrival had succeeded Mr. Elton's engagement in the conversation of Highbury, as the latest interest had entirely borne down the first, so now, upon Frank Churchill's disappearance, Mr. Elton's concerns were assuming the most irresistible form. His wedding day was named. He would soon be among them again, Mr. Elton and his bride. There was hardly time to talk over the first letter from Enscombe before Mr. Elton and his bride was in everybody's mouth, and Frank Churchill was forgotten. Emma grew sick at the sound. She had had three weeks of happy exemption from Mr. Elton, and Harriet's mind, she had been willing to hope, had been lately gaining strength. With Mr. Weston's ball in view, at least, there had been a great deal of insensibility to other things but it was now too evident that she had not attained such a state of composure as could stand against the actual approach, new carriage, bell-ringing, and all. Poor Harriet was in a flutter of spirits which required all the reasonings and soothings and attentions of every kind that Emma could give. Emma felt that she could not do too much for her, that Harriet had a right to all her ingenuity and all her patience. But it was heavy work to be forever convincing without producing any effect for ever agreed to, without being able to make their opinions the same. Harriet listened submissively, and said, "'It was very true. It was just as Miss Woodhouse described. It was not worth while to think about them, and she would not think about them any longer.' But no change of subject could avail, and the next half-hour saw her as anxious and restless about the Eltons as before. At last Emma attacked her on another ground. Your allowing yourself to be so occupied and so unhappy about Mr. Elton's marrying Harriet is the strongest reproach you can make me. You could not give me a greater reproof for the mistake I fell into. It was all my doing, I know. I have not forgotten it, I assure you. Deceived myself, I did very miserably deceive you. And it will be a painful reflection to me for ever. Do not imagine me in danger of forgetting it." Harriet felt this too much to utter more than a few words of eager exclamation. Emma continued. I have not said exert yourself, Harriet, for my sake. Think less, talk less of Mr. Elton for my sake. 
because for your own sake, rather, I would wish it to be done, for the sake of what is more important than my comfort, a habit of self-command in you, a consideration of what is your duty, an attention to propriety, an endeavour to avoid the suspicions of others, to save your health and credit, and restore your tranquillity. These are the motives which I have been pressing on you. They are very important, and sorry I am that you cannot feel them sufficiently to act upon them. My being saved from pain is a very secondary consideration. I want you to save yourself from greater pain. Perhaps I may sometimes have felt that Harriet would not forget what was due, or rather what would be kind by me." This appeal to her affections did more than all the rest. The idea of wanting gratitude and consideration for Miss Woodhouse, whom she really loved extremely, made her wretched for a while, and when the violence of grief was comforted away, still remained powerful enough to prompt to what was right and support her in it very tolerably. "'You, who have been the best friend I ever had in my life, want gratitude to you. Nobody is equal to you. I care for nobody as I do for you. Oh, Miss Woodhouse, how ungrateful I have been!' Such expressions, assisted as they were by everything that look and manner could do, made Emma feel that she had never loved Harriet so well, nor valued her affection so highly before. "'There is no charm equal to tenderness of heart,' said she afterwards to herself. "'There is nothing to be compared to it. Warmth and tenderness of heart, with an affectionate open manner, will beat all the clearness of head in the world for attraction. I am sure it will. It is tenderness of heart which makes my dear father so generally beloved, which gives Isabella all her popularity. I have it not, but I know how to prize and respect it. Harriet is my superior in all the charm and all the felicity it gives. Dear Harriet, I would not change you for the clearest-headed, longest-sighted, best-judging female breathing. Oh, the coldness of a Jane Fairfax! Harriet is worth a hundred such and for a wife, a sensible man's wife, it is invaluable. I mention no names, but happy the man who changes Emma for Harriet. End of chapter 13 Volume 2, Chapter 14 of Emma. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Emma by Jane Austen. Volume Two, Chapter Fourteen. Mrs. Elton was first seen at church, but though devotion might be interrupted, curiosity could not be satisfied by a bride in a pew, and it must be left for the visits in form which were then to be paid, to settle whether she were very pretty indeed, or only rather pretty, or not pretty at all. Emma had feelings less of curiosity than of pride or propriety, to make her resolve on not being the last to pay her respects, and she made a point of Harriet's going with her, that the worst of the business might be gone through as soon as possible. She could not enter the house again, could not be in the same room to which she had with such vain artifice retreated three months ago, to lace up her boot, without recollecting. A thousand vexatious thoughts would recur compliments, charades, and horrible blunders, and it was not to be supposed that poor Harriet should not be recollecting too, but she behaved very well, and was only rather pale and silent. The visit was of course short, and there was so much embarrassment and occupation of mind to shorten it, that Emma would not allow herself entirely to form an opinion of the lady, and on no account to give one, beyond the nothing meaning terms of being elegantly dressed and very pleasing. She did not really like her. She would not be in a hurry to find fault, but she suspected that there was no elegance, ease, but not elegance. She was almost sure that for a young woman, a stranger, a bride, there was too much ease. Her person was rather good, her face not unpretty, but neither feature nor air nor voice nor manner were elegant. Emma thought at least it would turn out so. As for Mr. Elton, his manners did not appear—but no, she would not permit a hasty or a witty word from herself about his manners. It was an awkward ceremony at any time to be receiving wedding visits, and a man had need be all grace to acquit himself well through it. The woman was better off, she might have the assistance of fine clothes, and the privilege of bashfulness, but the man had only his own good sense to depend on, 
and when she considered how peculiarly unlucky poor Mr. Elton was, in being in the same room at once with the woman he had just married, the woman he had wanted to marry, and the woman whom he had been expected to marry, she must allow him to have the right to look as little wise, and to be as much affectedly and as little really easy as could be. "'Well, Miss Woodhouse,' said Harriet, when they had quitted the house, and after waiting in vain for her friend to begin, "'Well, Miss Woodhouse,' with a gentle sigh, "'what do you think of her? Is not she very charming?' There was a little hesitation in Emma's answer. "'Oh, yes, very, a very pleasing young woman.' "'I think her beautiful, quite beautiful.' "'Very nicely dressed, indeed, a remarkably elegant gown.' "'I am not at all surprised that he should have fallen in love.' No, no, there is nothing to surprise one at all. A pretty fortune, and she came in his way." "'I dare say,' returned Harriet, sighing again, "'I dare say she was very much attached to him.' "'Perhaps she might, but it is not every man's fate to marry the woman who loves him best. Miss Hawkins perhaps wanted a home, and thought this the very best offer she was likely to have." "'Yes,' said Harriet earnestly. And well she might, nobody could ever have a better. Well, I wish them happy with all my heart. And now, Miss Woodhouse, I do not think I shall mind seeing them again. He is just as superior as ever. But being married, you know, it is quite a different thing. No, indeed, Miss Woodhouse, you need not be afraid. I can sit and admire him now without any great misery. To know that he has not thrown himself away is such a comfort. She does seem a charming young woman, just what he deserves happy creature! He called her Augusta. How delightful!" When the visit was returned, Emma made up her mind. She could then see more, and judge better. From Harriet's happening not to be at Hartfield, and her father's being present to engage Mr. Elton, she had a quarter of an hour of the lady's conversation to herself, and could composedly attend to her and the quarter of an hour quite convinced her that Mrs. Elton was a vain woman, extremely well satisfied with herself, and thinking much of her own importance, that she meant to shine and be very superior, but with manners which had been formed in a bad school, pert and familiar, that all her notions were drawn from one set of people, and one style of living, that if not foolish, she was ignorant, and that her society would certainly do Mr. Elton no good. Harriet would have been a better match. If not wise or refined herself, she would have connected him with those who were. But Miss Hawkins, it might be fairly supposed from her easy conceit, had been the best of her own set. The rich brother-in-law near Bristol was the pride of the alliance, and his place and his carriages were the pride of him. The very first subject, after being seated, was Maple Grove. "'My brother Mr. Suckling's seat!' a comparison of Hartfield to Maple Grove. The grounds of Hartfield were small, but neat and pretty, and the house was modern and well built. Mrs. Elton seemed most favourably impressed by the size of the room, the entrance, and all that she could see or imagine. "'Very like Maple Grove, indeed. She was quite struck by the likeness. That room was the very shape and size of the morning-room at Maple Grove, her sister's favourite room,' Mr. Elton was appealed to. "'Was it not astonishingly like? She could really almost fancy herself at Maple Grove.' And the staircase! You know, as I came in, I observed how very like the staircase was, placed exactly in the same part of the house. I really could not help exclaiming. I assure you, Miss Woodhouse, it is very delightful to me to be reminded of a place I am so extremely partial to as Maple Grove. I have spent so many happy months there," with a little sigh of sentiment. A charming place, undoubtedly. Everybody who sees it is struck by its beauty, but to me it has been quite a home. Whenever you are transplanted, like me, Miss Woodhouse, you will understand how very delightful it is to meet with anything at all like what one has left behind. I always say this is quite one of the evils of matrimony." Emma made as slight a reply as she could, but it was fully sufficient for Mrs. Elton, who only wanted to be talking herself so extremely like Maple Grove, and it is not merely the house. The grounds, I assure you, as far as I could observe, are strikingly like. 
The laurels at Maple Grove are in the same profusion as here, and stand very much in the same way, just across the lawn, and I had a glimpse of a fine, large tree, with a bench round it, which put me so exactly in mind. My brother and sister will be enchanted with this place. People who have extensive grounds themselves are always pleased with anything in the same style." Emma doubted the truth of this sentiment. She had a great idea that people who had extensive grounds themselves cared very little for extensive grounds of anybody else, but it was not worth while to attack an error so double-dyed, and therefore only said in reply, "'When you have seen more of this country, I am afraid you will think you have overrated Hartfield. Surrey is full of beauties." "'Oh, yes, I am quite aware of that. It is the garden of England, you know. Surrey is the garden of England." "'Yes, but we must not rest our claims on that distinction. Many counties, I believe, are called the garden of England, as well as Surrey." "'No, I fancy not,' said Mrs. Elton, with a most satisfied smile. "'I never heard any county but Surrey called so." Emma was silenced. "'My brother and sister have promised us a visit in the spring, or summer at farthest,' continued Mrs. Elton, "'and that will be our time for exploring. While they are with us, we shall explore a great deal, I dare say. They will have their barouche landau, of course, which holds four perfectly, and therefore, without saying anything of our carriage, we should be able to explore the different beauties extremely well. They would hardly come in their shares, I think, at that season of the year. Indeed, when the time draws on, I shall decidedly recommend their bringing the barouche landau. It will be so very much preferable. When people come into a beautiful country of this sort, you know, Miss Woodhouse, one naturally wishes them to see as much as possible, and Mr. Suckling is extremely fond of exploring. We explored to King's Weston twice last summer, in that way, most delightfully, just after their first having the barouche landau. You have many parties of that kind here, I suppose, Miss Woodhouse, every summer?" No, not immediately here. We are rather out of distance of the very striking beauties which attract the sort of parties you speak of, and we are a very quiet set of people, I believe, more disposed to stay at home than engage in schemes of pleasure. Ah, there is nothing like staying at home for real comfort. Nobody can be more devoted to home than I am. I was quite a proverb for it at Maple Grove. Many a time has Selina said, when she has been going to Bristol, I really cannot get this girl to move from the house. I absolutely must go in by myself, though I hate being stuck up in the barouche landau without a companion. But Augusta, I believe, with her own good will, would never stir beyond the park paling. Many a time has she said so, and yet I am no advocate for entire seclusion. I think, on the contrary, when people shut themselves up entirely from society, it is a very bad thing, and that it is much more advisable to mix in the world in a proper degree, without living in it either too much or too little. I perfectly understand your situation, however, Miss Woodhouse," looking towards Mr. Woodhouse. Your father's state of health must be a great drawback. Why does not he try Bath? Indeed he should. Let me recommend Bath to you. I assure you I have no doubt of its doing Mr. Woodhouse good." My father tried it more than once, formally, but without receiving any benefit. And Mr. Perry, whose name I dare say is not unknown to you, does not conceive it would be at all more likely to be useful now. Ah, that's a great pity, for I assure you, Miss Woodhouse, when the waters do agree, it is quite wonderful the relief they give. In my bath life I have seen such instances of it, and it is so cheerful a place that it could not fail of being of use to Mr. Woodhouse's spirits, which I understand are sometimes much depressed. And as to its recommendations to you, I fancy I need not take much pains to dwell on them. The advantages of Bath to the young are pretty generally understood. It would be a charming introduction for you, who have lived so secluded a life, and I could immediately secure you some of the best society in the place. A line from me would bring you a little host of acquaintance, and my particular friend, Mrs. Partridge, the lady I have always resided with when in Bath, would be most happy to show you any attentions, and would be the very person for you to go into public with." It was as much as Emma could bear without being impolite. The idea of her being indebted to Mrs. Elton for what was called an introduction, of her going into public under the auspices of a friend of Mrs. Elton's, 
probably some vulgar, dashing widow, who, with the help of a boarder, just made a shift to live. The dignity of Miss Woodhouse of Hartfield was sunk indeed. She restrained herself, however, from any of the reproofs she could have given, and only thanked Mrs. Elton coolly. But their going to Bath was quite out of the question, and she was not perfectly convinced that the place might suit her better than her father. And then, to prevent farther outrage and indignation, changed the subject directly. "'I do not ask whether you are musical, Mrs. Elton. Upon these occasions a lady's character generally precedes her, and Highbury has long known that you are a superior performer.' "'Oh, no, indeed! I must protest against any such idea. A superior performer! Very far from it, I assure you. Consider from how partial a quarter your information came. I am dotingly fond of music, passionately fond, and my friends say I am not entirely devoid of taste. But as to anything else, upon my honour my performance is mediocre to the last degree. You, Miss Woodhouse, I well know, play delightfully. I assure you it has been the greatest satisfaction, comfort, and delight to me, to hear what a musical society I am got into. I absolutely cannot do without music. It is a necessary of life to me, and having always been used to a very musical society, both at Maple Grove and in Bath, it would have been a most serious sacrifice. I honestly said as much to Mr. E. when he was speaking of my future home, and expressing his fears lest the retirement of it should be disagreeable, and the inferiority of the house, too, knowing what I had been accustomed to, of course he was not wholly without apprehension. When he was speaking of it in that way, I honestly said that the world I could give up—parties, balls, plays—for I had no fear of retirement. Blessed with so many resources within myself, the world was not necessary to me. I could do very well without it. To those who had no resources it was a different thing. But my resources made me quite independent. And as to smaller-sized rooms than I had been used to, I really could not give it a thought. I hoped I was perfectly equal to any sacrifice of that description. Certainly I had been accustomed to every luxury at Maple Grove. But I did assure him that two carriages were not necessary to my happiness, nor were spacious apartments. But, said I, to be quite honest, I do not think I can live without something of a musical society. I condition for nothing else, but without music life would be a blank to me." "'We cannot suppose,' said Emma, smiling, "'that Mr. Elton would hesitate to assure you of there being a very musical society in Highbury and I hope you'll not find he has outstepped the truth more than may be pardoned, in consideration of the motive." "'No, indeed, I have no doubts at all on that head. I am delighted to find myself in such a circle. I hope we shall have many sweet little concerts together. I think, Miss Woodhouse, you and I must establish a musical club, and have regular weekly meetings at your house, or ours. Will not it be a good plan? If we exert ourselves, I think we shall not be long in want of allies. Something of that nature would be particularly desirable for me, as an inducement to keep me in practice. For married women, you know, there is a sad story against them in general. They are but too apt to give up music." "'But you, who are so extremely fond of it, there can be no danger, surely." "'I should hope not. But really, when I look around among my acquaintance, I tremble. Selina has entirely given up music, never touches the instrument, though she played sweetly. And the same may be said of Mrs. Jeffreys, Clara Partridge that was, and of the two Milmans, now Mrs. Bird and Mrs. James Cooper, and of more than I can enumerate. Upon my word, it is enough to put one in a fright. I used to be quite angry with Selina, but really I begin now to comprehend that a married woman has many things to call her attention. I believe I was half an hour this morning shut up with my housekeeper." "'But everything of that kind,' said Emma, "'will soon be in so regular a train." "'Well,' said Mrs. Elton, laughing, "'we shall see." Emma, finding her so determined upon neglecting her music, had nothing more to say and after a moment's pause Mrs. Elton chose another subject. "'We have been calling at Randalls,' said she, "'and found them both at home, and very pleasant people they seem to be. I like them extremely. Mr. Weston seems an excellent creature, quite a first-rate favourite with me already, I assure you. And she appears so truly good. There is something so motherly and so kind-hearted about her, that it wins upon one directly. 
She was your governess, I think." Emma was almost too much astonished to answer, but Mrs. Elton hardly waited for the affirmative before she went on. Having understood as much, I was rather astonished to find her so very ladylike. But really she is quite the gentlewoman." "'Mrs. Weston's manners,' said Emma, "'were always particularly good. Their propriety, simplicity, and elegance would make them the safest model for any young woman.' "'And who do you think came in while we were there?' Emma was quite at a loss. The tone implied some old acquaintance, and how could she possibly guess? "'Nightly!' continued Mrs. Elton. "'Nightly himself! Was not it lucky? For not being within when he called the other day, I had never seen him before, and of course as so particular a friend of Mr. E.'s, I had a great curiosity. My friend Knightley had been so often mentioned, that I was really impatient to see him, and I must do my caro sposo the justice to say, that he not be ashamed of his friend. Knightley is quite the gentleman. I like him very much. Decidedly, I think, a very gentlemanlike man." Happily, it was now time to be gone. They were off, and Emma could breathe. "'Insufferable woman!' was her immediate exclamation worse than I had supposed, absolutely insufferable. Nightly! I could not have believed it. Nightly! Never seen him in her life before, and call him Nightly, and discover that he is a gentleman, a little upstart, vulgar being, with her Mr. E., and her caro sposo, and her resources, and all her airs of pert pretension and underbred finery actually to discover that Mr. Knightley is a gentleman. I doubt whether he will return the compliment and discover her to be a lady. I could not have believed it. And to propose that she and I should unite to form a musical club. One would fancy we were bosom friends. And Mrs. Weston, astonished that the person who had brought me up should be a gentlewoman. Worse and worse! I never met with her equal. Much beyond my hopes. Harriet is disgraced by any comparison. Oh, what would Frank Churchill say to her if he were here? How angry and how diverted he would be! Ah, there I am, thinking of him directly, always the first person to be thought of. How I catch myself out! Frank Churchill comes as regularly into my mind." All this ran so glibly through her thoughts, that by the time her father had arranged himself after the bustle of the Elton's departure, and was ready to speak, she was very tolerably capable of attending. "'Well, my dear,' he deliberately began, "'considering we never saw her before, she seems a very pretty sort of young lady, and I dare say she was much pleased with you. She speaks a little too quick. A little quickness of voice there is, which rather hurts the ear. But I believe I am nice. I do not like strange voices, and nobody speaks like you and poor Miss Taylor. However, she seems a very obliging, pretty-behaved young lady, and no doubt will make him a very good wife. Though I think he had better not have married. I made the best excuses I could for not having been able to wait on him and Mrs. Elton on this happy occasion. I said that I hoped I should in the course of the summer. But I ought to have gone before. Not to wait upon a bride is very remiss. Oh, it shows what a sad invalid I am. But I do not like the corner into Vicarage Lane." "'I dare say your apologies were accepted, sir. Mr. Elton knows you.' "'Yes. But a young lady, a bride. I ought to have paid my respects to her, if possible. It was being very deficient." "'But, my dear papa, you are no friend to matrimony. And therefore, why should you be so anxious to pay your respects to a bride? It ought to be no recommendation to you. It is encouraging people to marry, if you make so much of them." "'No, my dear. I never encouraged anybody to marry. But I would always wish to pay every proper attention to a lady, and a bride especially is never to be neglected. More is avowedly due to her. A bride, you know, my dear, is always the first in company, let the others be who they may." Well, papa, if this is not encouragement to marry, I do not know what is. And I should never have expected you to be lending your sanction to such vanity-baits for poor young ladies." My dear, you do not understand me. This is a matter of mere common politeness and good breeding, and has nothing to do with any encouragement to people to marry." 
Emma had done. Her father was growing nervous, and could not understand her. Her mind returned to Mrs. Elton's offences, and long, very long, did they occupy her. End of chapter 14 Volume 2, Chapter 15 of Emma This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Emma by Jane Austen. Volume 2, Chapter 15. Emma was not required by any subsequent discovery to retract her ill opinion of Mrs. Elton. Her observation had been pretty correct. Such as Mrs. Elton appeared to her on this second interview, such she appeared whenever they met again self important, presuming, familiar, ignorant, and ill bred. She had a little beauty and a little accomplishment, but so little judgment that she thought herself coming with superior knowledge of the world to enliven and improve a country neighbourhood, and conceived Miss Hawkins to have held such a place in society as Mrs. Elton's consequence only could surpass. There was no reason to suppose Mr. Elton thought at all differently from his wife. He seemed not merely happy with her, but proud. He had the air of congratulating himself on having brought such a woman to Highbury as not even Miss Woodhouse could equal, and the greater part of her new acquaintance, disposed to commend, or not in the habit of judging, followed the lead of Miss Bates's good will, or taking it for granted that the bride must be as clever and as agreeable as she professed herself, were very well satisfied, so that Mrs. Elton's praise passed from one mouth to another as it ought to do, unimpeded by Miss Woodhouse who readily continued her first contribution, and talked with a very good grace of her being very pleasant, and very elegantly dressed. In one respect Mrs. Elton grew even worse than she had at first appeared. Her feelings altered toward Emma. Offended, probably, by the little encouragement which her proposals of intimacy met with, she drew back in her turn, and gradually became much more cold and distant. And though the effect was agreeable, the ill-will which produced it was necessarily increasing Emma's dislike. Her manners, too, and Mr. Elton's, were unpleasant towards Harriet. They were sneering and negligent. Emma hoped it must rapidly work Harriet's cure, but the sensations which could prompt such behaviour sunk them both very much. It was not to be doubted that poor Harriet's attachment had been an offering to conjugal unreserve, and her own share in the story, under a colouring the least favourable to her and the most soothing to him, had in all likelihood been given also. She was, of course, the object of their joint dislike. When they had nothing else to say, it must be always easy to begin abusing Miss Woodhouse, and the enmity which they dared not show in open disrespect to her, found a broader vent in contemptuous treatment of Harriet. Mrs. Elton took a great fancy to Jane Fairfax, and from the first. Not merely when a state of warfare with one young lady might be supposed to recommend the other, but from the very first. And she was not satisfied with expressing a natural and reasonable admiration, but without solicitation, or plea, or privilege, she must be wanting to assist and befriend her. Before Emma had forfeited her confidence, and about the third time of their meeting, she heard all Mrs. Elton's knight-errantry on the subject. Jane Fairfax is absolutely charming, Miss Woodhouse. I quite rave about Jane Fairfax. A sweet, interesting creature, so mild and ladylike, and with such talents. I assure you I think she has very extraordinary talents. I do not scruple to say that she plays extremely well. I know enough of music to speak decidedly on that point. Oh, she is absolutely charming. You will laugh at my warmth, but upon my word I talk of nothing but Jane Fairfax, and her situation is so calculated to affect one. Miss Woodhouse, we must exert ourselves and endeavour to do something for her. We must bring her forward. Such talent as hers must not be suffered to remain unknown. I dare say you have heard those charming lines of the poet, Full many a flower is born to blush unseen, and waste its fragrance on the desert air. We must not allow them to be verified in sweet Jane Fairfax." "'I cannot think there is any danger of it,' was Emma's calm answer. "'And when you are better acquainted with Miss Fairfax's situation, and understand what her home has been, with Colonel and Mrs. Campbell, I have no idea that you will suppose her talents can be unknown.' 
oh, but dear Miss Woodhouse, she is now in such retirement, such obscurity, so thrown away. Whatever advantages she may have enjoyed with the Campbells are so palpably at an end. And I think she feels it. I am sure she does. She is very timid and silent. One can see that she feels the want of encouragement. I like her the better for it. I must confess it is a recommendation to me. I am a great advocate for timidity, and I am sure one does not often meet with it. But in those who are at all inferior, it is extremely prepossessing. Oh, I assure you, Jane Fairfax is a very delightful character, and interests me more than I can express. You appear to feel a great deal. But I am not aware how you, or any of Miss Fairfax's acquaintance here, any of those who have known her longer than yourself, can show her any other attention than, My dear Miss Woodhouse, a vast deal may be done by those who dare to act. You and I need not be afraid. If we set the example, many will follow it as far as they can, though all have not our situations. We have carriages to fetch and convey her home, and we live in a style which could not make the addition of Jane Fairfax at any time the least inconvenient. I should be extremely displeased if Wright were to send us up such a dinner as could make me regret having asked more than Jane Fairfax to partake of it. I have no idea of that sort of thing. It is not likely that I should, considering what I have been used to. My greatest danger, perhaps, in housekeeping may be quite the other way, in doing too much, and being too careless of expense. Maple Grove will probably be my model more than it ought to be, for we do not at all affect to equal my brother, Mr. Suckling, in income. However my resolution is taken as to noticing Jane Fairfax, I shall certainly have her very often at my house, shall introduce her wherever I can, shall have musical parties to draw out her talents, and shall be constantly on the watch for an eligible situation. My acquaintance is so very extensive, that I have little doubt of hearing of something to suit her shortly. I shall introduce her, of course, very particularly to my brother and sister when they come to us. I am sure they shall like her extremely, and when she gets a little acquainted with them, her fears will completely wear off, for there really is nothing in the manners of either but what is highly conciliating. I shall have her very often indeed while they are with me, and I dare say we shall sometimes find a seat for her in the barouche Landau, in some of our exploring parties." Poor Jane Fairfax, thought Emma you have not deserved this. You may have done wrong with regard to Mr. Dixon, but this is a punishment beyond what you could have merited. The kindness and protection of Mrs. Elton! Jane Fairfax, and Jane Fairfax! Heavens! Let me not suppose that she dares go about Emma Woodhousing me. But upon my honour, there seems no limits to the licentiousness of that woman's tongue." Emma had not to listen to such paradings again, to any so exclusively addressed to herself, so disgustingly decorated with a dear Miss Woodhouse. The change on Mrs. Elton's side soon afterwards appeared, and she was left in peace, neither forced to be the very particular friend of Mrs. Elton, nor, under Mrs. Elton's guidance, the very active patroness of Jane Fairfax, and only sharing with others in a general way, in knowing what was felt, what was mediated, what was done. She looked on with some amusement. Miss Bates's gratitude for Mrs. Elton's attentions to Jane was in the first style of guileless simplicity and warmth. She was quite one of her worthies, the most amiable, affable, delightful woman, just as accomplished and condescending as Mrs. Elton meant to be considered. Emma's only surprise was that Jane Fairfax should accept those attentions, and tolerate Mrs. Elton as she seemed to do. She heard of her walking with the Eltons, sitting with the Eltons, spending a day with the Eltons. This was astonishing. She could not have believed it possible that the taste or the pride of Miss Fairfax could endure such society and friendship as the vicarage had to offer. "'She is a riddle, quite a riddle,' said she. "'To choose to remain here month after month, under privations of every sort, and now to choose the mortification of Mrs. Elton's notice, and the penury of her conversation, rather than return to the superior companions who have always loved her, with such real generous affection." Jane had come to Highbury professedly for three months. The Campbells were gone to Ireland for three months. But now the Campbells had promised their daughter to stay at least till midsummer, and fresh invitations had arrived for her to join them there. According to Miss Bates, it came all from her, Mrs. Dixon had written most pressingly. Would Jane but go, means were to be found, servants sent, friends contrived, no travelling difficulty allowed to exist. 
but still she had declined it. She must have some great motive, more powerful than appears, for refusing this invitation, was Emma's conclusion. She must be under some sort of penance, inflicted either by the Campbells or herself. There is great fear, great caution, great resolution somewhere. She is not to be with the Dixons. The decree is issued by somebody. But why must she consent to be with the Eltons? Here is quite a separate puzzle." Upon her speaking her wonder aloud on that part of the subject, before the few who knew her opinion of Mrs. Elton, Mrs. Weston ventured this apology for Jane. "'We cannot suppose that she has any great enjoyment at the vicarage, my dear Emma, but it is better than being always at home. Her aunt is a good creature, but as a constant companion must be very tiresome. We must consider what Miss Fairfax quits, before we condemn her taste for what she goes to.' "'You are right, Mrs. Weston,' said Mr. Knightley warmly. Miss Fairfax is as capable as any of us of forming a just opinion of Mrs. Elton. Could she have chosen with whom to associate, she would not have chosen her. But, with a reproachful smile at Emma, she receives attentions from Mrs. Elton, which nobody else pays her." Emma felt that Mrs. Weston was giving her a momentary glance, and she was herself struck by his warmth. With a faint blush, she presently replied. Such attentions as Mrs. Elton's, I should have imagined, would rather disgust than gratify Miss Fairfax. Mrs. Elton's invitations I should have imagined anything but inviting." "'I should not wonder,' said Mrs. Weston, if Miss Fairfax were to have been drawn on beyond her own inclination, by her aunt's eagerness in accepting Mrs. Elton's civilities for her. Poor Miss Bates may very likely have committed her niece, and hurried her into a greater appearance of intimacy than her own good sense would have dictated, in spite of the very natural wish of a little change." Both felt rather anxious to hear him speak again, and after a few minutes' silence he said, "'Another thing must be taken into consideration, too. Mrs. Elton does not talk to Miss Fairfax, as she speaks of her. We all know the difference between the pronouns he or she and thou, the plainest spoken amongst us. We all feel the influence of a something beyond common civility in our personal intercourse with each other, a something more early implanted. We cannot give anybody the disagreeable hint that we may have been very full of the hour before. We feel things differently. And besides the operation of this as a general principle, you may be sure that Miss Fairfax awes Mrs. Elton by her superiority both of mind and manner, and that face to face Mrs. Elton treats her with all the respect which she has a claim to. Such a woman as Jane Fairfax probably never fell in Mrs. Elton's way before, and no degree of vanity can prevent her acknowledging her own comparative littleness in action, if not in consciousness." "'I know how highly you think of Jane Fairfax,' said Emma. Little Henry was in her thoughts, and a mixture of alarm and delicacy made her irresolute what else to say. "'Yes,' he replied. "'Anybody may know how highly I think of her.' "'And yet,' said Emma, beginning hastily and with an arch look, but soon stopping. It was better, however, to know the worst at once. She hurried on. "'And yet, perhaps, you may hardly be aware yourself how highly it is. The extent of your admiration may take you by surprise some day or other." Mr. Knightley was hard at work upon the lower buttons of his thick leather gaiters, and either the exertion of getting them together, or some other cause, brought the colour into his face as he answered, "'Oh, are you there? But you are miserably behind hand. Mr. Cole gave me a hint of it six weeks ago.' He stopped. Emma felt her foot pressed by Mrs. Weston, and did not herself know what to think. In a moment he went on. "'That will never be, however, I can assure you. Miss Fairfax, I dare say, would not have me if I were to ask her, and I am very sure I shall never ask her.' Emma returned her friend's pressure with interest, and was pleased enough to exclaim, "'You are not vain, Mr. Knightley. I will say that for you.' He seemed hardly to hear her. He was thoughtful, and in a manner which showed him not pleased, soon afterwards said, so you have been settling that I should marry Jane Fairfax?" "'No, indeed, I have not. You have scolded me too much for matchmaking to presume to take such a liberty with you. What I said just now meant nothing. One says those sorts of things, of course, without any idea of a serious meaning. Oh, no! Upon my word, I have not the smallest wish for your marrying Jane Fairfax, or Jane anybody. You would not come in and sit with us in this comfortable way if you were married." Mr. Knightley was thoughtful again. The result of his reverie was, "'No, Emma, 
I do not think the extent of my admiration for her will ever take me by surprise. I never had a thought of her in that way, I assure you." And soon afterwards, Jane Fairfax is a very charming young woman, but not even Jane Fairfax is perfect. She has a fault. She has not the open temper which a man would wish for in a wife. Emma could not but rejoice to hear that she had a fault. Well, said she, and you soon silence Mr. Cole, I suppose. Yes, very soon. He gave me a quiet hint. I told him he was mistaken. He asked my pardon and said no more. Cole does not want to be wiser or wittier than his neighbours. In that respect, how unlike dear Mrs. Elton, who wants to be wiser and wittier than all the world! I wonder how she speaks of the Coles, and what she calls them. How can she find any appellation for them, deep enough in familiar vulgarity? She calls you knightly. What can she do for Mr. Cole? And so I am not to be surprised that Jane Fairfax accepts her civilities and consents to be with her. Mrs. Weston, your argument weighs most with me. I can much more readily enter the temptation of getting away from Miss Bates, than I can believe in the triumph of Miss Fairfax's mind over Mrs. Elton. I have no faith in Mrs. Elton's acknowledging herself the inferior in thought, word, or deed, or in her being under any restraint beyond her own scanty rule of good breeding. I cannot imagine that she will not be continually insulting her visitor with praise, encouragement, and offers of service, that she will not be continually detailing her magnificent intentions, from the procuring her a permanent situation, to the including her in those delightful exploring parties which are to take place in the barouche Landau. Jane Fairfax has feeling," said Mr. Knightley. I do not accuse her of wanting feeling. Her sensibilities, I suspect, are strong, and her temper excellent in its power of forbearance, patience, self-control, but it wants openness. She is reserved, more reserved, I think, than she used to be, and I love an open temper. No, till Cole alluded to my supposed attachment, it had never entered my head. I saw Jane Fairfax, and conversed with her, with admiration and pleasure always, but with no thought beyond." "'Well, Mrs. Weston,' said Emma triumphantly, when he left them, "'what do you say now to Mr. Knightley's marrying Jane Fairfax?' "'Why, really, dear Emma, I say that he is so very much occupied by the idea of not being in love with her, that I should not wonder if it were to end with his being so at last. Do not beat me.' End of chapter 15 Volume 2, chapter 16 of Emma This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett Emma by Jane Austen Volume 2, chapter 16 Everybody in and about Highbury, who had ever visited Mr. Elton, was disposed to pay him attention on his marriage. Dinner-parties and evening-parties were made for him and his lady, and invitations flowed in so fast, that she soon had the pleasure of apprehending they were never to have a disengaged day. "'I see how it is,' said she. "'I see what a life I am to lead among you. Upon my word, we shall be absolutely dissipated. We really seem quite the fashion. If this is living in the country, it is nothing very formidable. From Monday next to Saturday, I assure you we have not a disengaged day. A woman with fewer resources than I have need not have been at a loss." No invitation came amiss to her. Her bath habits made evening parties perfectly natural to her, and Maple Grove had given her a taste for dinners. She was a little shocked at the want of two drawing-rooms, at the poor attempt at rout-cakes, and there being no ice in the Highbury card-parties. Mrs. Bates, Mrs. Perry, Mrs. Goddard, and others were a good deal behind hand in knowledge of the world, but she would soon show them how everything ought to be arranged. In the course of the spring she must return their civilities by one very superior party, in which her card-tables should be set out with their separate candles and unbroken packs in the true style, and more waiters engaged for the evening than their own establishment could furnish, to carry round the refreshments at exactly the proper hour and in the proper order. Emma, in the meanwhile, could not be satisfied without a dinner at Hartfield for the Eltons. They must not do less than others, or should be exposed to odious suspicions, and imagined capable of pitiful resentment. A dinner there must be. After Emma had talked about it for ten minutes, Mr. Woodhouse felt no unwillingness, and only made the usual stipulation of not sitting at the bottom of the table himself, with the usual regular difficulty of deciding who should do it for him. 
The persons to be invited required little thought. Besides the Eltons it must be the Westons and Mr. Knightley. So far it was all, of course, and it was hardly less inevitable that poor little Harriet must be asked to make the eighth. But this invitation was not given with equal satisfaction, and on many accounts Emma was particularly pleased by Harriet's begging to be allowed to decline it. She would rather not be in his company more than she could help. She was not yet quite able to see him and his charming happy wife together, without feeling uncomfortable. If Miss Woodhouse would not be displeased, she would rather stay at home." It was precisely what Emma would have wished, had she deemed it possible enough for wishing. She was delighted with the fortitude of her little friend. For fortitude she knew it was in her to give up being in company and stay at home, and she could now invite the very person whom she really wanted to make the eighth, Jane Fairfax. Since her last conversation with Mrs. Weston and Mr. Knightley, she was more conscience-stricken about Jane Fairfax than she had often been. Mr. Knightley's words dwelt with her. He had said that Jane Fairfax received attentions from Mrs. Elton, which nobody else paid her. "'This is very true,' said she. "'At least as far as relates to me, which was all that was meant. And it is very shameful. Of the same age, and always knowing her, I ought to have been more her friend. She will never like me now. I have neglected her too long. But I will show her greater attention than I have done.' Every invitation was successful. They were all disengaged, and all happy. The preparatory interest of this dinner, however, was not yet over. A circumstance rather unlucky occurred. The two eldest little Knightleys were engaged to pay their grandpapa and aunt a visit of some weeks in the spring, and their papa now proposed bringing them, and staying one whole day at Hartfield, which one day would be the very day of this party. His professional engagements did not allow of its being put off, but both father and daughter were disturbed by its happening so. Mr. Woodhouse considered eight persons at dinner together as the utmost that his nerves could bear, and here would be a ninth. And Emma apprehended it would be ninth very much out of humour at not being able to come even to Hartfield for forty-eight hours, without falling in with a dinner-party. She comforted her father better than she could comfort herself, by representing that though he certainly would make them nine, yet he always said so little, that the increase of noise would be very immaterial. She thought it in reality a sad exchange for herself, to have him, with his grave looks and reluctant conversation, opposed to her, instead of his brother. The event was more favourable to Mr. Woodhouse than to Emma. John Knightley came, but Mr. Weston was unexpectedly summoned to town and must be absent on the very day. He might be able to join them in the evening, but certainly not to dinner. Mr. Woodhouse was quite at ease, and the seeing him so, with the arrival of the little boys and the philosophic composure of her brother on hearing his fate, removed the chief of even Emma's vexation. The day came, the party were punctually assembled, and Mr. John Knightley seemed early to devote himself to the business of being agreeable. Instead of drawing his brother off to a window while they waited for dinner, he was talking to Miss Fairfax. Mrs. Elton, as elegant as lace and pearls could make her, he looked at in silence, wanting only to observe enough for Isabella's information. But Miss Fairfax was an old acquaintance and a quiet girl, and he could talk to her. He had met her before breakfast as he was returning from a walk with his little boys, when it had been just beginning to rain. It was natural to have some civil hopes on the subject, and he said, "'I hope you did not venture far, Miss Fairfax, this morning, or I am sure you must have been wet. We scarcely got home in time. I hope you turned directly." "'I went only to the post-office,' said she, and reached home before the rain was much. It is my daily errand. I always fetch the letters when I am here. It saves trouble, and is a something to get me out. A walk before breakfast does me good." "'Not a walk in the rain, I should imagine?" "'No. But it did not absolutely rain when I set out.' Mr. John Knightley smiled, and replied, that is to say, you chose to have your walk, for you were not six yards from your own door when I had the pleasure of meeting you, and Henry and John had seen more drops than they could count long before. The post-office has a great charm at one period of our lives. When you have lived to my age, you will begin to think letters are never worth going through the rain for." There is a little blush, and then this answer. I must not hope to ever be situated as you are, in the midst of every dearest connection and therefore I cannot expect that simply growing older should make me indifferent about letters." "'Indifferent? Oh, no! I never conceived you could become indifferent. Letters are no matter of indifference. They are generally a very positive curse." "'You are speaking of letters of business. Mine are letters of friendship." 
I have often thought of the worst of the two, replied he coolly. Business, you know, may bring money, but friendship hardly ever does. Ah, you are not serious now. I know Mr. John Knightley too well. I am very sure he understands the value of friendship as well as anybody. I can easily believe that letters are very little to you, much less than to me. But it is not your being ten years older than myself which makes the difference. It is not age, but situation. You have everybody dearest to you always at hand. I probably never shall again. And therefore, till I have outlived all my affections, a post-office, I think, must always have power to draw me out, in worse weather than to-day." "'When I talked of your being altered by time, by the progress of years,' said John Knightley, I meant to imply the change of situation which time usually brings. I consider one as including the other. Time will generally lessen the interest of every attachment not within the daily circle. But that is not the change I had in view for you. As an old friend, you will allow me to hope, Miss Fairfax, that ten years hence, you may have as many concentrated objects as I have." It was kindly said, and very far from giving offence. A pleasant, thank you, seemed meant to laugh it off. But a blush, a quivering lip, a tear in the eye, showed that it was felt beyond a laugh. Her attention was now claimed by Mr. Woodhouse, who being, according to his custom on such occasions, making the circle of his guests, and paying his particular compliment to the ladies, was ending with her, and with all his mildest urbanity said, "'I am very sorry to hear, Miss Fairfax, of your being out this morning in the rain. Young ladies should take care of themselves. Young ladies are delicate plants. They should take care of their health and their complexion. My dear, did you change your stockings?" "'Yes, sir, I did indeed, and I am very much obliged by your kind solicitude about me." "'My dear Miss Fairfax, young ladies are very sure to be cared for. I hope your good grandmamma and aunt are well. They are some of my very old friends. I wish that my health allowed me to be a better neighbour. You do us a great deal of honour to-day, I am sure. My daughter and I are both highly sensible of your goodness, and have the greatest satisfaction in seeing you at Hartfield." The kind-hearted, polite old man might then sit down and feel that he had done his duty, and made every fair lady welcome and easy. By this time the walk in the rain had reached Mrs. Elton, and her remonstrances now opened upon Jane. "'My dear Jane, what is this I hear? Going to the post-office in the rain? This must not be, I assure you. You sad girl! How could you do such a thing? It is a sign I was not there to take care of you.' Jane very patiently assured her that she had not caught any cold. "'Oh, do not tell me! You really are a very sad girl, and do not know how to take care of yourself. To the post-office, indeed! Mrs. Weston, did you ever hear the like? You and I must positively exert our authority.' "'My advice,' said Mrs. Weston, kindly and persuasively, "'I certainly do feel tempted to give. Miss Fairfax, you must not run such risks. Liable as you have been to severe colds, indeed you ought to be particularly careful especially at this time of year. The spring, I always think, requires more than common care. Better wait an hour or two, or even half a day for your letters, than run the risk of bringing on your cough again. Now, do you not feel that you had? Yes, I am sure you are much too reasonable. You look as if you would not do such a thing again." "'Oh, she shall not do such a thing again!' eagerly rejoined Mrs. Elton. "'We will not allow her to do such a thing again!' And nodding significantly. There must be some arrangement made, there must indeed. I shall speak to Mr. E., the man who fetches our letters every morning. One of our men, I forget his name, shall inquire for yours too, and bring them to you. That will obviate all difficulties, you know, and from us I really think, my dear Jane, you can have no scruple to accept such an accommodation." "'You are extremely kind,' said Jane. But I cannot give up my early walk. I am advised to be out of doors as much as I can. I must walk somewhere, and the post-office is an object, and upon my word I have scarcely ever had a bad morning before." "'My dear Jane, say no more about it. The thing is determined, that is," laughing affectedly, as far as I can presume to determine anything without the concurrence of my lord and master. You know, Mrs. Weston, you and I must be cautious about how we express ourselves. 
But I do flatter myself, my dear Jane, that my influence is not entirely worn out. If I meet with no insuperable difficulties, therefore, consider that point as settled." "'Excuse me,' said Jane, earnestly. I cannot by any means consent to such an arrangement, so needlessly troublesome to your servant. If the errand were not a pleasure to me, it could be done, as it always is when I am not here, by my grandmamma's. Oh, my dear, but so much as Patty has to do, and it is a kindness to employ our men." Jane looked as if she did not mean to be conquered, but instead of answering, she began speaking again to Mr. John Knightley. "'The post-office is a wonderful establishment,' said she. "'The regularity and dispatch of it, if one thinks of all that it has to do, and all that it does so well, it is really astonishing." "'It certainly is very well regulated so seldom that any negligence or blunder appears, so seldom that a letter, among the thousands that are constantly passing about the kingdom, has even carried wrong, and not one in a million, I suppose, actually lost, and when one considers the variety of hands, and of bad hands, too, that are to be deciphered, it increases the wonder. The clerks grow expert from habit. They must begin with some quickness of sight and hand, and exercise improves them. If you want any farther explanation— continued he, smiling. They are paid for it. That is the key to a great deal of capacity. The public pays, and must be served well." The varieties of handwriting were farther talked of, and the usual observations made. "'I have heard it asserted,' said John Knightley, "'that the same sort of handwriting often prevails in a family, and where the same master teaches, it is natural enough. But for that reason, I should imagine the likeness must be chiefly confined to the females, for boys have very little teaching after an early age, and scramble into any hand they can get. Isabella and Emma, I think, do write very much alike. I have not always known their writing apart." "'Yes,' said his brother, hesitatingly. "'There is a likeness. I know what you mean. But Emma's hand is the strongest.' "'Isabella and Emma both write beautifully.' said Mr. Woodhouse, and always did. And so does poor Mrs. Weston," with half a sigh and half a smile at her. "'I never saw any gentleman's handwriting,' Emma began, looking also at Mrs. Weston, but stopped on perceiving that Mrs. Weston was attending to some one else, and the pause gave her time to reflect. "'Now, how am I going to introduce him? Am I unequal to speaking his name at once before all these people? Is it necessary for me to use any roundabout phrase? Your Yorkshire friend, your correspondent in Yorkshire, that would be the way, I suppose, if I were very bad. No, I can pronounce his name without the smallest distress. I suddenly get better and better. Now for it." Mrs. Weston was disengaged, and Emma began again. Mr. Frank Churchill writes one of the best gentleman's hands I ever saw. "'I do not admire it,' said Mr. Knightley. It is too small, wants strength. It is like a woman's writing." This was not submitted to by either lady. They vindicated him against the base aspersion. "'No, it by no means wanted strength. It was not a large hand, but very clear and certainly strong. Had not Mrs. Weston any letter about her to produce?' No, she had heard from him very lately, but having answered the letter, had put it away. "'If we were in the other room,' said Emma, if I had my writing-desk, I am sure I could produce a specimen. I have a note of his. Do not you remember Mrs. Weston employing him to write for you one day?" He chose to say he was employed. "'Well, well, I have that note, and can show it after dinner to convince Mr. Knightley." "'Oh! When a gallant young man like Mr. Frank Churchill,' said Mr. Knightley, dryly, "'writes to a fair lady like Miss Woodhouse, he will of course put forth his best.' Dinner was on table. Mrs. Elton, before she could be spoken to, was ready, and before Mr. Woodhouse had reached her with his request to be allowed to hand her into the dining-parlour, was saying, "'Must I go first? I really am ashamed of always leading the way.'" Jane's solicitude about fetching her own letters had not escaped Emma. She had heard and seen it all, and felt some curiosity to know whether the wet walk of this morning had produced any. She suspected that it had that it would not have been so resolutely encountered, but in full expectation of hearing from some one very dear, and that it had not been in vain. She thought there was an air of greater happiness than usual, a glow both of complexion and spirits. She could have made an inquiry or two as to the expedition and the expense of the Irish mails. It was at her tongue's end. 
but she abstained. She was quite determined not to utter a word that should hurt Jane Fairfax's feelings, and they followed the other ladies out of the room, arm in arm, with an appearance of good will highly becoming to the beauty and grace of each. End of chapter 16 Volume 2, Chapter 17 of Emma. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Emma by Jane Austen. Volume 2, Chapter 17. When the ladies returned to the drawing room after dinner, Emma found it hardly possible to prevent their making two distinct parties, with so much perseverance in judging and behaving ill did Mrs. Elton engross Jane Fairfax and slight herself. She and Mrs. Weston were obliged to be almost always either talking together, or silent together. Mrs. Elton left them no choice. If Jane repressed her for a little time, she soon began again. And though much that passed between them was in a half-whisper, especially on Mrs. Elton's side, there was no avoiding a knowledge of their principal subjects. The post-office, catching cold, fetching letters, and friendship were long under discussion and to them succeeded one, which must be at least equally unpleasant to Jane, inquiries whether she had yet heard of any situation likely to suit her, and professions of Mrs. Elton's meditated activity. "'Here is April come,' said she. "'I get quite anxious about you. June will soon be here.' "'But I have never fixed on June, or any other month, merely looked forward to the summer in general.' "'But have you really heard of nothing?' I have not even made any inquiry. I do not wish to make any yet. Oh, my dear, we cannot begin too early. You are not aware of the difficulty of procuring exactly the desirable thing." I not aware," said Jane, shaking her head. Dear Mrs. Elton, who can have thought of it as I have done? But you have not seen so much of the world as I have. You do not know how many candidates there always are for the first situations. I saw a vast deal of that in the neighbourhood round Maple Grove. A cousin of Mr. Suckling, Mrs. Bragg, had such an infinity of applications. Everybody was anxious to be in her family, for she moves in the first circle. Wax candles in the schoolroom. You may imagine how desirable. Of all houses in the kingdom, Mrs. Bragg's is the one I would most wish to see you in." "'Colonel and Mrs. Campbell are to be in town again by midsummer," said Jane. I must spend some time with them. I am sure they will want it. Afterwards I may probably be glad to dispose of myself, but I would not wish you to take the trouble of making any inquiries at present." "'Trouble! Ay, I know your scruples. You are afraid of giving me trouble. But I assure you, my dear Jane, the Campbells can hardly be more interested about you than I am. I shall write to Mrs. Partridge in a day or two, and shall give her strict charge to be on the lookout for anything eligible." Thank you, but I would rather you did not mention the subject to her. Till the time draws nearer, I do not wish to be giving anybody trouble." "'But, my dear child, the time is drawing near. Here is April and June, or say even July is very near, with such business to accomplish before us. Your inexperience really amuses me. A situation such as you deserve, and your friends would require for you, is no everyday occurrence, is not attained at a moment's notice. Indeed, indeed, we must begin inquiring directly." "'Excuse me, ma'am, but this is by no means my intention. I make no inquiry myself, and should be sorry to have any made by my friends. When I am quite determined as to the time, I am not at all afraid of being long unemployed. There are places in town offices, where inquiry would soon produce something. Offices for the sale, not quite of human flesh, but of human intellect." "'Oh, my dear! Human flesh! You quite shock me! If you mean a fling at the slave-trade, I assure you Mr. Suckling was always rather a friend to the abolition." "'I did not mean—I was not thinking of the slave-trade," replied Jane. "'Governess trade, I assure you, was all that I had in view widely different, certainly, as to the guilt of those who carry it on, but as to the greater misery of the victims, I do not know where it lies. But I only mean to say that there are advertising offices, and that by applying to them I should have no doubt of very soon meeting with something that would do." "'Something that would do!' repeated Mrs. Elton. 
Ay, that may suit your humble ideas of yourself. I know what a modest creature you are. But it will not satisfy your friends to have you taking up with anything that may offer, any inferior, commonplace situation, in a family not moving in a certain circle, or able to command the elegancies of life." "'You are very obliging. But as to all that, I am very indifferent. It would be no object to me to be with the rich. My mortifications, I think, would only be the greater. I should suffer more from comparison. A gentleman's family is all that I should condition for." I know you, I know you, you would take up with anything, but I shall be a little more nice, and I am sure that the good Campbells would be quite on my side. With your superior talents you have a right to move in the first circle. Your musical knowledge alone would entitle you to name your own terms, have as many rooms as you like, and mix in the family quite as much as you choose. That is, I do not know. If you knew the harp, you might do all that, I am very sure. But you sing as well as you play. Yes, I really believe you might, even without the harp, stipulate for what you chose. And you must and shall be delightfully, honourably, and comfortably settled, before the Campbells or I have any rest." "'You may well class the delight, the honour, and the comfort of such a situation together,' said Jane. They are pretty sure to be equal. However, I am very serious in not wishing anything to be attempted at present for me. I am exceedingly obliged to you, Mrs. Elton. I am obliged to anybody who feels for me. But I am quite serious in wishing nothing to be done till the summer. For two or three months longer I shall remain where I am, and as I am." "'And I am quite serious, too, I assure you,' replied Mrs. Elton gaily in resolving always to be on the watch, and employing my friends to watch also, that nothing really unexceptionable may pass us." In this style she ran on, never thoroughly stopped by anything till Mr. Woodhouse came into the room. Her vanity had then a change of object, and Emma heard her saying in the same half-whisper to Jane, "'Here comes this dear old beau of mine, I protest. Only think of his gallantry in coming away before the other men. What a dear creature he is! I assure you I like him excessively. I admire all that quaint, old-fashioned politeness. It is much more to my taste than modern ease. Modern ease often disgusts me. But this good old Mr. Woodhouse! I wish you had heard his gallant speeches to me at dinner. Oh, I assure you, I began to think my caro sposo would be absolutely jealous. I fancy I am rather a favourite. He took notice of my gown. How do you like it? Selina's choice. Handsome, I think, but I do not know whether it is not over-trimmed. I have the greatest dislike to the idea of being over-trimmed. Quite a horror of finery. I must put on a few ornaments now, because it is expected of me. A bride, you know, must appear like a bride. But my natural taste is all for simplicity. A simple style of dress is so infinitely preferable to finery. But I am quite in the minority, I believe. Few people seem to value simplicity of dress. Show and finery are everything. I have some notion of putting such a trimming as this to my white and silver poplin. Do you think it will look well?" The whole party were but just reassembled in the drawing-room, when Mr. Weston made his appearance among them. He had returned to a late dinner, and walked to Hartfield as soon as it was over. He had been too much expected by the best judges for surprise, but there was great joy. Mr. Woodhouse was almost as glad to see him now, as he would have been sorry to see him before. John Knightley only was in mute astonishment. That a man who might have spent his evening quietly at home after a day of business in London, should set off again, and walk half a mile to another man's house, for the sake of being in mixed company till bedtime, of finishing his day in the efforts of civility and the noise of numbers, was a circumstance to strike him deeply. A man who had been in motion since eight o'clock in the morning, and might now have been still, who had been long talking, and might have been silent, who had been in more than one crowd, and might have been alone. Such a man, to quit the tranquillity and independence of his own fireside, and on the evening of a cold, sleety April day, rush out again into the world! Could he by a touch of his finger have instantly taken back his wife, there would have been a motive, but his coming would probably prolong rather than break up the party. John Knightley looked at him with amazement, then shrugged his shoulders, and said, "'I could not have believed it, even of him.' 
Mr. Weston, meanwhile, perfectly unsuspicious of the indignation he was exciting, happy and cheerful as usual, and with all the right of being principal talker, which a day spent anywhere from home confers, was making himself agreeable among the rest, and having satisfied the inquiries of his wife as to his dinner, convincing her that none of all her careful directions as to the servants had been forgotten, and spread abroad what public news he had heard, was proceeding to a family communication which, though principally addressed to Mrs. Weston, he had not the smallest doubt of being highly interesting to everybody in the room. He gave her a letter. It was from Frank, and to herself. He had met with it in his way, and had taken the liberty of opening it. "'Read it! Read it!' said he. "'It will give you pleasure. Only a few lines will not take you long. Read it to Emma.' The two ladies looked over it together, and he sat smiling and talking to them the whole time, in a voice a little subdued, but very audible to everybody. Well, he is coming, you see. Good news, I think. Well, what do you say to it? I always told you he would be here again soon, did I not? Anne, my dear, did I not always tell you so, and you would not believe me? In town next week, you see, at the latest, I dare say, for she is as impatient as the black gentleman when anything is to be done. Most likely they will be there to-morrow or Saturday. As to her illness, all nothing, of course. But it is an excellent thing to have Frank among us again, so near as town. They will stay a good while when they do come, and he will be half his time with us. This is precisely what I wanted. Well, pretty good news, is it not? Have you finished it? Has Emma read it all? Put it up, put it up, we will have a good talk about it some other time, but it will not do now. I shall only just mention the circumstance to the others in a common way." Mrs. Weston was most comfortably pleased on the occasion. Her looks and words had nothing to restrain them. She was happy, she knew she was happy, and knew she ought to be happy. Her congratulations were warm and open, but Emma could not speak so fluently. She was a little occupied in weighing her own feelings, and trying to understand the degree of her agitation, which she rather thought was considerable. Mr. Weston, however, too eager to be very observant, too communicative to want others to talk, was very well satisfied with what she did say, and soon moved away to make the rest of his friends happy by a partial communication of what the whole room must have overheard already. It was well that he took everybody's joy for granted, or he might not have thought either Mr. Woodhouse or Mr. Knightley particularly delighted. They were the first entitled, after Mrs. Weston and Emma, to be made happy. From them he would have proceeded to Miss Fairfax, but she was so deep in conversation with John Knightley, that it would have been too positive an interruption, and finding himself close to Mrs. Elton, and her attention disengaged, he necessarily began on the subject with her. End of chapter 17 Volume Two, Chapter Eighteen of Emma. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Emma, by Jane Austen, Volume Two, Chapter Eighteen. I hope I shall soon have the pleasure of introducing my son to you," said Mr. Weston. Mrs. Elton, very willing to suppose a particular compliment intended her by such a hope, smiled most graciously. You have heard of a certain Frank Churchill, I presume," he continued, and know him to be my son, though he does not bear my name. Oh, yes, and I shall be very happy in his acquaintance. I am sure Mr. Elton will lose no time in calling on him, and we shall both have great pleasure in seeing him at the vicarage. You are very obliging. Frank will be extremely happy, I am sure. He is to be in town next week, if not sooner. We have notice of it in a letter to-day. I met the letters in my way this morning, and seeing my son's hand, presumed to open it, though it was not directed to me, it was to Mrs. Weston. She is his principal correspondent, I assure you. I hardly ever get a letter." "'And so you absolutely opened what was directed to her? Oh, Mr. Weston!' laughing affectedly. I must protest against that. A most dangerous precedent, indeed. I beg you will not let your neighbours follow your example. Upon my word, if this is what I am to expect, we married women must begin to exert ourselves. Oh, Mr. Weston, I could not have believed it of you." Ay, we men are sad fellows. You must take care of yourself, Mrs. Elton. This letter tells us—it is a short letter, written in a hurry, merely to give us notice. It tells us that they are all coming up to town directly on Mrs. Churchill's account. She has not been well the whole winter, and thinks Enscombe too cold for her. So they are to all move southward without loss of time." "'Indeed! From Yorkshire, I think. 
Is Enscombe in Yorkshire? Yes, they are about one hundred and ninety miles from London, a considerable journey. Yes, upon my word, very considerable. Sixty-five miles farther than from Maple Grove to London. But what is distance, Mr. Weston, to people of large fortune? You would be amazed to hear how my brother, Mr. Suckling, sometimes flies about. You will hardly believe me. But twice in one week he and Mr. Bragg went to London and back again with four horses." "'The evil of the distance from Enscombe," said Mr. Weston, "'is that Mrs. Churchill, as we understand, has not been able to leave the sofa for a week together. In Frank's last letter she complained, he said, of being too weak to get into her conservatory, without having both his arm and his uncle's. This, you know, speaks a great degree of weakness. But now she is so impatient to be in town that she means to sleep only two nights on the road. So Frank writes word. Certainly delicate ladies have very extraordinary constitutions, Mrs. Elton. You must grant me that." No, indeed. I shall grant you nothing. I always take the part of my own sex. I do, indeed. I give you notice. You will find me a formidable antagonist on that point. I always stand up for women, and I assure you, if you knew how Selina feels with respect to sleeping at an inn, you would not wonder at Mrs. Churchill's making incredible exertions to avoid it. Selina says it is quite a horror to her, and I believe I have caught a little of her nicety. She always travels with her own sheets. An excellent precaution. Does Mrs. Churchill do the same? depend upon it, Mrs. Churchill does everything that any other fine lady ever did. Mrs. Churchill will not be second to any lady in the land, for—' Mrs. Elton eagerly interposed with, "'Oh, Mr. Weston, do not mistake me. Selina is no fine lady, I assure you. Do not run away with such an idea.' "'Is not she? Then she is no rule for Mrs. Churchill, who is as thorough a fine lady as anybody ever beheld.' Mrs. Elton began to think she had been wrong in disclaiming so warmly. It was by no means her object to have it believed that her sister was not a fine lady. Perhaps there was want of spirit in the pretense of it, and she was considering in what way she had best retract, when Mr. Weston went on. "'Mrs. Churchill is not much in my good graces, as you may suspect, but this is quite between ourselves. She is very fond of Frank, and therefore I would not speak ill of her. Besides, she is out of health now, but that, indeed, by her own account, she has always been. I would not say so to everybody, Mrs. Elton, but I have not much faith in Mrs. Churchill's illness." "'If she is really ill, why not go to Bath, Mr. Weston? To Bath, or to Clifton?' "'She has taken it into her head that Enscombe is too cold for her. The fact is, I suppose, that she is tired of Enscombe. She has now been a longer time stationary there than she ever was before, and she begins to want change. It is a retired place. A fine place, but very retired." Ay, like Maple Grove, I dare say. Nothing can stand more retired from the road than Maple Grove. Such an immense plantation all round it. You seem shut out from everything, in the most complete retirement. And Mrs. Churchill probably has not health or spirits like Selina, to enjoy that sort of seclusion. Or perhaps she may not have resources enough in herself, to be qualified for a country life. I always say a woman cannot have too many resources, and I feel very thankful that I have so many myself, as to be quite independent of society." "'Frank was here in February for a fortnight." "'So I remember to have heard. He will find an addition to the society of Hybra when he comes again. That is, if I may presume to call myself an addition. But perhaps he may never have heard of there being such a creature in the world." This was too loud a call for a compliment to be passed by, and Mr. Weston, with a very good grace, immediately exclaimed, "'My dear madam, nobody but yourself can imagine such a thing possible. Not heard of you. I believe Mrs. Weston's letters lately have been full of very little else than Mrs. Elton.' He had done his duty, and could return to his son. "'When Frank left us,' continued he, "'it was quite uncertain when we might see him again, which makes this day's news doubly welcome. It had been completely unexpected. That is, I always had a strong persuasion he would be here again soon. I was sure something favourable would turn up. But nobody believed me. He and Mrs. Weston were both dreadfully desponding. How could he contrive to come? And how could it be supposed that his uncle and aunt would spare him again, and so forth? I always felt that something would happen in our favour, and so it has, you see. I have observed, Mrs. Elton, in the course of my life, that if things are going untowardly one month, they are sure to mend the next." 
"'Very true, Mr. Weston, perfectly true. It is just what I used to say to a certain gentleman in company in the days of courtship, when, because things did not go quite right, did not proceed with all the rapidity which suited his feelings, he was apt to be in despair, and exclaim that he was sure at this rate it would be May before Hymen's saffron robe would be put on for us. Oh, the pains I have been at to dispel these gloomy ideas, and give him cheerfuller views! the carriage. We had disappointments about the carriage. One morning, I remember, he came to me quite in despair." She was stopped by a slight fit of coughing, and Mr. Weston instantly seized the opportunity of going on. "'You were mentioning May. May is the very month which Mrs. Churchill has ordered, or has ordered herself, to spend in some warmer place than Enscombe, in short, to spend in London, so that we have the agreeable prospect of frequent visits from Frank the whole spring, precisely the season of the year which one should have chosen for it. Days almost at the longest, weather genial and pleasant, always inviting one out, and never too hot for exercise. When he was here before, we made the best of it, but there was a good deal of wet, damp, cheerless weather. There always is in February, you know, and we could not do half that we intended. Now will be the time. There will be complete enjoyment, and I do not know, Mrs. Elton, whether the uncertainty of our meetings, the sort of constant expectation there will be of his coming in to-day or to-morrow and at any hour, may not be more friendly to happiness than having him actually in the house. I think it is so. I think it is the state of mind which gives most spirit and delight. I hope you will be pleased with my son, but you must not expect a prodigy. He is generally thought a fine young man, but do not expect a prodigy. Mrs. Weston's partiality for him is very great, and, as you may suppose, most gratifying to me. She thinks nobody equal to him." "'And I assure you, Mr. Weston, I have very little doubt that my opinion will be decidedly in his favour. I have heard so much in praise of Mr. Frank Churchill. At the same time, it is fair to observe that I am one of those who always judge for themselves, and are by no means implicitly guided by others. I give you notice that as I find your son, so I shall judge of him. I am no flatterer." Mr. Weston was musing. "'I hope,' said he presently, "'I have not been severe upon poor Mrs. Churchill. If she is ill, I should be very sorry to do her injustice. But there are some traits in her character which make it difficult for me to speak of her with the forbearance I could wish. You cannot be ignorant, Mrs. Elton, of my connection with the family, nor of the treatment I have met with. And between ourselves, the whole blame of it is to be laid to her. She was the instigator. Frank's mother would never have been slighted as she was, but for her. Mr. Churchill has pride, but his pride is nothing to his wife's. His is a quiet, indolent, gentleman-like sort of pride, that would harm nobody, and only make himself a little helpless and tiresome. But her pride is arrogance and insolence. And what inclines one less to bear? She has no fair pretence of family or blood. She was nobody when he married her, barely the daughter of a gentleman. But ever since her being turned into a Churchill, she has out-churchilled them all in high and mighty claims. But in herself, I assure you, she is an upstart." "'Only think! Well, that must be infinitely provoking. I have quite a horror of upstarts. Maple Grove has given me a thorough disgust to people of that sort, for there is a family in that neighbourhood who are such an annoyance to my brother and sister, from the airs they give themselves. Your description of Mrs. Churchill made me think of them directly. People of the name of Tupman, very lately settled there, and encumbered with many low connections, but giving themselves immense airs, and expecting to be on a footing with the old established families. A year and a half is the very utmost that they can have lived at West Hall, and how they got their fortune nobody knows. They came from Birmingham, which is not a place to promise much, you know, Mr. Weston. One has not great hopes from Birmingham. I always say there is something direful in the sound, but nothing more is positively known of the Tupmans, though a good many things, I assure you, are suspected. And yet by their manners they evidently think themselves equal even to my brother, Mr. Suckling, who happens to be one of their nearest neighbours. It is infinitely too bad. Mr. Suckling, who has been eleven years a resident at Maple Grove, and whose father had it before him, I believe at least, I am almost sure that old Mr. Suckling had completed the purchase before his death." They were interrupted. Tea was carrying round, and Mr. Weston, having said all that he wanted, soon took the opportunity of walking away. After tea, Mr. and Mrs. Weston and Mr. Elton sat down with Mr. Woodhouse to cards. The remaining five were left to their own powers, and Emma doubted their getting on very well, for Mr. Knightley seemed little disposed for conversation. 
Mrs. Elton was wanting notice, which nobody had inclination to pay, and she was herself in a worry of spirits which would have made her prefer being silent. Mr. John Knightley proved more talkative than his brother. He was to leave them early the next day, and he soon began with, "'Well, Emma, I do not believe I have anything more to say about the boys, but you have your sister's letter, and everything is down at full length there, we may be sure. My charge would be much more concise than hers, and probably not much in the same spirit. All that I have to recommend being comprised in, do not spoil them, and do not physic them." "'I rather hope to satisfy you both,' said Emma for I shall do all in my power to make them happy, which will be enough for Isabella, and happiness must preclude false indulgence and physic." "'And if you find them troublesome, you must send them home again?' "'That is very likely. You think so, do not you?' "'I hope I am aware that they may be too noisy for your father, or even may be some encumbrance to you, if your visiting engagements continue to increase as much as they have done lately.' "'Increase?' "'Certainly. You must be sensible that the last half-year has made a great difference in your way of life." "'Difference? No, indeed, I am not." "'There can be no doubt of your being much more engaged with company than you used to be. Witness this very time. Here am I come down for one day only, and you are engaged with a dinner-party. When did it happen before, or anything like it? Your neighbourhood is increasing, and you mix more with it. A little while ago, every letter to Isabella brought an account of fresh gaieties, dinners at Mr. Cole's, or balls at the Crown. The difference which Randalls, Randalls alone, makes in your goings-on is very great." "'Yes,' said his brother quickly, "'it is Randalls that does it all. Very well, and as Randalls, I suppose, is not likely to have less influence than heretofore, it strikes me as a possible thing, Emma, that Henry and John may be sometimes in the way. And if they are, I only beg you to send them home." No, cried Mr. Knightley, that need not be the consequence. Let them be sent to Donwell. I shall certainly be at leisure." "'Upon my word!' exclaimed Emma. "'You amuse me. I should like to know how many of all my numerous engagements take place without your being of the party, and why I am to be supposed in danger of wanting leisure to attend to the little boys. These amazing engagements of mine, what have they been? dining once with the Coles, and having a ball talked of, which never took place. I can understand you," nodding at Mr. John Knightley, "'your good fortune in meeting with so many of your friends at once here, delights you too much to pass unnoticed. But you," turning to Mr. Knightley, "'who know how very, very seldom I am ever two hours from Hartfield, why you should foresee such a series of dissipation for me, I cannot imagine. And as to my dear little boys, I must say that if Aunt Emma has not time for them, I do not think they would fare much better with Uncle Knightley, who is absent from home about five hours where she is absent one, and who, when he is at home, is either reading to himself or settling his accounts." Mr. Knightley seemed to be trying not to smile, and succeeding without difficulty, upon Mrs. Elton's beginning to talk to him. End of chapter 18 End of volume 2